Chapter One of The Mysterious Rider. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England. The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. Chapter One A September Sun losing some of its heat, if not its brilliance, was dropping low in the west over the black Colorado range. Purple haze began to thicken in the timbered notches. Grey foothills, round and billowy, rolled down from the higher country. They were smooth, sweeping, with long velvety slopes and isolated patches of aspens that blazed in autumn gold. Splotches of red vine coloured the soft grey of sage. Old white slides, a mountain scarred by avalanche, towered with bleak rocky peak above the valley, sheltering it from the north. A girl rode along the slope, with gaze on the sweep and range and colour of the mountain fastness that was her home. She followed an old trail which led to a bluff overlooking an arm of the valley, once it had been a familiar lookout for her, but she had not visited the place of late. It was associated with serious hours of her life. Here, seven years before, when she was twelve, she had made a hard choice to please her guardian, the old rancher whom she loved and called father, who had indeed been a father to her. That choice had been to go to school in Denver. Four years she had lived away from her beloved grey hills and black mountains. Only once since her return had she climbed to this height, and that occasion too was memorable as an unhappy hour. It had been three years ago. Today girlish ordeals and griefs seemed back in the past. She was a woman at nineteen, and face to face with the first great problem in her life. The trail came up back of the bluff, through a clump of aspens with white trunks and yellow fluttering leaves, and led across a level bench of luxuriant grass and wild flowers to the rocky edge. She dismounted and threw the bridle. Her mustang, used to being petted, rubbed his sleek dark head against her, and evidently expected like demonstration in return, but as none was forthcoming, he bent his nose to the grass and began grazing. The girl's eyes were intent upon some waving, slender, white and blue flowers. They smiled up wanly, like pale stars, out of the long grass that had a tinge of gold. Columbines, she mused wistfully, as she plucked several of the flowers and held them up to gaze wonderingly at them, as if to see in them some revelation of the mystery that shrouded her birth and her name. Then she stood with dreamy gaze upon the distant ranges. Columbine. So they named me, those miners who found me, a baby, lost in the woods, asleep among the columbines. She spoke aloud, as if the sound of her voice might convince her. So much of the mystery of her had been revealed that day, by the man she had always called father. Vaguely, she had always been conscious of some mystery, something strange about her childhood, some relation never explained. No name but Columbine, she whispered sadly, and now she understood a strange longing of her heart. Scarcely an hour back, as she ran down the wide porch of White Slide's ranch house, she had encountered the man who had taken care of her all her life. He had looked upon her as kindly and fatherly as of old, yet with a difference. She seemed to see him as old Bill Bellounds, pioneer and rancher, of huge frame and broad face, hard and scarred and grizzled, with big eyes of blue fire. Collie, the old man had said, I reckon he has news, a letter from Jack. He's coming home. Bellans had waved the letter. His huge hand trembled as he reached to put it on her shoulder. 
the hardness of him seemed strangely softened jack was his son buster jack the range had always called him with other terms less kind that never got to the ears of his father jack had been sent away three years ago just before columbine's return from school therefore she had not seen him for over seven years but she remembered him well a big rangy boy handsome and wild who had made her childhood almost unendurable yes my son jack he's coming home said belllounds with a break in his voice and collie now i must tell you something yes dad she had replied with strong clasp of the heavy hand on her shoulder that's just it lass i ain't your dad i've tried to be a dad to you and i've loved you as my own but you're not flesh and blood of mine and now i must tell you the brief story followed seventeen years ago miners working a claim of belllounds in the mountains above middle park had found a child asleep in the columbines along the trail near that point indians probably arapahoes coming across the mountains to attack the utes had captured or killed the occupants of a prairie schooner there was no other clue the miners took the child to their camp fed and cared for it and after the manner of their kind named it columbine then they brought it to belllounds collie said the old rancher it need not never have been told and wouldn't but for one reason i'm getting old i reckon i'd never split my property between you and jack so i mean you and him to marry you always steadied jack with a wife like you'll be well maybe jack'll dad burst out columbine marry jack why i i don't even remember him ha ha laughed belllounds well you doggone soon will jack's in kremlin and he'll be here tonight or tomorrow but i i don't love him faltered columbine the old man lost his mirth the strong-lined face resumed its hard cast the big eyes smouldered her appealing objection had wounded him she was reminded of how sensitive the old man had always been to any reflection cast upon his son well that's unlucky he replied gruffly maybe you'll change i reckon no girl could help a boy much unless she cared for him anyway you and jack will marry he had stalked away and columbine had ridden her mustang far up the valley slope where she could be alone standing on the verge of the bluff she suddenly became aware that the quiet and solitude of her lonely resting place had been disrupted cattle were bawling below her and along the slope of old white slides and on the grassy uplands above she had forgotten that the cattle were being driven down into the lowlands for the fall round-up a great red and white spotted herd was milling in the park just beneath her calves and yearlings were making the dust fly along the mountain slope wild old steers were crashing in the sage holding level unwilling to be driven down cows were running and lowing for their lost ones melodious and clear rose the clarion calls of the cowboys the cattle knew those calls and only the wild steers kept upgrade columbine also knew each call and to which cowboy it belonged they sang and yelled and swore but it was all music to her here and there along the slope where the aspen groves clustered a horse would flash across an open space the dust would fly and a cowboy would peal out a lusty yell that rang along the slope and echoed under the bluff and lingered long after the daring rider had vanished in the steep thickets i wonder which is wills murmured columbine as she watched and listened vaguely conscious of a little difference a strange check in her remembrance of this particular cowboy she felt the change yet did not understand one after one she recognized the riders on the slopes below but wilson moore was not among them he must be above her then and she turned to gaze across the grassy bluff 
up the long yellow slope to where the gleaming aspens half hid a red bluff of mountain towering aloft then from far to her left high up a scrubby ridge of the slope rang down a voice that thrilled her go along you red cattle dashed pell-mell down the slope raising the dust tearing the brush rolling rocks and letting out hoarse balls whoopee high-pitched and peeling came a clearer yell columbine saw a white mustang flash out on top of the ridge silhouetted against the blue with mane and tail flying his gait on that edge of steep slope proved his rider to be a reckless cowboy for whom no heights or depths had terrors she would have recognized him from the way he rode if she had not known the slim erect figure the cowboy saw her instantly he pulled the mustang about to plunge down the slope and lifted him rearing and wheeling then columbine waved her hand the cowboy spurred his horse along the crest of the ridge disappeared behind the grove of aspens and came in sight again around to the right where on the grassy bench he slowed to a walk in descent to the bluff the girl watched him come conscious of an unfamiliar sense of uncertainty in this meeting and of the fact that she was seeing him differently from any other time in the years he had been a playmate a friend almost like a brother he had ridden for bellounds for years and was a cowboy because he loved cattle well and horses better and above all a life in the open unlike most cowboys he had been to school he had a family in denver that objected to his wild range life and often importuned him to come home he seemed aloof sometimes and not readily understood while many thoughts whirled through Columbine's mind, she watched the cowboy ride slowly down to her, and she became more concerned with a sudden restraint. How was Wilson going to take the news of this forced change about to come in her life? That thought leaped up. It gave her a strange pang. But she and he were only good friends. As to that, she reflected, of late they had not been the friends and comrades they formerly were in the thrilling uncertainty of this meeting she had forgotten his distant manner and the absence of little attentions she had missed by this time the cowboy had reached the level and with the lazy grace of his kind slipped out of the saddle he was tall slim round-limbed with the small hips of a rider and square though not broad shoulders he stood straight like an indian his eyes were hazel his features regular his face bronzed all men of the open had still lean strong faces but added to this in him was a steadiness of expression a restraint that seemed to hide sadness howdy columbine he said what are you doing up here you might get run over hello wills she replied slowly oh i guess i can keep out of the way some bad steers in that bunch if any of them run over here pronto will leave you to walk home that mustang hates cattle and he's only half broke you know i forgot you were driving today she replied and looked away from him there was a moment's pause long it seemed to her what did you come for he asked curiously I wanted to gather columbines. See? She held out the nodding flowers towards him. Take one. Do you like them? Yes, I like columbine, he replied, taking one of them. His keen hazel eyes softened, darkened. Colorado's flower. Columbine. It is my name. Well, could you have a better? It sure suits you. Why? she asked and she looked at him again you're slender graceful you sort of hold your head high and proud your skin is white your eyes are blue not bluebell blue but columbine blue and they turn purple when you're angry compliments wilson this is new kind of talk for you she said you're different today 
Yes, I am. She looked across the valley toward the westering sun, and the slight flush faded from her cheeks. I have no right to hold my head proud. No one knows who I am, where I came from. As if that made any difference, he exclaimed. Belllounds is not my dad. I have no dad. I was a waif. They found me in the woods, a baby lost among the flowers. Columbine Belllounds I've always been, but that is not my name. No one can tell what my name really is. I knew your story years ago, Columbine, he replied earnestly. Everybody knows. Old Bill ought to have told you long before this. But he loves you. So does everybody. You must not let this knowledge sadden you. I'm sorry you've never known a mother or a sister. Why, I could tell you of many orphans who... whose stories were different. You don't understand. I've been happy. I've not longed for any... anyone except a mother. It's only... What don't I understand? I've not told you all. No? Well, go on, he said slowly, meaning of the hesitation and the restraint that had obstructed her thought now flashed over Columbine. It lay in what Wilson Moore might think of her prospective marriage to Jack Bellounds. Still, she could not guess why that should make her feel strangely uncertain of the ground she stood on, or how it could cause a constraint she had to fight herself to hide. Moreover, to her annoyance, she found that she was evading his direct request for the news she had withheld. "'Jack Bellounds is coming home tonight or tomorrow, she said. Then, waiting for her companion to reply, she kept an unseeing gaze upon the scanty pines fringing old white slides. But no reply appeared to be forthcoming from Moore. His silence compelled her to turn to him. The cowboy's face had subtly altered. It was darker, with a tinge of red under the bronze, and his lower lip was released from his teeth even as she looked. He had his eyes intent upon the lasso he was coiling. Suddenly he faced her, and the dark fire of his eyes gave her a shock. "'I've been expecting that short horn back for months,' he said bluntly. "'You never liked Jack?' queried Columbine slowly. That was not what she wanted to say, but the thought spoke itself. "'I should smile I never did. Ever since you and he fought, long ago, all over—' His sharp gesture made the coiled lasso loosen. Ever since I licked him good, don't forget that, interrupted Wilson. The red had faded from the bronze. Yes, you licked him, mused Columbine. I remember that, and Jack's hated you ever since. There's been no love lost. But, Wills, you never before talked this way, spoke out so, against Jack, she protested. Well, I'm not the kind to talk behind a fellow's back, but I'm not mealy-mouthed either, and... and... He did not complete the sentence, and his meaning was enigmatic. Altogether, Moore seemed not like himself. The fact disturbed Columbine. Always she had confided in him. Here was a most complex situation. She burned to tell him, yet somehow feared to. She felt an incomprehensible satisfaction in his bitter reference to Jack. She seemed to realise that she valued Wilson's friendship more than she had known, and now, for some strange reason, it was slipping from her. "'We... we were such good friends, pods,' said Columbine, hurriedly and irrelevantly. "'Who?' he stared at her. "'Why, you and me?' "'Oh!' His tone softened, but there was still disapproval in his glance. What of that? Something has happened to make me think I've missed you lately, that's all. Uh-huh. His tone held finality and bitterness, but he would not commit himself. Columbine sensed a pride in him that seemed the cause of his aloofness. Wilson, why have you been different lately? 
she asked plaintively. "'What's the good to tell you now?' he queried in reply. That gave her a blank sense of actual loss. She had lived in dreams, and he in realities. Right now she could not dispel her dream, see and understand all that he seemed to. She felt like a child then, growing old swiftly. The strange past longing for a mother surged up in her like a strong tide. Someone to lean on, someone who loved her, someone to help her in this hour, when fatality knocked at the door of her youth. How she needed that. It might be bad for me to tell me, but tell me anyhow, she said finally, answering as someone older than she had been an hour ago, to something feminine that leaped up. She did not understand this impulse, but it was in her. No, declared Moore, with dark red staining his face. He slapped the lasso against his saddle and tied it with clumsy hands. He did not look at her. His tone expressed anger and amaze. Dad says I must marry Jack, she said, with a sudden return to her natural simplicity. I heard him tell that months ago snapped more you did was that why she whispered it was he answered ringingly but that was no reason for you to be be to stay away from me she declared with rising spirit he laughed shortly wills didn't you like me any more after dad said that she queried Columbine, a girl nineteen years and about to, to get married, ought not be a fool, he replied with sarcasm. I'm not a fool, she rejoined hotly. You ask fool questions. Well, you didn't like me afterward, or you'd never have mistreated me. If you say I mistreated you, you say what's untrue, he replied just as hotly. They had never been so near a quarrel before. Columbine experienced a sensation new to her, a commingling of fear, heat, and pang, it seemed all in one throb. Wilson was hurting her. A quiver ran all over her, along her veins, swelling and tingling. You mean I lie? she flashed. Yes, I do, if... But before he could conclude, she slapped his face. It grew pale then, while she began to tremble. Oh, I didn't intend that. Forgive me, she faltered. He rubbed his cheek. The hurt had not been great, so far as the blow was concerned, but his eyes were dark with pain and anger. Oh, don't distress yourself, he burst out. You slapped me before, once, years ago, for kissing you. I, I apologize for saying you lied. You're only out of your head. So am I. That poured oil upon the troubled waters. The cowboy appeared to be hesitating between sudden flight and the risk of staying longer. Maybe that's it, replied Columbine, with a half laugh. She was not far from tears and fury with herself. Let us make up. Be friends again. Moore squared around aggressively. He seemed to fortify himself against something in her. She felt that, but his face grew harder and older than she had ever seen it. Columbine, do you know where Jack Bellounds has been for these three years? He asked deliberately, entirely ignoring her overtures of friendship. No, somebody said Denver. Someone else said Kansas City. I never asked Dad because I knew Jack had been sent away. I've supposed he was working, making a man of himself. Well, I hope to heaven for your sake what you suppose comes true, returned Moore with exceeding bitterness. Do you know where he has been? asked Columbine. Some strange feeling prompted that. There was a mystery here. Wilson's agitation seemed strange and deep. Yes, I do. The cowboy bit that out through closing teeth, as if locking them against an almost overmastering temptation. Columbine lost her curiosity. 
she was woman enough to realize that there might well be facts which would only make her situation harder wilson she began hurriedly i owe all i am to dad he has cared for me sent me to school he has been so good to me i've loved him always it would be a shabby return for all his protection and love if if i refused old bill is the best man ever interrupted moore as if to repudiate any hint of disloyalty to his employer everybody in middle park and all over owes bill something he's sure good there never was anything wrong with him except his crazy blindness about his son buster jack the the columbine put a hand over moore's lips the man i must marry she said solemnly you must you will he demanded of course what else could i do i never thought of refusing columbine wilson's cry was so poignant his gesture so violent his dark eyes so piercing that columbine sustained a shock that held her trembling and mute how can you love jack bellounds you were twelve years old when you saw him last how can you love him i don't replied columbine then how could you marry him i owe dad obedience it's his hope that i can steady jack steady jack exclaimed moore passionately why you girl you white-faced flower you with your innocence and sweetness steady that damn pup my heavens he was a gambler and a drunkard he hush implored columbine he cheated at cards declared the cowboy with a scorn that placed that vice as utterly base but jack was only a wild boy replied columbine trying with brave words to champion the son of the man she loved as her father he has been sent away to work he'll have outgrown that wildness he'll come home a man Puh! cried moore harshly columbine felt a sinking within her where was her strength she who could walk and ride so many miles to become sick with an inward quaking it was childish she struggled to hide her weakness from him it's not like you to be this way she said you used to be generous am i to blame did i choose my life moore looked quickly away from her and standing with a hand on his horse he was silent for a moment the squaring of his shoulders bore testimony to his thought presently he swung up into the saddle the mustang snorted and champed the bit and tossed his head ready to bolt forget my temper begged the cowboy looking down upon columbine i take it all back i'm sorry don't let a word of mine worry you i was only jealous jealous exclaimed columbine wonderingly yes that makes a fellow see red and green bad medicine you never felt it what were you jealous of asked columbine the cowboy had himself in hand now and he regarded her with a grim amusement well columbine it's like a story he replied i'm the fellow disowned by his family a wanderer of the wilds no good and no prospects now our friend jack he's handsome and rich he has a doting old dad cattle horses ranches he wins the girl see spurring his mustang the cowboy rode away at the edge of the slope he turned in the saddle i've got to drive in this bunch of cattle it's late you hurry home then he was gone the stones cracked and rolled down under the side of the bluff columbine stood where he had left her dubious yet with the blood still hot in her cheeks jealous he wins the girl she murmured in repetition to herself whatever could he have meant he didn't mean he didn't the simple logical interpretation of wilson's words 
opened Columbine's mind to a disturbing possibility of which she had never dreamed. That he might love her. If he did, why had he not said so? Jealous, maybe, but he did not love her. The next throb of thought was like a knock at a door of her heart, a door never yet opened, inside which seemed a mystery of feeling, of hope, despair, unknown longing, and clamorous voices. The woman just born in her, instinctive and self-preservative, shut that door before she had more than a glimpse inside, but then she felt her heart swell with its nameless burdens. Pronto was grazing near at hand. She caught him and mounted. It struck her then that her hands were numb with cold. The wind had ceased fluttering the aspens, but the yellow leaves were falling, rustling. Out on the brow of the slope she faced home and the west. A glorious Colorado sunset had just reached the wonderful height of its colour and transformation. The sage slopes below her seemed rosy velvet. The golden aspens on the further reaches were on fire at the tips. The foothills rolled clear and mellow and rich in the light. The gulf of distance on to the great black range was veiled in mountain purple, and the dim peaks beyond the range stood up, sunset flushed and grand. The narrow belt of blue sky between crags and clouds was like a river full of fleecy sails and wisps of silver. Above towered a pall of dark cloud, full of the shades of approaching night. Oh, beautiful, breathed the girl, with all her worship of nature. That wild world of sunset grandeur and loneliness and beauty was hers. Over there, under a peak of the black range, was the place where she had been found, a baby lost in the forest. She belonged to that, and so it belonged to her. Strength came to her from the glory of light on the hills. Pronto shot up his ears and checked his trot. "'What is it, boy?' called Columbine. The trail was getting dark. Shadows were creeping up the slope as she rode down to meet them. The mustang had keen sight and scent. She reined him to a halt. All was silent. The valley had begun to shade on the far side, and the rose and gold seemed fading from the nearer. Below, on the level floor of the valley, lay the rambling old ranch house, with the cabins nestling around, and the corrals leading out to the soft hayfields, misty and grey in the twilight. A single light gleamed. It was like a beacon. The air was cold with a nip of frost. From far on the other side of the ridge she had descended came the balls of the last straggling cattle of the round-up. But surely Pronto had not shot up his ears for them. As if in answer, a wild sound pealed down the slope, making the mustang jump. Columbine had heard it before. Pronto, it's only a wolf, she soothed him. The peal was loud, rather harsh at first, then softened to a mourn, wild, lonely, haunting. A pack of coyotes barked in angry answer, a sharp, staccato, yelping chorus, the more piercing notes biting on the cold night air. These mountain mourns and yelps were music to Columbine. She rode on down the trail in the gathering darkness, less afraid of the night and its wild denizens than of what awaited her at White Slides Ranch. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Darkness settled down like a black mantle over the valley. Columbine rather hoped to find Wilson waiting to take care of her horse, as used to be his habit, but she was disappointed. No light showed from the cabin in which the cowboys lived. 
he had not yet come in from the round-up. She unsaddled and turned Pronto loose in the pasture. The windows of the long, low ranch-house were bright squares in the blackness, sending cheerful rays afar. Columbine wondered in trepidation if Jack Bellounds had come home. It required effort of will to approach the house. Yet, since she must meet him, the sooner the ordeal was over, the better. Nevertheless, she tiptoed past the bright windows, and went all the length of the long porch, and turned around and went back, and then hesitated, fighting a slow drag of her spirit, an oppression upon her heart. The door was crude and heavy. It opened hard. Columbine entered a big room, lighted by a lamp on the upper table, and by blazing logs in a huge stone fireplace. This was the living room, rather gloomy in the corners, and bare, but comfortable for all simple needs. The logs were new, and the chinks between them filled with clay, still white, showing that the house was of recent build. The rancher, Bellounds, sat in his easy chair before the fire, his big horny hands extended to the warmth. He was in his shirt sleeves, a grey, bold-faced man of over sixty years, still muscular and rugged. At Columbine's entrance he raised his drooping head, and so removed the suggestion of sadness in his posture. "'Well, lass, here you are,' was his greeting. "'Jake has been hollering that Chuck was ready. Now we can eat.' "'Dad, did... did your son come?' asked Columbine. "'No. I got word just at sundown. One of Baker's cowpunchers from up the valley. He rode up from Kremlin and stopped to say Jack was celebrating his arrival by too much red liquor. Reckon he won't be home tonight. Maybe tomorrow.' Bellounds spoke in an even, heavy tone, without any apparent feeling. Always he was mercilessly frank, and never spared the truth. But Columbine, who knew him well, felt how this news flayed him. Resentment stirred in her toward the wayward son, but she knew better than to voice it. Natural-like, I reckon, for Jack to feel gay on getting home. I ain't holding that again him. These last three years must have been gall into that boy. Columbine stretched her hands to the blaze. It's cold, Dad, she averred. I didn't dress warmly, so I nearly froze. Autumn is here, and there's frost in the air. Oh, the hills were all gold and red. The aspen leaves were falling. I love autumn, but it means winter is so near. Well, well, time flies, sighed the old man. Where'd you ride? Up the west slope to the bluff. It's far. I don't go there often. Meet any of the boys? I sent the outfit to drive stock down from the mountain. I've lost a good many head lately. They're eating some weed that poisons them. They swell up and die. Worse this year than ever before. Why, that is serious, Dad. Poor things. That's worse than eating loco. Yes, I met Wilson Moore driving down the slope. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, let's eat. They took seats at the table, which the cook, Jake, was loading with steaming victuals. Supper appeared to be a rather sumptuous one this evening, in honour of the expected guest, who had not come. Columbine helped the old man to his favourite dishes, stealing furtive glances at his lined and shadowed face. She sensed a subtle change in him since the afternoon, but could not see any sign of it in his look or demeanour. His appetite was as hearty as ever. "'So you met Wills. Is he still making up to you?' asked Bellounds presently. "'No, he isn't. I don't see that he ever did that, Dad,' she replied. "'You're a kid in mind and a woman in body.' That cowpuncher has been lovesick over you since you were a little girl. It's what kept him here riding for me. Dad, I don't believe it, said Columbine, feeling the blood at her temples. You always imagined such things about Wilson, and the other boys as well. Uh-huh. I'm an old fool about women, hey? Maybe I was years ago, but I can see now. 
Didn't Wills always get awry-eyed when any of the other boys shined up to you? I can't remember that he did, replied Columbine. She felt a desire to laugh, yet the subject was anything but amusing to her. Well, you've always been innocent-like. Thank the Lord you never lean to tricks of most pretty lasses, making eyes at all the men. Anyway, a matter of three months ago I told Wills to keep away from you, that you were not for any poor cow-puncher. You never liked him. Why? Was it fair, taking him as boys come? Well, I reckon it wasn't, replied Bellounds, and as he looked up his broad face changed to ruddy colour. That boy's the best rider and roper I've had in years. He ain't the bronco-busting kind. He never drank. He was honest and willing. He saves his money. He's good at handling stock. That boy will be a rich rancher some day. Strange, then, you never liked him, murmured Columbine. She felt ashamed of the good it did her to hear Wilson praised. No, it ain't strange. I have my own reasons replied Bellounds, gruffly, as he resumed eating. Columbine believed she could guess the cause of the old rancher's unreasonable antipathy for this cowboy. Not improbably, it was because Wilson had always been superior in every way to Jack Bellounds. The boys had been natural rivals in everything pertaining to life on the range. What Bill Bellounds admired most in men was paramount in Wilson, and lacking in his own son. "'Will you put Jack in charge of your ranches now?' asked Columbine. "'Not much. I reckon I'll try him here at White Slides as foreman, and if he runs the outfit, then I'll see.' "'Dad, he'll never run the White Slides outfit,' asserted Columbine. "'Well, it is a hard bunch, I'll agree. But I reckon the boys will stay, except in mebby Wills.' and it'll be just as well for him to leave. It's not good business to send away your best cowboy. I've heard you complain lately of lack of men. I sure do need men, replied Bellound seriously. Stock getting more than we can handle. I sent word over the range to Meeker, hoping to get some men there. What I need most just now is a fellow who knows dogs, and who'll hunt down the wolves and lions and bears that are living off my cattle. Dad, you need a whole outfit to handle the packs of hounds you've got. Such an assortment of them. There must be a hundred. Only yesterday some man brought a lot of mangy, long-eared canines. It's funny. Why, Dad, you're the laughing stock of the range. Yes, and the range will be thanking me when I rid it of all these varmints, declared Bellounds. Lass, I swore I'd buy every dog fetched to me until I had enough to kill off the coyotes and loafers and lions. I'll do it, too. But I need a hunter. Why not put Wilson Moore in charge of the hounds? He's a hunter. Well, lass, that might be a good idea, replied the rancher, nodding his grizzled head. Say, you're sort of wanting me to keep Wills on. Yes, Dad. Why? Do you like him so much? I like him, of course. He has been almost a brother to me. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, are you sure you don't like him more than you ought, considering what's in the wind? Yes, I'm sure I don't, replied Columbine, with tingling cheeks. Well, I'm glad of that. Reckon it'll be no great matter whether Will stays or leaves. If he wants to, I'll give him a job with the hounds. That evening Columbine went to her room early. It was a cosy little blanketed nest which she had arranged and furnished herself. There was a little square window cut through the logs, and through which many a night the snow had blown in upon her bed. She loved her little isolated refuge. This night it was cold, the first time this autumn, and the lighted lamp, though brightening the room, did not make it appreciably warmer. There was a stone fireplace, but as she had neglected to bring in wood, she could not start a fire. So she undressed, blew out the lamp, and went to bed. Columbine was soon warm, and the darkness of her little room seemed good to her. Sleep, she felt, never would come that night. She wanted to think. She could not help but think, and she tried to halt the whirl of her mind. 
Wilson Moore occupied the foremost place in her varying thoughts, a fact quite remarkable and unaccountable. She tried to change it. In vain, Wilson persisted on his white mustang flying across the ridge top, coming to her as never before with his anger and disapproval, his strange poignant cry, Columbine, that haunted her, with his bitter smile and his resignation and his mocking talk of jealousy. He persisted and grew with the old rancher's frank praise. I must not think of him, she whispered. Why, I'll be, be married soon. Married. That word transformed her thought, and where she had thrilled, she now felt cold. She revolved the fact in mind. It's true I'll be married because I ought. I must, she said half aloud, because I can't help myself. I ought to want to, for Dad's sake. But I don't. I don't. She longed above all things to be good, loyal, loving, helpful, to show her gratitude for the home and the affection that had been bestowed upon a nameless waif. Bill Bellounds had not been under any obligation to succour a strange lost child. He had done it because he was big, noble. Many splendid deeds had been laid at the old rancher's door. She was not of an ungrateful nature. She meant to pay. But the significance of the price began to dawn upon her. It will change my whole life, she whispered, aghast. But how? Columbine pondered. She must go over the details of that change. No mother had ever taught her. The few women that had been in the Bellounds' home from time to time had not been sympathetic or had not stayed long enough to help her much. Even her school life in Denver had left her still a child as regarded the serious problems of women. If I'm his wife, she went on, I'll have to be with him. I'll have to give up this little room. I'll never be free, alone, happy, any more. That was the first detail she enumerated. It was also the last. Realization came with a sickening little shudder. And that moment gave birth to the nucleus of an unconscious revolt. The coyotes were howling, wild, sharp, sweet notes. They soothed her troubled, aching head, lulled her towards sleep, reminded her of the gold and purple sunset, and the slopes of sage, the lonely heights, and the beauty that would never change. On the morrow, she drowsily thought, she would persuade Wilson not to kill all the coyotes, to leave a few, because she loved them. Bill Bellounds had settled in Middle Park in 1860. It was wild country, a home of the Ute Indians, and a natural paradise for elk, deer, antelope, buffalo. The mountain ranges harboured bear. These ranges sheltered the rolling valley land, which some explorer had named Middle Park in earlier days. Much of this enclosed tableland was prairie, where long grass and wild flowers grew luxuriantly. Bellounds was a cattleman, and he saw the possibilities there, to which end he sought the friendship of Pia, chief of the Utes. This noble red man was well disposed toward the white settlers, and his tribe, during those troublous times, kept peace with these invaders of their mountain home. In 1868, Bellounds was instrumental in persuading the Utes to relinquish Middle Park. The slopes of the hills were heavily timbered. Gold and silver had been found in the mountains. It was a country that attracted prospectors, cattlemen, lumbermen. The summer season was not long enough to grow grain, and the nights too frosty for corn. Otherwise, Middle Park would have increased rapidly in population. In the years that succeeded the departure of the Utes, Bill Bellounds developed several cattle ranches and acquired others. White Slides Ranch lay some twenty-odd miles from Middle Park, being a winding arm of the main valley land. 
Its development was a matter of later years, and Belllounds lived there because the country was wilder. The rancher, as he advanced in years, seemed to want to keep the loneliness that had been his in earlier days. At the time of the return of his son to White Slides, Belllounds was rich in cattle and land, but he avowed frankly that he had not saved any money, and probably never would. His hand was always open to every man, and he never remembered an obligation. He trusted everyone. A proud boast of his was that neither white man nor red man had ever betrayed his trust. His cowboys took advantage of him. His neighbors imposed upon him, but none were there who did not make good their debts of service or stock. Bellounds was one of the great pioneers of the frontier days, to whom the West owed its settlement. And he was finer than most, because he proved that the Indians, if not robbed or driven, would respond to friendliness. Bellounds was not seen at his customary tasks on the day he expected his son. He walked in the fields and around the corrals. He often paced up and down the porch, scanning the horizon below, where the road from Kremlin showed white down the valley, and part of the time he stayed indoors. It so happened that early in the afternoon he came out in time to see a buckboard, drawn by dust and lather-stained horses, pull into the yard and then he saw his son. Some of the cowboys came running. There were greetings to the driver, who appeared well known to them. Jack Bellounds did not look at them. He threw a bag out of the buckboard, and then clambered down slowly to go toward the porch. "'Well, Jack, my son, I'm sure glad you're back home,' said the old rancher, striding forward. His voice was deep and full, singularly rich but that was the only sign of feeling he showed. "'Howdy, Dad,' replied the son, not heartily, as he put out his hand to his father's. Jack Bellown's form was tall, with a promise of his father's bulk, but he did not walk erect. He slouched a little. His face was pale, showing he had not of late been used to sun and wind. Any stranger would have seen the resemblance of boy to man, would have granted the handsome boldness, but denied the strength. The lower part of Jack Bellown's face was weak. The constraint of this meeting was manifest mostly in the manner of the son. He looked ashamed, almost sullen. But if he had been under the influence of liquor at Kremlin, as reported the day before, he had entirely recovered. "'Come on in,' said the rancher. When they got into the big living-room, and Bellounds had closed the doors, the son threw down his baggage and faced his father aggressively. "'Do they all know where I've been?' he asked bitterly. Broken pride and shame flamed in his face. "'Nobody knows. The secret's been kept,' replied Bellounds. Amaze and relief transformed the young man. "'Ah, oh, now, I'm glad,' he exclaimed, and he sat down half covering his face with shaking hands. "'Jack, we'll start over,' said Bellounds earnestly, and his big eyes shone with a warm and beautiful light. "'Right here. We'll never speak of where you've been these three years. Never again.' Jack gazed up then, with all the sullenness and shadow gone. "'Father, you were wrong about doing me good. It's done me harm.' But now, if nobody knows, why, I'll try to forget it. Maybe I blundered, replied Bellounds pathetically. Yet, God knows I meant well. You sure were. But that's enough, Palava. You'll go to work as foreman of White Slides. And if you make a success of it, I'll be only too glad to have you boss the ranch. I'm getting along in years, son, and the last year has made me poorer. Here's a fine range, but I've less stock this year than last. There's been some rustling of cattle and a big loss from wolves and lions and poison weed. What do you say, son? I'll run white slides, replied Jack with a wave of his hand. I hadn't hoped for such a chance, but it's due me. 
Who's in the outfit I know? Reckon no one except Wills Moore. Is that cowboy here yet? I don't want him. Well, I'll put him to chasing varmints with the hounds. And say, son, this outfit is bad. You savvy? It's bad. You can't run that bunch. The only way you can handle them is to get up early and come back late. Say in little, but saw in wood. Hard work. Jack Bellans did not evince any sign of assimilating the seriousness of his father's words. I'll show them, he said. They'll find out who's boss. Oh, I'm aching to get into boots and ride and tear around. Bellans stroked his grizzled beard and regarded his son with mingled pride and doubt. Not at this moment, most assuredly, could he get away from the wonderful fact that his only son was home. That's all right, son, but you've been off the range for three years. You'll need advice. Now listen. Be gentle with hosses. You used to be mean with a hoss. Some cowboys jam their hosses around and make em pitch and bite, but it ain't the best way. A hoss has got sense. I've some fine stock and don't want it spoiled. And be easy and quiet with the boys. It's hard to get help these days. I'm short on hands now. You'd do best, son, to stick to your dad's ways with hosses and men. Dad, I've seen you kick horses and shoot at men, replied Jack. Right, you have, but them was particular bad cases. I'm not advising that way. Son, it's close to my heart, this hope I have, that you'll... The full voice quavered and broke. It would indeed have been a hardened youth who could not have felt something of the deep and unutterable affection in the old man. Jack Bellans put an arm around his father's shoulder. Dad, I'll make you proud of me yet. Give me a chance, and don't be sore if I can't do wonders right at first. Son, you shall have every chance. And that reminds me, do you remember Columbine? I should say so, replied Jack eagerly. They spoke of her in Kremlin. Where is she? I reckon somewheres about. Jack, you and Columbine are to marry. Marry? Columbine and me? he ejaculated. Yes, you're my son and she's my adopted daughter. I won't split my property. And it's right she had a share. A fine, strong, quiet, pretty lass, Jack, and she'll make a good wife. I've set my heart on the idea. But Columbine always hated me. Well, she was a kid then, and you teased her. Now she's a woman, and willing to please me. Jack, you'll not buck again this deal. That depends, replied Jack. I'd marry most any girl you wanted me to. But if Columbine were to flout me as she used to, why, I'd buck sure enough. Dad... Are you sure she knows nothing, suspects nothing of where you, you sent me? Son, I swear she doesn't. Do you mean you'd want us to marry soon? Well, yes, as soon as Collie would think reasonable. Jack, she's shy and strange and deep too. If you ever win her heart, you'll be richer than if you owned all the gold in the Rockies. I'd say go slow. But contrary-wise, it'd maybe be surer to steady you, keep you home, if you married right off. Married right off, echoed Jack with a laugh. It's like a story. But wait till I see her. At that very moment, Columbine was sitting on the topmost log of a high corral, deeply interested in the scene before her. Two cowboys were in the corral with a saddled mustang. One of them carried a canvas sack, containing tools and horseshoes. As he dropped it with a metallic clink, the mustang snorted and jumped and rolled the whites of his eyes. He knew what that clink meant. "'Miss Collie, are you all going to sit up there?' inquired the taller cowboy, a lean, supple and powerful fellow, with a rough red-blue face, hard as a rock and steady, bright eyes. "'I sure am, Jim,' she replied imperturbably. "'But we've got to hog-tie him,' protested the cowboy. "'Yes, I know, and you're going to be gentle about it.' 
Jim scratched his sandy head and looked at his comrade, a little gnarled fellow, like the bleached root of a tree. He seemed all legs. "'You here, you Wyoming galoot,' he said to Jim. "'Them shoes goes on Wang right gentle.' Jim grinned and turned to speak to his Mustang. "'Wang, the law's laid down, and we want to see how much hoss sense you have.' The shaggy mustang did not appear to be favourably impressed by this speech. It was a mighty distrustful look he bent upon the speaker. Jim, seeing as how this here job's about the last Miss Collie will ever boss us on, we got to do it without Wang turning a hair, drawled the other cowboy. Lem, why is this the last job I'll ever boss you boys? demanded Columbine quickly. Jim gazed quizzically at her and Lem assumed that blank, innocent face Columbine always associated with cowboy deviltry. "'Well, Miss Collie, we reckon the new boss of White Slides rode in today.' "'You mean Jack Bellounds came home?' said Columbine. "'Well, I'll boss you boys the same as always. "'That'd be mighty fine for us, but I'm feared it ain't writ in the fatal history of White Slides,' replied Jim." Buster Jack will run over the old man and marry you, added Lem. Oh, so that's your idea, rejoined Columbine lightly. Well, if such a thing did come to pass, I'd be your boss more than ever. I reckon no, Miss Collie, for we'll not be riding for white slides, said Jim simply. Columbine had sensed this very significance long before when the possibility of Buster Jack's return had been rumoured. She knew cowboys, as well try to change the rocks of the hills. Boys, the day you leave White Slides will be a sad one for me, sighed Columbine. Miss Collie, we ain't gone yet, put in Lem with awkward softness. Jim has long hankered for Wyoming, and he just talks that way. Then the cowboys turned to the business in hand. Jim removed the saddle, but left the bridle on. This move, of course, deceived Wang. He had been broken to stand while his bridle hung, and like a horse that would have been good if given a chance, he obeyed as best he could, shaking in every limb. Jim, apparently to hobble Wang, roped his forelegs together low down, but suddenly slipped the rope over the knees. Then Wang knew he had been deceived. He snorted fire, let out a scream, and rearing on his hind legs, he pawed the air savagely. Jim hauled on the rope, while Wang screamed and fought with his forefeet high in the air. Then Jim, with a powerful jerk, pulled Wang down and threw him, while Lem, seizing the bridle, hauled him over on his side and sat upon his head. Whereupon Jim slipped the loop off one front hoof and pulled the other leg back across one of the hind ones, where both were secured by a quick hitch. Then the lasso was wound and looped around front and back hoofs together. When this had been done, the mustang was rolled over on his other side, his free front hoof lassoed and pulled back to the hind one, where both were secured, as had been the others. This rendered the mustang powerless, and the shoeing proceeded. Columbine hated to sit by and watch it, but she always stuck to her post when opportunity afforded, because she knew the cowboys would not be brutal while she was there. "'Well, he'll step high tomorrow," said Lem, as he got up from his seat on the head of Wang. "'Uh-huh, and like a mule, he'll be my friend for twenty years just to get a chance to kick me,' replied Jim. For Columbine, the most interesting moment of this incident was when the Mustang raised his head to look at his legs, in order to see what had been done to them. There was something almost human in that look. It expressed intelligence and fear and fury. The cowboys released his legs and let him get up. Wang stamped his iron-shod hoofs. It was a mean trick, Wang, said Columbine. If I owned you, that'd never be done to you. I reckon you can have him for the asking, said Jim, as he threw on the saddle. Nobody but me can ride him. Do you want to try? Not in these clothes, replied Columbine, laughing. 
"'Well, Miss Collie, you're sure dressed up fine today, for some reason or other,' said Lem, shaking his head, while he gathered up the tools from the ground. "'Uh-huh, and here comes the reason,' exclaimed Jim, in low, hoarse whisper. Columbine heard the whisper, and at the same instant a sharp footfall on the gravel road. She quickly turned, almost losing her balance, and she recognized Jack Bellounds. The boy, Buster Jack, she remembered so well, was approaching. Now a young man, taller, heavier, older, with paler face and bolder look. Columbine had feared this meeting, had prepared herself for it. But all she felt when it came was annoyance at the fact that he had caught her sitting on top of the corral fence with little regard for dignity. It did not occur to her to jump down. She merely sat straight, smoothed down her skirt, and waited. Jim led the mustang out of the corral, and Lem followed. It looked as if they wanted to avoid the young man, but he prevented that. "'Howdy, boys. I'm Jack Bellounds,' he said, rather loftily. But his manner was nonchalant. He did not offer to shake hands. Jim mumbled something, and Lem said, "'How do?' "'That's an ornery-looking bronc,' went on Bellounds, and he reached with careless hand for the mustang. Wang jerked so hard that he pulled Jim half over. "'Well, he ain't a bronc, but I reckon he's all the rest,' drawled Jim. Both cowboys seemed slow, careless. They were neither indifferent nor responsive. Columbine saw their keen, steady glances go over Bellounds. Then she took a second and less hasty look at him. He wore high-heeled, fancy-topped boots, tight-fitting trousers of dark material, a heavy belt with silver buckle, and a white, soft shirt with wide collar open at the neck. He was bareheaded. "'I'm going to run white slides,' he said to the cowboys. "'What are your names?' Columbine wanted to giggle, which impulse she smothered. The idea of anyone asking Jim his name... She had never been able to find out. "'My handle is Lemuel Archibald Billings,' replied Lem blandly. The middle name was an addition no one had ever heard. Bellounds then directed his glance and steps toward the girl. The cowboys dropped their heads and shuffled on their way. "'There's only one girl on the ranch,' said Bellounds. "'So you must be Columbine.' "'Yes, and you're Jack,' she replied, and slipped off the fence. I am glad to welcome you home. She offered her hand, and he held it until she extricated it. There was genuine surprise and pleasure in his expression. Well, I'd never have known you, he said, surveying her from head to foot. It's funny. I had the clearest picture of you in mind, but you're not at all like I imagined. The Columbine I remember was thin, white-faced, and all eyes. "'It's been a long time, seven years,' she replied. "'But I knew you. You're older, taller, bigger, but the same Buster Jack.' "'I hope not,' he said, frankly condemning that former self. "'Dad needs me. He wants me to take charge here, to be a man. I'm back now. It's good to be home. I never was worth much. Lord, I hope I don't disappoint him again.' "'I hope so, too,' she murmured. "'To hear him talk frankly, seriously, like this, "'counteracted the unfavourable impression she had received. "'He seemed earnest. "'He looked down at the ground, "'where he was pushing little pebbles with the toe of his boot. "'She had a good opportunity to study his face "'and availed herself of it. "'He did look like his father, "'with his big, handsome head and his blue eyes, bolder perhaps from their prominence than from any direct gaze or fire. His face was pale and shadowed by worry or discontent. It seemed as though a repressed character showed there. His mouth and chin were undisciplined. Columbine could not imagine that she despised anything she saw in the features of this young man. Yet there was something about him that held her aloof, she had made up her mind to do her part unselfishly. She would find the best in him, like him for it, be strong to endure and to help. 
yet she had no power to control her vague and strange perceptions why was it that she could not feel in him what she liked in jim montana or lem or wilson moore this was my second long stay away from home said belllounds the first was when i went to school in kansas city i liked that i was sorry when they turned me out sent me home but the last three years were hell his face worked and a shade of dark blood rippled over it did you work queried columbine work it was worse than work sure i worked he replied columbine's sharp glance sought his hands they looked as soft and unscarred as her own what kind of work had he done if he told the truth well if you work hard for dad learn to handle the cowboys and never take up those old bad habits you mean drink and cards i swear i'd forgotten them for three years until yesterday i reckon i've the better of them then you'll make dad and me happy you'll be happy too columbine thrilled at the touch of fineness coming out in him there was good in him whatever the mad wild pranks of his boyhood dad wants us to marry he said suddenly with shyness and a strange amused smile isn't that funny you and me who used to fight like cat and dog do you remember the time i pushed you into the old mud hole and you lay in wait for me behind the house to hit me with a rotten cabbage yes i remember replied columbine dreamily it seems so long ago and the time you ate my pie and how i got even by tearing off your little dress so you had to run home almost without a stitch on guess i've forgotten that replied columbine with a blush i must have been very little then you were a little devil do you remember the fight i had with moore about you she did not answer for she disliked the fleeting expression that crossed his face he remembered too well i'll settle that score with moore he went on besides i won't have him on the ranch dad needs good hands she said with her eyes on the grey sage slopes mention of wilson moore augmented the aloofness in her an annoyance pricked along her veins before we get any further i'd like to know something has moore ever made love to you columbine felt that prickling augment to a hot sharp wave of blood why was she at the mercy of strange quick unfamiliar sensations why did she hesitate over that natural query from jack belllounds no he never has she replied presently that's damn queer you used to like him better than anybody else you sure hated me columbine have you outgrown that yes of course she answered but i hardly hated you dad said you were willing to marry me is that so columbine dropped her head his question kindly put did not affront her for it had been expected but his actual presence the meaning of his words stirred in her an unutterable spirit of protest she had already in her will consented to the demand of the old man she was learning now however that she could not force her flesh to consent to a surrender it did not desire yes i'm willing she replied bravely soon he flashed with an eager difference in his voice if i had my way it had not be too soon she faltered her downcast eyes had seen the stride he had made closer to her and she wanted to run why dad thinks it'd be good for me went on belllounds now with strong self-centred thought it'd give me responsibility i reckon i need it why not soon wouldn't it be better to wait a while she asked we do not know each other let alone care columbine i've fallen in love with you he declared hotly oh how could you cried columbine incredulously why i always was moony over you when we were kids he said 
and now to meet you grown up like this so pretty and sweet such a, a healthy blooming girl and dad's word that you'd be my wife soon mine why i just went off my head at sight of you columbine looked up at him and was reminded of how as a boy he had always taken a quick passionate longing for things he must and would have and his father had not denied him it might really be that jack had suddenly fallen in love with her would you want to take me without my my love she asked very low i don't love you now i might sometime if you were good if you made dad happy if you conquered take you i'd take you if you if you hated me he replied now in the grip of passion i'll tell dad how i feel she said faintly and and marry you when he says he kissed her would have embraced her had she not put him back don't some someone will see columbine we're engaged he asserted with a laugh of possession say you needn't look so white and scared i won't eat you but i'd like to oh you're a sweet girl here i was hating to come home and look at my luck then with a sudden change that seemed significant of his character he lost his ardour dropped the half bold half masterful air and showed the softer side collie i never was any good he said but i want to be better i'll prove it i'll make a clean breast of everything i won't marry you with any secret between us you might find out afterward and hate me do you have any idea where i've been these last three years no answered columbine i'll tell you right now but you must promise never to mention it to anyone or throw it up to me ever he spoke hoarsely and had grown quite white suddenly columbine thought of wilson moore he had known where jack had spent those years he had resisted a strong temptation to tell her that was as noble in him as the implication of jack's whereabouts had been base jack that is big of you she replied hurriedly i respect you like you for it but you needn't tell me i'd rather you didn't i'll take the will for the deed bellounds evidently experienced a poignant shock of amaze of relief of wonder of gratitude in an instant he seemed transformed collie if i hadn't loved you before i'd love you now that was going to be the hardest job i ever had to tell you my my story i meant it and now i'll not have to feel your shame for me and i'll not feel i'm a cheat or a liar but i will tell you this if you love me you'll make a man of me end of chapter two Chapter Three of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The rancher thought it best to wait till after the round-up before he turned over the foremanship to his son. This was wise, but Jack did not see it that way. He showed that his old intolerant spirit had, if anything, grown during his absence. Bellounds patiently argued with him explaining what certainly should have been clear to a young man brought up in colorado the fall round-up was the most important time of the year and during the strenuous drive the appointed foreman should have absolute control jack gave in finally with a bad grace it was unfortunate that he went directly from his father's presence out to the corrals some of the cowboys who had ridden all the day before and stood guard all night had just come in they were begrimed with dust weary and sleepy-eyed this here outfit won't see my tracks no more said one disgustedly i never kicked on doing two men's work but when it comes to rustling day and night 
all the time, I'm a going to pass. Turn in, boys, and sleep till we get back with the chuck wagon, said Wilson Moore. We'll clean up that bunch today. Ain't you tired, Wills? queried Bloodsoe, a squat, bow-legged cowpuncher who appeared to be crippled or very lame. Me? Nah, granted Moore derisively. Blood, you sure ask fool questions. Why, you mahogany-coloured, stump-legged biped of a cowpuncher, I've had three hours sleep in four nights. What's a biped? asked Blood so dubiously. Nobody enlightened him. Wills, you all are the only educated cowman I ever loved, but I'm a son of a gun if we ain't a-going to come to blows some day, declared Blood so. He sure can sling English, drawled Lem Billings. I reckon he swallowed a dictionary once. Well, he can sling a rope too, and that evens up added jim montana just at this moment jack belllounds appeared upon the scene the cowboys took no notice of him jim was bandaging a leg of his horse bloodsoe was wearily gathering up his saddle and trappings lem was giving his tired mustang a parting slap that meant much moore evidently awaited a fresh mount a mexican lad had come in out of the pasture leading several horses one of which was the mottled white mustang that Moore rode most of the time. Bellounds lounged forward with interest as Moore whistled, and the mustang showed his pleasure. Manifestly, he did not like the Mexican boy, and he did like Moore. Spotty, it's drag yearlings around for you today, said the cowboy as he caught the mustang. Spotty tossed his head and stepped high until the bridle was on. When the saddle was thrown and strapped in place, the mustang showed to advantage. He was beautiful, but not too graceful or sleek or fine-pointed or prancing to prejudice any cowboy against his qualities for work. Jack Bellounds admiringly walked all around the mustang, a little too close to please Spotty. More, he's a fair to middling horse, said Bellounds, with the air of judge of horseflesh. What's his name? Spotty replied Moore shortly, as he made ready to mount. "'Hold on, will you?' ordered Jack peremptorily. "'I like this horse. I want to look him over.' When he grasped the bridle reins out of the cowboy's hand, Spotty jumped as if he had been shot at. Bellounds jerked at him and went closer. The mustang reared, snorting, plunging to get loose. Then Jack Bellounds showed the sudden temper for which he was noted. Red stained his pale cheeks. "'Damn you! Come down!' he shouted, infuriated at the mustang, and with both hands he gave a powerful lunge. Spotty came down and stood there, trembling all over, his ears laid back, his eyes showing fright and pain. Blood dripped from his mouth where the bit had cut him. "'I'll teach you to stand,' said Bellounds, darkly. "'More, lend me your spurs.' I want to try him out. I don't lend my spurs, or my horse either, replied the cowboy, quietly, with a stride that put him within reach of Spotty. The other cowboys had dropped their trappings and stood at attention, with intent gaze and mute lips. Is he your horse? demanded Jack, with a quick flush. I reckon so, replied Moore slowly. No one but me ever rode him. "'Does my father own him, or do you own him?' "'Well, if that's the way you figure, he belongs to White Slides,' returned the cowboy. "'I never bought him. I only raised him from a colt, broke him, and rode him.' "'I thought so. More, he's mine, and I'm going to ride him now. Lend me spurs, one of you cowpunchers.' Nobody made any motion to comply. There seemed to be a suspense at hand that escaped Bellounds. I'll ride him without spurs, he declared presently, and again he turned to mount the mustang. Bellounds, it'd be better for you not to ride him now, said Moore coolly. Why, I'd like to know, demanded Bellounds, with the temper of one who did not tolerate opposition. He's the only horse left for me to ride, answered the cowboy. We're branding today. Hudson was hurt yesterday. He was foreman, and he appointed me to fill his place. I've got to rope yearlings. 
Now, if you get up on Spotty, you'll excite him. He's high-strung, nervous. That'll be bad for him, as he hates cutting out and roping. The reasonableness of this argument was lost upon Bellounds. More? Maybe it'd interest you to know that I'm foreman of White Slides, he asserted, not without loftiness. His speech manifestly decided something vital for the cowboy. Aha! Uh -huh. I'm sure interested this minute, replied Moore, and then, stepping to the side of the Mustang, with swift hands he unbuckled the cinch, and with one sweep he drew saddle and blanket to the ground. The action surprised Bellounds. He stared. There seemed something boyish in his lack of comprehension. Then his temper flamed. "'What do you mean by that?' he demanded, with a strident note in his voice. "'Put that saddle back!' "'Not much. It's my saddle. Cost sixty dollars at Kremling last year. Good old hard-earned saddle. And you can't ride it. Savvy?' "'Yes, I savvy,' replied Bellounds violently. "'Now you'll savvy what I say. I'll have you discharged.' "'Nope. Too late.' said moore with cool easy scorn i figured that and i quit a minute ago when you showed what little regard you had for a horse you quit well it's damn good riddance i wouldn't have you in the outfit you couldn't have kept me buster jack the epithet must have been an insult to bellounds don't you dare call me that he burst out furiously moore pretended surprise why not it's your range name. We all get a handle, whether we like it or not. There's Montana, and Blood, and Lemmy Two Bits. They call me Professor. Why should you kick on yours? I won't stand it now. Not from anyone, especially not you. Uh-huh. Well, I'm afraid it'll stick, replied Moore with sarcasm. It sure suits you. Don't you bust everything you monkey with? Your old dad will sure be glad to see you bust the round-up today, and I reckon the outfit tomorrow. You insolent cow-puncher, shouted Bellounds, growing beside himself with rage. If you don't shut up, I'll bust your face. Shut up? Me? Nope, it can't be did. This is a free country, Buster Jack. There was no denying Moore's cool, stinging repetition of the epithet that had so affronted Bellounds. I always hated you, he rasped out hoarsely. Striking hard at Moore, he missed, but a second effort landed a glancing blow on the cowboy's face. Moore staggered back, recovered his balance, and hitting out shortly, he returned the blow. Bellounds fell against the corral fence, which upheld him. Buster Jack, you're crazy, cried the cowboy, his eyes flashing. Do you think you can lick me after where you've been these three years? Like a maddened boy, Bellounds leaped forward, this time his increased violence and wildness of face expressive of malignant rage. He swung his arms at random. Moore avoided his blows and planted a fist squarely on his adversary's snarling mouth. Bellounds fell with a thump. He got up with clumsy haste, but did not rush forward again. His big, prominent eyes held a dark and ugly look. His lower jaw wobbled as he panted for breath and speech at once. More, I'll kill you, he hissed, with glance flying everywhere for a weapon. From ground to cowboys he looked. Bloodsoe was the only one packing a gun. Bellown saw it, and he was so swift in bounding forward that he got a hand on it before Bloodsoe could prevent. Let go, give me that gun! "'By God, I'll fix him!' yelled Bellounds as Bloodsoe grappled with him. There was a sharp struggle. Bloodsoe wrenched the other's hands free, and pulling the gun, he essayed to throw it. But Bellounds blocked his action, and the gun fell at their feet. "'Grab it!' sang out Bloodsoe ringingly. "'Quick, somebody! The damned fool'll kill Wills!' Lem, running in, kicked the gun just as Bellounds reached for it. When it rolled against the fence, Jim was there to secure it. Lem likewise grappled with the struggling Bellounds. "'Here, you Jack Bellounds,' said Lem. "'Couldn't you see Wills wasn't packing no gun? "'A rarin' like that! Stop your rantin' or we'll sure handle you rough!' 
"'The old man's coming,' called Jim warningly. The rancher appeared. He strode swiftly, ponderously. His grey hair waved. His look was as stern as that of an eagle. "'What the hell's going on?' he roared. The cowboys released Jack. That worthy, sullen and downcast, muttering to himself, stalked for the house. "'Jack, stand your ground!' called old Bellounds. But the son gave no heed. Once he looked back over his shoulder, and his dark glance saw no one save Moore. "'Boss, there's been a little argument,' explained Jim, as with swift hand he hid Bloodsoe's gun. "'Nothing much.' "'Jim, you're a liar,' replied the old rancher. "'Oh!' exclaimed Jim, crestfallen. "'What are you hiding? You've got something there. Give me that gun.' Without more ado, Jim handed the gun over. "'It's mine, boss,' put in Bloodsoe. "'Uh-huh. Well, what was Jim hiding it for?' demanded Bellounds. "'Why, I just tossed it to him when I sort of joined in with the argument. We was tussling some, and I didn't want no gun.' "'How characteristic of cowboys that they lied to shield Jack Bellounds!' But it was futile to attempt to deceive the old rancher. Here was a man who had been forty years dealing with all kinds of men and events. Blood so, you can't fool me, said old Bill calmly. He had roared at them, and his eyes still flashed like blue fire, but he was calm and cool. Returning the gun to its owner, he continued, I reckon you'd spare my feelings and lie about some trick of Jack's. Did he bust out? Well, tolerable like, replied Bloodsoe dryly. Uh-huh. Tell me then, and no lies. Bellown's shrewd eyes had rested upon Wilson Moore. The cowboy's face showed the red marks of battle and the white of passion. I'm not going to lie. You can bet on that, he declared forcefully. Uh-huh. I might have knowed you and Jack had clash, said Bellown's gruffly. What happened? He hurt my horse. If it hadn't been for that, there'd been no trouble. A light leaped up in the old man's bold eyes. He was a lover of horses. Many hard words and blows, too, he had dealt cowboys for being brutal. What did he do? Look at Spotty's mouth. The rancher's way of approaching a horse was singularly different from his son's, notwithstanding the fact that Spotty knew him and showed no uneasiness. The examination took only a moment. Tongue cut bad. That's a damn shame. Take that bridle off. There. If it had been an ornery horse now. Moore, how'd this happen? We just rode in, replied Wilson hurriedly. I was saddling Spotty when Jack came up. He took a shine to the Mustang and wanted to ride him. When Spotty reared, he's shy with strangers, why, Jack gave a hell of a jerk on the bridle. The bit cut Spotty. Well, that made me mad, but I held in. I objected to Jack riding Spotty. You see, Hudson was hurt yesterday, and he appointed me foreman for today. I needed Spotty. But your son couldn't see it, and that made me sore. Jack said the Mustang was his. His? interrupted Bellounds. Yes, he claimed Spotty. Well, he wasn't really mine, so I gave in. When I threw off the saddle, which was mine, Jack began to roar. He said he was foreman and he'd have me discharged. But I said I'd quit already. We both kept getting sorer, and I called him Buster Jack. He hit me first. Then we fought. I reckon I was getting the best of him when he made a dive for Bloodsoe's gun. And that's all. Boss, as sure as I'm a born cowman, put in Bloodsoe, he'd have plugged Wills if he'd got my gun. At that, he damn near got it. The old man stroked his scant grey beard with his huge, steady hand, apparently not greatly concerned by the disclosure. Montana, what do you say? he queried, as if he held strong store by that quiet cowboy's opinion. Well, boss, replied Jim reluctantly, Buster Jack's temper was bad once, but now it's plumb wuss. Whereupon Bellounds turned to Moore with a gesture, 
and a look of a man who, in justice to something in himself, had to speak. "'Wills, it's unlucky you clashed with Jack right off,' he said. "'But that was to be expected. I reckon Jack was in the wrong. That hoss was yours by all a cowboy holds right and square. There be by law Spotty belonged to White Slide's ranch. To me. But he's yours now, for I give him to you.' "'Much obliged, Bellounds. "'I sure do appreciate that,' replied Moore warmly. "'It's what anybody would gamble Bill Bellounds would do.' "'Aha. Uh -huh. "'And I'd take it as a favour if you'd stay on today and get that branding done.' "'All right, I'll do that for you,' replied Moore. "'Lem, I guess you won't get your sleep till tonight. "'Come on.' "'Oh,' sighed Lem as he picked up his bridle. Late that afternoon, Columbine sat upon the porch, watching the sunset. It had been a quiet day for her, mostly indoors. Once only had she seen Jack, and then he was riding by toward the pasture, whirling a lasso round his head. Jack could ride like one born to the range, but he was not an adept in the use of a rope. Nor had Columbine seen the old rancher since breakfast. She had heard his footsteps, however, pacing slowly up and down his room. She was watching the last rays of the setting sun, rimming with gold the ramparts of the mountain eastward, and burning a crown for old White Slide's peak. A distant bawl and bellow of cattle had died away. The branding was over for that fall. How glad she felt. The wind, beginning to grow cold as the sun declined, cooled her hot face. In the solitude of her room, Columbine had cried enough that day to scald her cheeks. Presently, down the lane between the pastures, she saw a cowboy ride into view. Very slowly he came, leading another horse. Columbine recognised Lem a second before she saw that he was leading Pronto. That struck her as strange. Another glance showed Pronto to be limping. Apparently he could just get along, and that was all. Columbine ran out in dismay, reaching the corral gate before Lem did. At first she had eyes only for her beloved Mustang. "'Oh, Lem, Pronto's hurt!' she cried. "'Well, I should smile he is,' replied Lem. But Lem was not smiling, and when he wore a serious face for Columbine, something had indeed happened. The cowboy was the colour of dust, and so tired that he reeled. "'Lem, he's all bloody!' exclaimed Columbine, as she ran toward Pronto. "'Here, you just wait,' ordered Lem testily. "'Pronto's all cut up, and you got to hustle some linen and salve.' Columbine flew away to do his bidding, and so quick and violent was she, that when she got back to the corral she was out of breath. Pronto whinnied as she fell, panting on her knees beside Lem, who was examining bloody gashes on the legs of the Mustang. "'Well, I reckon no great harm did,' said Lem, with relief. "'But he sure had a close shave. "'Now you help me doctor him up.' "'Yes, I'll help,' panted Columbine. "'I've done this kind of thing often, but never to Pronto. "'Oh, I was afraid he'd been gored by a steer.' "'Well, he come damn near being,' replied Lem grimly. "'And if it hadn't been for riding you don't see every day, "'why, that ornery Texas steer it have got him. "'Who was riding, Lem? Was it you? "'Oh, I'll never be able to do enough for you.' "'What's luck it weren't me,' said Lem. "'No, who then?' "'Well, it was Wills, and he made me swear to tell you nothing, "'leastways about him.' "'Wills? Did he save Pronto?' "'And didn't want you to tell me? "'Lem, something has happened. "'You're not like yourself.' "'Miss Collie, I reckon I'm nigh all in,' replied Lem wearily. "'When I get this bandaging done, I'll fall right off my horse. "'But you're on the ground now, Lem,' said Columbine, with a nervous laugh. "'What happened? "'Did you hear about the argument this morning?' "'No. What? Who?' You can ask old Bill about that. The way Pronto was hurt come off like this. Buster Jack rode out to where we was branding and jumped his hoss over a fence into the pasture. 
He had a rope, and he got to chasing some hosses over there. One was Pronto, and the son of a gun somehow did get the noose over Pronto's head. But he couldn't hold it, or didn't want to, for Pronto broke loose and jumped the fence. This wasn't so bad as far as it went, but one of them bad steers got after Pronto. He run and sure stepped on the rope and fell. The big steer nearly piled on him. Pronto broke some records then. He sure was scared. Howsoever, he picked out rough ground and ran plumb into some dead brush. Reckon there he got cut up. We was all a good ways off. The steer went bawling and plunging after Pronto. Wills yelled for a rifle, but nobody had one. Nor a six-shooter either. I'm going back to packing a gun. Well, Wills did some riding to get over there in time to save Pronto. Lem, that is not all, said Columbine earnestly as the cowboy concluded. Her knowledge of the range told her that Lem had narrated nothing so far, which could have been cause for his cold, grim, evasive manner, and her woman's intuition divined a catastrophe. Nope. Will's hoss fell on him. Lem broke that final news with all a cowboy's bluntness. Was he hurt? Lem! cried Columbine. Say, Miss Collie, remonstrated Lem, we're doctoring up your horse. You needn't drop everything and grab me like that. And you're white as a sheet, too. It ain't nothing much for a cowboy to have a hoss fall on him. Lem Billings, I'll hate you if you don't tell me quick, flashed Columbine fiercely. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's how the land lays, replied Lem shrewdly. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that Wills was bad hurt. Now, not real bad. The horse fell on his leg and broke it. I cut off his boot. His foot was all smashed, but there wasn't any other hurt, honest. They're taking him to Kremlin. Ah! Columbine's low cry sounded strangely in her ears, as if someone else had uttered it. Buster Jack made two bursts this here day, concluded Lem reflectively. Miss Collie, I ain't sure how you're regarding that individual, but I'm telling you this, for your own good. He's bad medicine. He has his old man's temper that riles up at nothing and never felt a halter. Wusser than that, he's spoiled, and he acts like a colt that had tasted loco. The idea of his rope in Pronto right there near the round-up. Anyone would think he'd just come west. Old Bill is no fool, but he wears blinders when he looks at his son. I'm predicting bad days for White Slide's ranch. End of chapter 3「Only one man at Meeker appeared to be attracted by the news that rancher Bill Bellounds was offering employment. This was a little cadaverous-looking fellow, apparently neither young nor old, who said his name was Bent Wade. He had drifted into Meeker with two poor horses and a pack. "'Where are you from?' asked the innkeeper, observing how Wade cared for his horses before he thought of himself. The query had to be repeated. Cripple Creek. I was cook for some miners, and I panned gold between times, was the reply. Ha! <laughs> that ought to been a better paying job than any to be had hereabouts. Yes, got big pay there, said Wade with a sigh. What do you leave for? We had a fight over the diggings, and I was the only one left. I'll tell you. Whereupon Wade sat down on a box, removed his old sombrero, and began to talk. An idler sauntered over, attracted by something. Then a miner happened by to halt and join the group. Next, old Kemp, the patriarch of the village, came and listened attentively. Wade seemed to have a strange magnetism, a magic tongue. He was small of stature, but wiry and muscular. His garments were old, soiled, worn. When he removed the wide-brimmed sombrero, he exposed a remarkable face. 
It was smooth except for a drooping moustache, and pallid, with drops of sweat standing out on the high, broad forehead, gaunt and hollow-cheeked, with an enormous nose and cavernous eyes set deep under shaggy brows. These features, however, were not so striking in themselves. Long, sloping, almost invisible lines of pain, the shadow of mystery and gloom in the deep-set dark eyes, a sad harmony between features and expression, these marked the man's face with a record no keen eye could miss. Wade told a terrible tale of gold and blood and death. It seemed to relieve him. His face changed and lost what might have been called its tragic light, its driven intensity. His listeners shook their heads in awe. Hard tales were common in Colorado, but this one was exceptional. Two of the group left without comment. Old Kemp stared with narrow, half-recognizing eyes at the newcomer. "'Well, well,' ejaculated the innkeeper. "'It do beat hell what can happen. "'Stranger, will you put up your horses and stay?' "'I'm looking for work,' replied Wade. It was then that mention was made of Bellounds sending to Meeker for hands. Old Bill Bellounds that settled Middle Park and made friends with the Utes, said Wade, as if certain of his facts. Yep, you have Bill to rights. Do you know him? I seen him once twenty years ago. Ever been to Middle Park? Bellounds owns ranches there, said the innkeeper. He ain't living in the park now, interposed Kemp. He's at White Slides, I reckon, these last eight or ten years. That's over the Gore Range. "'Prospected all through that country,' said Wade. "'Well, it's a fine part of Colorado. "'Hay and stock country, too high for grain. "'Did you mean you'd been through the park?' "'Once, long ago,' replied Wade, "'staring with his great cavernous eyes into space. "'Some memory of Middle Park haunted him. "'Well, then, I won't be steering you wrong,' said the innkeeper. "'I like that country. Some people don't.' And I say, if you can cook, or pack, or punch cows, or most anything, you'll find a bunk with old Bill. I understand he was needing a hunter, most of all. Lions and wolves, bad. Can you hunt? Hey? queried Wade absently, as he inclined his ear. I'm deaf on one side. Are you a good man with dogs and guns? shouted his questioner. Tolerable, replied Wade. Then you're sure of a job. I'll go. Much obliged to you. Not at all. I'm doing Bellounds a favour. Reckon you'll put up here tonight? I always sleep out, but I'll buy feed and supplies, replied Wade, as he turned to his horses. Old Kemp trudged down the road, wagging his grey head as if he was contending with a memory sadly failing him. An hour later, when Bent Wade rode out of town, he passed Kemp and hailed him. The old-timer suddenly slapped his leg. By golly, I knowed I'd met him before. Later, he said, with a show of gossipy excitement to his friend the innkeeper, that fellow was Bent Wade. So he told me, returned the other. But didn't you never hear of him? Bent Wade? Now you tax me, that name do appear familiar. But dash take it, I can't remember. I knowed he was somebody, though. Hope I didn't wish a gunfighter or outlaw on old Bill. Who was he, anyhow? They call him Hell Bent Wade. I seen him in Wyoming, where he were a stage driver. But I never heard who he was and what he was till years after. That was once I dropped down into Boulder. Wade was there, all shot up, being nursed by Sam Coles. Sam's dead now. He was a friend of Wade's and knowed him for long. Well, I heard all that anybody ever heard about him, I reckon. According to Coles, this here hell-bent Wade was a strange, wonderful sort of fella. He had the most amazing ways. He could do anything under the sun better than anyone else. Bad with guns. He never stayed in one place for long. He never hunted trouble, but trouble followed him. As I remember Coles... That was Wade's queer idea. He couldn't shake trouble. 
No matter where he went, always there was Hell. That's what gave him the name Hell Bent. And Coles swore that Wade was the whitest man he ever knew. Heart of gold, he said. Always saving somebody, helping somebody, giving his money or time, never thinking of himself at all. When he began to tell that story about Cripple Creek, then my old head began to ache with remembering. For I'd heard Bent Wade talk before. Just the same kind of story he told here, only worse. Lordy, but that fellow has seen times. And queerest of all is that idea he has how hell's on his trail, and everywhere he roams it catches up with him, and there he meets the man who's got to hear his tale. Sunset found Bent Wade far up the valley of White River, under the shadow of the flat-top mountains. It was beautiful country. Grassy hills with coloured aspen groves swelled up on his left, and across the brawling stream rose a league-long slope of black spruce, above which the bare red and grey walls of the range towered, glorious with the blaze of sinking sun. White patches of snow showed in the sheltered nooks. Wade's gaze rested longest on the coloured heights. By and by the narrow valley opened into a park, at the upper end of which stood a log cabin. A few cattle and horses grazed in an enclosed pasture. The trail led by the cabin. As Wade rode up, a bushy-haired man came out of the door, rifle in hand. He might have been going out to hunt, but his scrutiny of Wade was that of a lone settler in a wild land. "'Howdy, stranger,' he said. "'Good evening,' replied Wade. "'Reckon you're Blair, and I'm nigh the headwaters of this river.' "'Yep, a matter of three miles to Trapper's Lake. "'My name's Wade. I'm packing over to take a job with Bill Bellounds.' "'Get down and come in,' returned Blair. "'Bill's man stopped with me some time ago.' "'Obliged, I'm sure, but I'll be going on,' responded Wade. "'Do you happen to have a hunk of deer meat? "'Game powerful scarce coming up this valley. "'Lots of deer and elk higher up. "'I chased a bunch of more than thirty, I reckon, "'right out of my pasture this morning.' "'Blair crossed to an open shed nearby "'and returned with half a deer haunch, "'which he tied upon Wade's pack-horse. "'My old woman's ailing. "'Do you happen to have some tobacco?' I sure do, both smoking and chewing, and I can spare more chewing. A little goes a long ways with me. Well, give me some of both, most chewing, replied Blair with evident satisfaction. You acquainted with Bellounds? asked Wade, as he handed over the tobacco. Well, yes, everybody knows Bill. You'd never find a whiter boss in these hills. Has he any family? No, I can't say as to that, replied Blair. I heard he lost a wife years ago. Maybe he married again. But Bill's getting along. Good day to you, Blair, said Wade, and took up his bridle. Good day and good luck. Take the right-hand trail. Better trot up a bit if you want to make camp before dark. Wade soon entered the spruce forest. Then he came to a shallow, roaring river. The horses drank the water, foaming white and amber around their knees and then with splash and thump they forded it over the slippery rocks. As they cracked out upon the trail, a covey of grouse whirred up into the low branches of spruce trees. They were tame. That's something like, said Wade. First birds I've seen this fall. Reckon I can have stew any day. He halted his horse and made a move to dismount, but with his eyes on the grouse he hesitated. Tame as chickens and they sure are pretty. Then he rode on, leading his pack-horse. The trail was not steep, although in places it had washed out, thus hindering a steady trot. As he progressed, the forest grew thick and darker, and the fragrance of pine and spruce filled the air. A dreamy roar of water rushing over rocks rang in the traveller's ears. It receded at times, then grew louder. Presently the forest shade ahead lightened, and he rode out into a wide space where green moss and flags and flowers surrounded a wonderful spring hole. Sunset gleams shone through the trees to colour the wide round pool. 
It was shallow all along the margin, with a deep, large green hole in the middle where the water boiled up. Trout were feeding on gnats and playing on the surface, and some big ones left wakes behind them as they sped to deeper water. Wade had an appreciative eye for all this beauty, his gaze lingering longest upon the flowers. "'Wild woods is the place for me,' he soliloquized, as the cool wind fanned his cheeks and the sweet tang of evergreen tingled his nostrils. "'But sure I'm most haunted in these lonely, silent places.' Bent Wade had the look of a haunted man. Perhaps the consciousness he confessed was part of his secret. Twilight had come when again he rode out into the open. Trapper's Lake lay before him, a beautiful sheet of water, mirroring the black slopes and the fringed spruces and the flat peaks. Over all its grey, twilight-softened surface showed little swirls and boils and splashes where the myriads of trout were rising. The trail led out over open grassy shores, with a few pines straggling down to the lake, and clumps of spruces raising dark blurs against the background of gleaming lake. Wade heard a sharp crack of hoofs on rock, and he knew he had disturbed deer at their drinking. Also he heard a ring of horns on the branch of a tree, and was sure an elk was slipping off through the woods. Across the lake he saw a camp fire, and a pale, sharp-pointed object that was a trapper's tent or an Indian's teepee. Selecting a campsite for himself, he unsaddled his horse, threw the pack off the other, and, hobbling both animals, he turned them loose. His roll of bedding, roped in canvas tarpaulin, he threw under a spruce tree. Then he opened his oxhide-covered packs and laid out utensils and bags, little and big. All his movements were methodical, yet swift, accurate, habitual. He was not thinking about what he was doing. It took him some little time to find a suitable log to split for firewood, and when he had started a blaze, night had fallen, and the light, as it grew and brightened, played fantastically upon the isolating shadows. Lid and pot of the little Dutch oven he threw separately upon the sputtering fire, and while they heated he washed his hands, mixed the biscuits, cut slices of meat off the deer haunch, and put water on to boil. He broiled his meat on the hot red coals, and laid it near on clean pine chips, while he waited for bread to bake and coffee to boil. The smell of wood smoke and odorous steam from pots and the fragrance of spruce mingled together, keen, sweet, appetizing. Then he ate his simple meal hungrily, with the content of the man who had fared worse. After he had satisfied himself, he washed his utensils and stowed them away with the bags, whereupon his movements acquired less dexterity and speed. The rest hour had come. Still, like the long-experienced man in the open, he looked around for more to do, and his gaze fell upon his weapons lying on his saddle. His rifle was a Henry, shiny and smooth from long service and care. His small gun was a Colt's forty-five. It had been carried in a saddle holster. Wade rubbed the rifle with his hands, and then with a greasy rag which he took from the sheath. After that he held the rifle to the heat of the fire. A squall of rain had overtaken him that day, wetting his weapons. A subtle and singular difference seemed to show in the way he took up the colts. His action was slow, his look reluctant. The small gun was not merely a thing of steel and powder and ball. He dried it and rubbed it with care, but not with love, and then he stowed it away. Next, Wade unrolled his bed under the spruce, with one end of the tarpaulin resting on the soft mat of needles. On top of that came the two woolly sheepskins, which he used to lie upon, then his blankets, and over all the other end of the tarpaulin. This ended his tasks for the day. He lighted his pipe and composed himself beside the camp fire to smoke and rest a while before going to bed. The silence of the wilderness enfolded lake and shore. 
yet presently it came to be a silence accentuated by near and distant sounds faint wild lonely the low hum of falling water the splash of tiny waves on the shore the song of insects and the dismal hoot of owls bill bellounds and he needs a hunter soliloquized bent wade with gloomy penetrating eyes seeing far through the red embers that will suit me and change my luck likely living in the woods away from people i could stick to a job like that but if this white slides is close to the old trail i'll never stay he sighed and a darker shadow not from flickering fire overspread his cadaverous face eighteen years ago he had driven the woman he loved away from him out into the world with her baby girl never had he rested beside a camp fire that that old agony did not recur jealous fool too late he had discovered his fatal blunder and then had begun a search over colorado ending not a hundred miles across the wild mountains from where he brooded that lonely hour a search ended by news of the massacre of a wagon train by indians that was bent wade's secret and no earthly sufferings could have been crueller than his agony and remorse as through the long years he wandered on and on the very good that he tried to do seemed to ferment evil the wisdom that grew out of his suffering opened pitfalls for his wandering feet the wildness of men and the passion of women somehow waited with incredible fatality for that hour when chance led him into their lives he had toiled he had given he had fought he had sacrificed he had killed he had endured for the human nature which in his savage youth he had betrayed yet out of his supreme and endless striving to undo to make reparation to give his life to find god had come it seemed to wade in his abasement only a driving torment but though his thought and emotion fluctuated varying wandering his memory held a fixed and changeless picture of a woman fair and sweet with eyes of nameless blue and face as white as a flower baby would have been let's see most nineteen years old now if she'd lived he said a big girl i reckon like her mother strange how as i grow older i remember better the night wind moaned through the spruces dark clouds scudded across the sky blotting out the bright stars a steady low roar of water came from the outlet of the lake the campfire flickered and burned out so that no sparks blew into the blackness and the red embers glowed and paled and crackled wade at length got up and made ready for bed he threw back tarpaulin and blankets and laid his rifle alongside where he could cover it his coat served for a pillow and he put the colt's gun under that then pulling off his boots he slipped into bed dressed as he was and like all men in the open at once fell asleep for wade and for countless men like him who for many years had roamed the west this sleeping alone in wild places held both charm and peril but the fascination of it was only a vague realization and the danger was laughed at over bent wade's quiet form the shadows played the spruce boughs waved the piney needles rustled down the wind moaned louder as the night advanced by and by the horses rested from their grazing the insects ceased to hum and the continuous roar of water dominated the solitude if wild animals passed wade's camp they gave it a wide berth sunrise found wade on the trail climbing high up above the lake making for the pass over the range he walked leading his horses up a zigzag trail that bore the tracks of recent travellers although this country was sparsely settled yet there were men always riding from camp to camp 
or from one valley town to another. Wade never tarried on a well-trodden trail. As he climbed higher, the spruce trees grew smaller, no longer forming a green aisle before him, and at length they became dwarfed and stunted, and at last failed altogether. Soon he was above Timberline, and out upon a flat-topped mountain range, where in both directions the land rolled and dipped, free of tree or shrub, colourful with grass and flowers. The elevation exceeded eleven thousand feet. A whipping wind swept across the plainland. The sun was pale bright in the east, slowly being obscured by grey clouds. Snow began to fall, first in scudding scanty flakes, but increasing until the air was full of a great fleecy swirl. Wade rode along the rim of a mountain wall, watching a beautiful snowstorm falling into the brown gulf beneath him. Once, as he headed round a break, he caught sight of mountain sheep cuddled under a protecting shelf. The snow squall blew away like a receding wall, leaving grass and flowers wet. As the dark clouds parted, the sun shone warmer out of the blue. Grey peaks with patches of white stood up above their black-timbered slopes. Wade soon crossed the flat-topped pass over the range and faced a descent, rocky and bare at first, but yielding gradually to the encroachment of green. He left the cold winds and bleak trails above him. In an hour, when he was half down the slope, the forest had become warm and dry, fragrant and still. At length he rode out upon the brow of a last wooded bench above a grassy valley, where a bright winding stream gleamed in the sun. While the horses rested, Wade looked about him. Nature never tired him. If he had any peace, it emanated from the silent places, the solemn hills, the flowers and animals of the wild and lonely land. A few straggling pines shaded this last low hill above the valley. Grass grew luxuriantly there in the open, but not under the trees, where the brown needle mats jealously obstructed the green. Clusters of columbines waved their graceful, sweet, pale blue flowers that Wade felt a joy in seeing. He loved flowers. Columbines, the glory of Colorado, came first and next the many-hued purple asters, and then the flaunting spikes of paintbrush, and after them the nameless and numberless wild flowers that decked the mountain meadows and coloured the grass of the aspen groves and peeped out of the edge of snowfields. Strange how it seems good to live when I look at a columbine, or watch a beaver at his work, or listen to the bugle of an elk, mused Bent Wade, he wondered why, with all his life behind him, he could still find comfort in these things. Then he rode on his way. The grassy valley, with its winding stream, slowly descended and widened, and left foothill and mountain far behind. Far across a wide plain rose another range, black and bold against the blue. In the afternoon, Wade reached Algeria, a small hamlet, but important by reason of its being on the main stage line, and because here miners and cattlemen bought supplies. It had one street, so wide it appeared to be a square, on which faced a line of bold board houses with high, flat fronts. Wade rode to the inn where the stagecoaches made headquarters. It suited him to feed and rest his horses there, and partake of a meal himself, before resuming his journey. The proprietor was a stout, pleasant-faced little woman, loquacious and amiable, glad to see a stranger for his own sake, rather than from considerations of possible profit. Though Wade had never before visited Algeria, he soon knew all about the town, and the miners up in the hills, and the only happenings of moment, the arrival and departure of stages. Prosperous place, remarked Wade. I saw that, and it ought to be growing. Not so prosperous for me as it used to be, replied the lady. We did well when my husband was alive, before our competitor come to town. 
He runs a hotel where miners can drink and gamble. I don't. But I reckon I've no cause to complain. I live. Who runs the other hotel? Man named Smith. Reckon that's not his real name. I've had people here who... But it ain't no matter. Men change their names, replied Wade. Stranger, are you packing through or going to stay? On my way to White Slide's ranch, where I'm going to work for Bellounds. Do you know him? No Bellounds? Me? Well, he's the best friend I ever had when I was at Kremlin. I lived there several years. My husband had stock there. In fact, Bill started us in the cattle business. But we got out of there and come here, where Bob died, and I've been stuck ever since. Everybody has a good word for Bellounds, observed Wade. You'll never hear a bad one, replied the woman with cheerful warmth. Bill never had but one fault, and people loved him for that. What was it? He's got a wild boy that he thinks the sun rises and sets in. Buster Jack, they call him. He used to come here often. But Bill sent him away somewhere. The boy was spoiled. I saw his mother years ago. She's dead this long time. And she was no wife for Bill Bellounds. Jack took after her. And Bill was that woman's slave. When she died, all his big heart went to the sun. And that accounts. Jack will never be any good. Wade thoughtfully nodded his head as if he understood and was pondering other possibilities. Is he the only child? There's a girl, but she's not Bill's kin. He adopted her when she was a baby. And Jack's mother hated this child. Jealous, we used to think, because it might grow up and get some of Bill's money. What's the girl's name? asked Wade. Columbine. She was over here last summer with old Bill. They stayed with me. It was then Bill had hard words with Smith across the street. Bill was resenting something Smith put in my way. Well, the lass is the prettiest I ever seen in Colorado, and as good as she's pretty. Old Bill hinted to me he'd likely make a match between her and his son Jack, and I ups and told him, if Jack hadn't turned over a new leaf when he comes home, that such a marriage would be tough on Columbine. Phew, but old Bill was mad. He just can't stand a word again, that buster Jack. Columbine Bellounds, mused Wade. Queer name. Oh, I've known three girls named Columbine. Don't you know the flower? It's common in these parts. Very delicate, like a sago lily, only paler. Were you living in Kremlin when Bellounds adopted the girl? asked Wade. Laws, no, was the reply. That was long before I come to Middle Park, but I heard all about it. The baby was found by gold diggers up in the mountains. Must have got lost from a wagon train that Indians set on soon after, so the miners said. Anyway, old Bill took the baby and raised her as his own. How old is she now? queried Wade, with a singular change in his tone. Columbine's around nineteen. Bent Wade lowered his head a little hiding his features under the old, battered, wide-brimmed hat. The amiable innkeeper did not see the tremor that passed over him, nor the slight stiffening that followed, nor the grey pallor of his face. She went on talking until someone called her. Wade went outdoors, and with bent head walked down the street, across a little river, out into green pasture-land. He struggled with an amazing possibility. Columbine Bellounds might be his own daughter. His heart leaped with joy, but the joy was short-lived. No such hope in this world for Bent Wade. This coincidence, however, left him with a strange prophetic sense in his soul of a tragedy coming to White Slide's ranch. Wade possessed some power of divination, some strange gift to pierce the veil of the future. But he could not exercise this power at will. It came involuntarily, like a messenger of trouble in the dark night. Moreover, he had never yet been able to draw away from the fascination of this knowledge. It lured him on. Always his decision had been to go on, to meet this boding circumstance, or to remain and meet it in the hope that he might take someone's burden upon his shoulders. 
he sensed it now in the keen poignant clairvoyance of the moment the tangle of life that he was about to enter old bill bellounds big and fine victim of love for a wayward son buster jack the waster the terror down the destroyer the wild youth at a wild time columbine the girl of unknown birth good and loyal subject to a condition sure to ruin her wade's strange mind revolved a hundred outcomes to this conflict of characters but not one of them was the one that was written that remained dark never had he received so strong a call out of the unknown nor had he ever felt such intense curiosity hope had long been dead in him except the one that he might atone in some way for the wrong he had done his wife so the pangs of emotion that recurred in spite of reason and bitterness were not recognized by him as lingering hopes wade denied the human in him but he thrilled at the thought of meeting columbine bellounds there was something here beyond all his comprehension it might be true he whispered i'll know when i see her then he walked back toward the inn on the way he looked into the bar-room of the hotel run by smith it was a hard-looking place half full of idle men whose faces were as open pages to bent wade curiosity did not wholly control the impulse that made him wait at the door till he could have a look at the man smith somewhere at some time wade had met most of the veterans of western colorado so much he had travelled but the impulse that held him was answered and explained when smith came in a burly man with an ugly scar marring one eye bent wade recognized smith he recognized the scar for that scar was his own mark dealt to this man whose name was not smith and who had been as evil as he looked and whose nomadic life was not due to remorse or love of travel wade passed on without being seen this recognition meant less to him than it would have ten years ago as he was not now the kind of man who hunted old enemies for revenge or who went to great lengths to keep out of their way men there were in colorado who would shoot at him on sight there had been more than one that had shot to his cost that night wade camped in the foothills east of algeria and upon the following day at sunrise his horses were breaking the frosty grass and ferns of the timbered range this he crossed rode down into a valley where a lonely cabin nestled and followed an old blazed trail that wound up the course of a brook the water was of a colour that made rock and sand and moss seem like gold he saw no signs or tracks of game a grey jay now and then screeched his approach to unseen denizens of the woods the stream babbled past him over mossy ledges under the dark shade of clumps of spruces and it grew smaller as he progressed toward its source at length it was lost in a swale of high rank grass and the blazed trail led on through heavy pine woods at noon he reached the crest of the divide and halting upon an open rocky eminence he gazed down over a green and black forest slow descending to a great irregular park that was his destination for the night wade needed meat and to that end as he went on he kept a sharp lookout for deer especially after he espied fresh tracks crossing the trail slipping along ahead of his horses that followed him almost too closely to permit of his noiseless approach to game he hunted all the way down to the great open park without getting a shot this park was miles across and miles long covered with tall waving grass and it had straggling arms that led off into the surrounding belt of timber it sloped gently toward the centre where a round green acreage of grass gave promise of water wade rode toward this keeping somewhat to the right as he wanted to camp at the edge of the woods 
soon he rode out beyond one of the projecting peninsulas of forest to find the park spreading wider in that direction he saw horses grazing with elk and far down at the notch where evidently the park had outlet in a narrow valley he espied the black hump-shaped shaggy forms of buffalo they bobbed off out of sight then the elk saw or scented him and they trotted away the antlered bulls ahead of the cows wade wondered if the horses were wild they showed great interest but no fear beyond them was a rising piece of ground covered with pine and it appeared to stand aloft from the forest on the far side as well as upon that by which he was approaching riding a mile or so farther he ascertained that this bit of wooded ground resembled an island in a lake presently he saw smoke arising above the treetops a tiny brook welled out of the green centre of the park and meandered around to pass near the island of pines wade saw unmistakable signs of prospecting along this brook and farther down where he crossed it he found tracks made that day the elevated plot of ground appeared to be several acres in extent covered with small-sized pines and at the far edge there was a little log cabin wade expected to surprise a lone prospector at his evening meal as he rode up a dog ran out of the cabin barking furiously a man dressed in fringed buckskin followed he was tall and had long iron-grey hair over his shoulders his bronzed and weather-beaten face was a mass of fine wrinkles where the grizzled hair did not hide them and his shining red countenance proclaimed an honest fearless spirit howdy stranger he called as wade halted several rods distant his greeting was not welcome but it was civil his keen scrutiny however attested to more than his speech evening friend replied wade might i throw my pack here sure get down answered the other i calculate i never seen you in these diggings no i'm bent wade and on my way to white slides to work for bellounds glad to meet you i'm new hereabouts myself but i know bellounds my name's lewis i was just cooking grub and it'll burn too if i don't rustle turn your horses loose and come in wade presented himself with something more than his usual methodical action he smelled buffalo steak and he was hungry the cabin had been built years ago and was a ramshackle shelter at best the stone fireplace however appeared well preserved a bed of red coals glowed and cracked upon the hearth reckon i sure smelled buffalo meat observed wade with much satisfaction it's long since i chewed a hunk of that all ready now pitch in yes there's some buffalo left in here not hunted much there's lots of elk and herds of deer after a little snow you'd think a drove of sheep had been tracking around and some bear wade did not waste many words until he had enjoyed that meal later while he helped his host he recurred to the subject of game if there's so many deer then there's lions and wolves you bet i see tracks every day had a shot at a loafer not long ago missed him but i reckon there's more varmints over in the troublesome country back of white slides troublesome do they call it that asked wade with a queer smile sure and it is troublesome bellounds has been trying to hire a hunter offered me big wages to kill off the wolves and lions that's the job i'm going to take good exclaimed lewis i'm sure glad bellounds is a nice fella i felt sort of cheap till i told him i wasn't really a hunter you see i'm prospecting up here and pretending to be a hunter what do you make that bluff for queried wade you couldn't fool anyone who'd ever prospected for gold. I saw your signs out here. Well, you've sharp eyes, that's all. Wade, I've some undesirable neighbours over here. I'd just as lief they didn't see me digging gold. Lately I've had a hunch they're rustling cattle. Anyways, they've sold cattle in Kremlin that came from over around Algeria. Wherever there's cattle, there's sure to be some stealing, observed Wade. 
Well, you needn't say anything to Bellounds, cause maybe I'm wrong. And if I found out I was right, I'd go down to White Slides and tell it myself. Bellounds done some favours. How far to White Slides? asked Wade, with a puff on his pipe. Roundabout trail and rough, but you'll make it in one day easy. Beautiful country, open, big peaks and ranges, with valleys and lakes. Never seen such grass. Did you ever see Bellown's son? No, didn't know he had one. But I seen his gal the first day I was there. She was nice to me. I went there to be fixed up a bit, nearly chopped my hand off. The gal, Columbine she's called, doctored me up. Fact is, I owe considerable to that White Slides ranch. There's a cowboy, Wills something, who rode up here with some medicine for me. Some they didn't have when I was there. You'll like that boy. I seen he was sweet on the gal, and I sure couldn't blame him. Bent Wade removed his pipe and let out a strange laugh, significant with its little note of grim confirmation. What's funny about that? demanded Lewis, rather surprised. I was only laughing, replied Wade. What you said about the cowboy being sweet on the girl popped into my head before you told it. Well, boys will be boys. I was young once and had my day. Lewis grunted as he bent over to lift a red coal to light his pipe. And as he raised his head, he gave Wade a glance of sympathetic curiosity. Well, I hope I'll see more of you, he said, as his guest rose, evidently to go. Reckon you will, as I'll be chasing hounds all over. And I want to look at them neighbours you spoke of that might be rustlers. I'll turn in now. Good night. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bent Wade rode out of the forest to look down upon the White Slides country at the hour when it was most beautiful. Never seen the beat of that, he exclaimed as he halted. The hour was sunset, with the golden rays and shadows streaking ahead of him down the rolling sage hills all rosy and grey with rich, strange softness. Groves of aspens stood isolated from one another, here crowning a hill with blazing yellow, and there fringing the brow of another with gleaming gold, and lower down reflecting the sunlight with brilliant red and purple. The valley seemed filled with a delicate haze, almost like smoke. White Slide's ranch was hidden from sight, as it lay in the bottom land. The grey old peak towered proud and aloof, clear-cut and sunset flushed against the blue. The eastern slope of the valley was a vast sweep of sage and hill and grassy bench and aspen bench, on fire with the colours of autumn, made molten by the last flashing of the sun. Great black slopes of forest gave sharp contrast and led up to the red-walled ramparts of the mountain range. Wade watched the scene until the fire faded, the golden shafts paled and died, the rosy glow on sage changed to cold steel grey. Then he rode out upon the foothills. The trail led up and down slopes of sage. Grass grew thicker as he descended. Once he startled a great flock of prairie chickens, or sage hens, large grey birds, lumbering, swift flyers, that whirred up and soon plumped down again into the sage. Twilight found him on a last long slope of the foothills, facing the pasture land of the valley, with the ranch still five miles distant, now showing misty and dim in the gathering shadows. Wade made camp where a brook ran near an aspen thicket. He had no desire to hurry to meet events at White Slide's ranch, although he longed to see this girl that belonged to Bellounds. Night settled down over the quiet foothills. A pack of roving coyotes visited Wade and sat in a half circle in the shadows back of the camp fire. They howled and barked. Nevertheless, sleep visited Wade's tired eyelids 
the moment he lay down and closed them. Next morning, rather late, Wade rode down to White Slide's ranch. It looked to him like the property of a rich rancher who held to the old and proven customs of his generation. The corrals were new, but their style was old. Wade reflected that it would be hard for rustlers or horse thieves to steal out of those corrals. A long lane led from the pasture land, following the brook that ran through the corrals and by the back door of the rambling, comfortable-looking cabin. A cowboy was leading horses across a wide square between the main ranch house and a cluster of cabins and sheds. He saw the visitor and waited. Morning, said Wade, as he rode up. How do, replied the cowboy. Then these two eyed each other, not curiously nor suspiciously, but with that steady, measuring gaze common to Western men. My name's Wade, said the traveller. Come from Meeker Way. I'm looking for a job with Bellounds. I'm Lem Billings, replied the other. Riding for White Slides for years. Reckon the boss'll be glad to take you on. Is he around? Sure, I just seen him, replied Billings, as he halted his horses to a post. I reckon I ought to give you a hunch. I'd take that as a favour. Well, we're short of hands, said the cowboy. Just got the round-up over. Hudson was hurt, and Wills Moore got crippled. Then the boss's son has been put on as foreman. Three of the boys quit, couldn't stand him. This here son of Bellounds is a son of a gun. Me and pards of mine, Montana and Bloodsoe, are sticking on, well, for reasons that ain't exactly love for the boss. But old Bill's the best of bosses. Now the hunch is that if you get on here, you'll have to do two or three men's work. Much obliged, replied Wade. I don't shy at that. Well, get down and come in, added Billings heartily. He led the way across the square, around the corner of the ranch house, and up on a long porch, where the arrangement of chairs and blankets attested to the hand of a woman. The first door was open, and from it issued voices. First a shrill, petulant boy's complaint, and then a man's deep, slow, patient reply. Lem Billings knocked on the door jamb. "'Well, what's wanted?' called Bellounds. "'Boss, there's a man wanting to see you,' replied Lem. Heavy steps approached the doorway, and it was filled with the large figure of the rancher. Wade remembered Bellounds, and saw only a grey difference in years. "'Good morning, Lem, and good morning to you, stranger,' was the rancher's greeting. His bold blue glance, honest and frank and keen, with all his long experience of men, taking Wade in with one flash. Lem discreetly walked to the end of the porch, as another figure, that of the son, who resembled the father, filled the doorway, with eyes less kind, bent upon the visitor. "'My name's Wade. I'm over from Meeker Way, hoping to find a job with you,' said Wade. "'Glad to meet you,' replied Bellounds, extending his huge hand to shake Wade's. I need you sure bad. What's your special brand of work? I reckon any kind. Sit down, stranger, replied Bellounds, pulling up a chair. He seated himself on a bench and leaned against the log wall. Now, when a boy comes and says he can do anything, why, I just haw-haw at him. But you're a man, Wade, and one as has been there. Now I'm hard put for hands. Just speak out now for yourself. No one else can speak for you, that's sure. And this is business. Any work with stock, from punching steers to doctoring horses, replied Wade quietly. Am fair carpenter and mason, good packer. No farming, can milk cows and make butter. I've been cook in many outfits. Read and write and not bad at figures. Can do work on saddles and harness and... Hold on, yelled Bellounds with a hearty laugh. I ain't imposing on no man, no matter how I need help. You're sure a jack of all range trades, and I wish you was a hunter. I was coming to that. You didn't give me time. Say, do you know hounds? queried Bellounds eagerly. Yes, was raised where everybody had packs. I'm from Kentucky, 
and I've run hounds off and on for years. I'll tell you, Belllounds interrupted Wade. By all that's lucky. And last, can you handle guns? We ain't had a good shot on this range for Lord knows how long. I used to hit plumb centre with a rifle. My eyes are poor now, and my son can't hit a flock of haystacks, and the cow punchers are most as bad. Sometimes right here where you could hit elk with a club we're out of fresh meat. Yes, I can handle guns, replied Wade, with a quiet smile and a lowering of his head. Reckon you didn't catch my name. Well, no, I didn't, slowly replied Bellounds, and his pause, with the keener look he bestowed upon Wade, told how the latter's query had struck home. Wade, bent Wade said wade with quiet distinctness not hell-bent wade ejaculated bellounds the same i ain't proud of the handle but i never sail under false colours well i'll be damned went on the rancher wade i've heard of you for years some bad but most good and i reckon i'm just as glad to meet you as if you'd been somebody else you'll give me the job i should smile i'm thanking you Reckon I was some worried. Jobs are hard for me to get and harder to keep. That's not unnatural, considering the hell which is said to camp on your trail, replied Bellounds dryly. Wade, I can't say I take a hell of a lot of stock in such talk. Fifty years I've been west of the Missouri. I know the west and I know men. Talk flies from camp to ranch, from diggings to town, and always someone adds a little more. Now I trust my judgment, and I trust men. No one ever betrayed me yet. I'm that way too, replied Wade. But it doesn't pay, and yet I still kept on being that way. Bellounds, my name's as bad as good all over western Colorado. But as man to man, I tell you, I never did a low-down trick in my life. Never but once. And what was that? queried the rancher gruffly. I killed a man who was innocent, replied Wade with quivering lips, and, and drove the woman I loved to her death. Ah, oh, we all make mistakes sometime in our lives, said Bellounds hurriedly. I made most as big a one as yours, so help me God. I'll tell you, interrupted Wade. You needn't tell me anything, said Bellounds, interrupting in his turn. But at that some time I'd like to hear about the Lascelles outfit over on the Gunnison. I knowed Lascelles, and a partner of mine down in Middle Park came back from the Gunnison with the doggondest story I ever heard. That was five years ago this summer. Of course, I knowed your name long before, but this time I heard it powerful strong. You got in that mix-up to your neck. Well, what concerns me now is this. Is there any sense in the talk that wherever you land, there's hell to pay? Bellounds, there's no sense in it, but a lot of truth, confessed Wade gloomily. Uh-huh. Well, hell-bent Wade, I'll take a chance on you, boomed the rancher's deep voice, rich with the intent of his big heart. I've gambled all my life, and the best friends I ever made were men I'd helped. What wages do you ask? I'll take what you offer. I'm paying the boys forty a month, but that's not enough for you. Yes, that'll do. Good, it's settled, concluded Bellounds, rising. Then he saw his son standing inside the door. Say, Jack, shake hands with Bent Wade, hunter and all-around man. Wade, this is my boy. I've just put him on as foreman of the outfit, and while I'm at it, I'll say that you'll take orders from me and not from him. Wade looked up into the face of Jack Bellounds, returned his brief greeting, and shook his limp hand. The contact sent a strange chill over Wade. Young Bellounds' face was marred by a bruise and shaded by a sullen light. Get Billings to take you out to that new cabin and sheds I just had put up, said the rancher. You'll bunk in the cabin... Oh, I know, men like you sleep in the open. But you can't do that under old white slides in winter. Not much. Make yourself to home, and I'll walk out after a bit, and we'll look over the dog outfit. 
When you see that outfit, you'll holler for help. Wade bowed his thanks, and putting on his sombrero, he turned away. As he did so, he caught a sound of light, quick footsteps on the far end of the porch. Hello, you all, cried a girl's voice, with melody in it that vibrated piercingly upon Wade's sensitive ears. Morning, Columbine, replied the rancher. Bent Wade's heart leaped up. This girlish voice rang upon the cord of memory. Wade had not the strength to look at her then. It was not that he could not bear to look, but that he could not bear the disillusion sure to follow his first glimpse of this adopted daughter of Bellounds. Sweet to delude himself. Ah, the years were bearing sterner upon his head. The old dreams persisted, sadder now for the fact that from long use they had become half realities. Wade shuffled slowly across the green square to where the cowboy waited for him. His eyes were dim and a sickness attended the sinking of his heart. Wade, I ain't a bettin' feller, but I'll bet old Bill took you up, vouchsafed Billings with interest. Glad to say he did, replied Wade. You're to show me the new cabin where I'm to bunk. Come along, said Lem, leading off. Are you a-going to handle stock or chase coyotes? My job's hunting. Well, it may be that from sun up to sun down, but between times you'll be sure busy otherwise, I opine, went on Lem. Did you meet the boss's son? Yes, he was there, and Bellounds made it plain I was to take orders from him and not from his son. That'll make your job a million times easier, declared Lem as if to make up for former hasty pessimism. He led the way past some log cabins and sheds with dirt roofs and low, flat-topped barns, out across another brook where willow trees were turning yellow. Then the new cabin came into view. It was small, with one door and one window, and a porch across the front. It stood on a small elevation near the swift brook and overlooking the ranch house, perhaps a quarter of a mile below. Above it, and across the brook, had been built a high fence, constructed of aspen poles laced closely together. The sounds therefrom proclaimed this stockade to be the dog pen. Lem helped Wade unpack and carry his outfit into the cabin. It contained one room, the corner of which was filled with blocks and slabs of pine, evidently left there after the construction of the cabin, and meant for firewood. The ample size of the stone fireplace attested to the severity of the winters. "'Real sword boards on the floor!' exclaimed Lem, meaning to impress the newcomer. "'I call this a plumb good bunk.' "'Much too good for me,' replied Wade. "'Well, I'll look after your hosses,' said Lem. "'I reckon you'll fix up your bunk. Take my hunch and ask Miss Collie to find you some furniture and such like. She's old Bill's daughter.' and she makes up for, for, well, for a lot we have to stand. I'll fetch the boys over later. Do you smoke? asked Wade. I've something fine I fetched up from Leadville. Smoke? Me? I'll give you a hoss right now for a cigar. I get one once a year, maybe. Here's a box I've been packing for long, replied Wade, as he handed it up to Billings. They're Spanish, all right. Too rich for my blood. A box of gold could not have made that cowboy's eyes shine any brighter. Whoopee! he yelled. Why, man, you're like the fairy in the kid's story. Won't I make the outfit wild? Oh, I forgot. There's only Jim and Blood left. Well, I'll divvy with them. Sure, Wade, you hit me right. I was dying for a real smoke. And I reckon what's mine is yours. Then he strode out of the cabin whistling a merry cowboy tune. Wade was left sitting in the middle of the room on his roll of bedding, and for a long time he remained there motionless, with his head bent, his worn hands idly clasped. A heavy footfall outside aroused him from his meditation. "'Hey, Wade!' called the cheery voice of Bellounds. Then the rancher appeared at the door. "'How's this bunk suit you?' Much too fine for an old-timer like me, replied Wade. Old-timer? Say, you're young yet. Look at me. 
Sixty-eight last birthday. Well, every dog has his day. What are you needing to fix this bunk comfortable like? Reckon I don't need much. Well, you've bedding and cook outfit. Go get a table and a chair and a bench from that first cabin. The boys that had it are gone. Something with a back to it. A rocking chair, if there's one. You'll find tools and boxes and stuff in the workshop if you want to make a cupboard or anything. How about a looking glass? asked Wade. I had a piece, but I broke it. Ha! <laughs> ha! Maybe we can rustle that, too. My girl's good on helping the boys fix up. Woman-like, you know. And she'll fetch you some decorations on her own hook. Now, let's take a look at the hounds. Bellans led the way out toward the crude dog corral, and the way he leaped the brook bore witness to the fact that he was still vigorous and spry. The door of the pen was made of boards hung on wire. As Bellounds opened it, there came a pattering rush of many padded feet and a chorus of barks and whines. Wade's surprised gaze took in forty or fifty dogs, mostly hounds, browns and blacks and yellows, all sizes, a motley, mangy, hungry pack if he had ever seen one. I swore I'd buy every hound fetched to me till I'd cleaned up the varmints around white slides. And sure I was imposed on, explained the rancher. Some good-looking hounds in the bunch, replied Wade, and there's hardly too many. I'll train two packs so I can rest one when the other's hunting. Well, I'll be doggoned, ejaculated Bellounds with relief. I sure thought you'd roar. All this rabble to take care of. "'No trouble after I've got acquainted,' said Wade. "'Have they been hunted any?' "'Some of the boys took out a bunch, "'but they split on deer tracks and elk tracks "'and Lord knows what all, never put up a lion. "'Then again Billings took some out after a pack of coyotes, "'and gold on me if the coyotes didn't lick the hounds. "'And worse, Jack, my son, got it into his head that he was a hunter.' The other morning he found a fresh lion track back of the corral, and he ups and puts the whole pack of hounds on the trail. I had a good many more hounds in the pack than you see now. Well, anyway, it was great to hear the noise that pack made. Jack lost every blamed hound of them. That night and next day and the following they straggled in, but twenty-some never did come back. Wade laughed. They may come yet. I reckon, though, they've gone home where they came from. Are any of these hounds recommended? Every concerned one of them, declared Bellounds. That's funny, but I guess it's natural. Do you know for sure whether you bought any good dogs? Yes, I gave fifty dollars for two hounds. Got them off a friend in Middle Park, whose pack killed off the lions there. They're good dogs, trained on lion, wolf and bear. Pick em out, said Wade. With a throng of canines crowding and fawning round him and snapping at one another, it was difficult for the rancher to draw the two particular ones apart so they could be looked over. At length he succeeded, and Wade drove back the rest of the pack. The big fellow's Samson, and the other's Jim, said Bellounds. Samson was a huge hound, grey and yellow, with mottled black marks, very long ears, and big, solemn eyes. Jim, a good-sized dog, but small in comparison with the other, was black all over, except around the nose and eyes. Jim had many scars. He was old, yet not past a vigorous age, and he seemed a quiet, dignified, wise hound, quite out of his element in that mongrel pack. "'If they're as good as they look, we're lucky,' said Wade." as he tied the ends of his rope round their necks. Now, are there any more you know are good? Denver, come here, yelled Bellounds. A white, yellow-spotted hound came wagging his tail. I'll swear by Denver, and there's one more, Kane. He's half bloodhound, a queer, wicked kind of dog. He keeps to himself. Kane, come here. Bellounds tramped around the corral and finally found the hound in question, asleep in a dusty hole. Cain was the only beautiful dog in the lot. If half of him was bloodhound, the other half was shepherd, 
for his black and brown hair was inclined to curl, and his head had the fine thoroughbred contour of the shepherd. His ears, long and drooping and thin, betrayed the hound in him. Cain showed no disposition to be friendly. His dark eyes, sad and mournful, burned with the fires of doubt. Wade halted Cain, Jim, and Samson, which act almost precipitated a fight, and led them out of the corral. Denver, friendly and glad, followed at the rancher's heels. "'I'll keep them with me and make lead dogs out of them,' said Wade. "'Bellans, that bunch hasn't had enough to eat. They're half starved.' "'Well, that's worried me more than you'll guess,' declared Bellans with irritation. "'What do a lot of cow-punching fellers know about dogs? "'Why, they nearly ate blood so up. "'He wouldn't feed them. "'And Wills, who seemed good with dogs, "'was taken off bad hurt the other day. "'Lem's been trying to rustle feed for them. "'Now we'll give back the dogs you don't want to keep, "'and that way thin out the pack. "'Yes, we won't need them all, "'and I reckon I'll take the worry of this dog pack off your mind. "'That's your job, Wade.' My orders are for you to kill off the varmints, lions, wolves, coyotes, and every fall some old silver tip gets bad, and now and then other bears. Whatever you need in the way of supplies, just ask for. We send regular to Kremlin. You can hunt for two months yet, barring an unusual early winter. I'm asking you... If my son tramps on your toes, I'd take it as a favour for you to be patient. He's only a boy yet, and coltish. Wade divined that was a favour difficult for Bellans to ask. The old rancher, dominant and forceful and self-sufficient all his days, had begun to feel an encroachment of opposition beyond his control. If he but realised it, the favour he asked of Wade was an appeal. "'Bellounds, I get along with everybody,' Wade assured him. "'And maybe I can help your son. "'Before I'd reached here, I'd heard he was wild, and so I'm prepared. "'If you'd do that, well, I'd never forget it,' replied the rancher slowly. "'Jack's been away for three years, only got back a week or so ago. "'I calculated he'd be sobered, steadied by that, that work I put him to.' "'But I'm not sure. He's changed. "'When he gets his own way, he's all I could ask. "'But that way he wants ain't always what it ought to be. "'And so there's been clashes. "'But Jack's a fine young man, "'and he'll outgrow his temper and crazy notions. "'Work'll do it.' "'Boys will be boys,' replied Wade philosophically. "'I've not forgotten when I was a boy.' "'Neither have I. "'Well, I'll be going, Wade.' I reckon Columbine will be up to call on you. Being the only woman folk in my house, she sort of runs it, and she's sure interested in that pack of hounds. Bellounds trudged away, his fine old head erect, his grey hair shining in the sun. Wade sat down upon the step of his cabin, pondering over the rancher's remarks about his son, recalling the young man's physiognomy. Wade began to feel that it was familiar to him. He had seen Jack Bellounds before. Wade never made mistakes in faces, though he often had a task to recall names, and he began to go over the recent past, recalling all that he could remember of Meeker and Cripple Creek, where he had worked for several months, and so on, until he had gone back as far as his last trip to Denver. Must have been there, mused Wade thoughtfully, and he tried to recall all the faces he had seen. This was impossible, of course, yet he remembered many. Then he visualised the places in Denver that for one reason or another had struck him particularly. Suddenly into one of these flashed the pale, sullen, bold face of Jack Bellounds. It was there, he exclaimed incredulously. Well, if that's not the strangest yet, could I be mistaken? No, I saw him. Bellans must have known it. Must have let him stay there. Maybe put him there. He's just the kind of a man to go to extremes to reform his son. Singular as was this circumstance, 
Wade dwelt only momentarily on it. He dismissed it with the conviction that it was another strange happening in the string of events that had turned his steps toward White Slide's ranch. Wade's mind stirred to the probability of an early sight of Columbine Bellounds. He would welcome it, both as interesting and pleasurable, and surely as a relief. The sooner a meeting with her was over, the better. His life had been one long succession of shocks, so that it seemed nothing the future held could thrill him, amaze him, torment him. And yet how well he knew that his heart was only the more responsive for all it had withstood. Perhaps here at White Slides he might meet with an experience dwarfing all others. It was possible. It was in the nature of events. And though he repudiated such a possibility, he fortified himself against a subtle divination that he might at last have reached the end of his long trail where anything might happen. Three of the hounds lay down at Wade's feet. Cain, the bloodhound, stood watching this new master after the manner of a dog who was a judge of men. He sniffed at Wade. He grew a little less surly. Wade's gaze, however, was on the path that led down along the border of the brook to disappear in the willows. Above this clump of yellowing trees could be seen the ranch house, a girl with fair hair stepped off the porch. She appeared to be carrying something in her arms and shortly disappeared behind the willows. Wade saw her and surmised that she was coming to his cabin. He did not expect any more or think any more. His faculties condensed to the objective one of sight. The girl, when she reappeared, was perhaps a hundred yards distant. Wade bent on her one keen, clear glance. Then his brain and his blood beat wildly. He saw a slender girl in riding costume, lithe and strong, with the free step of one used to the open. It was this form, this step, that struck Wade. My God, how like Lucy, he whispered, and he tried to pierce the distance to see her face. It gleamed in the sunshine. Her fair hair waved in the wind. She was coming, but so slowly. All of Wade that was physical and emotional seemed to wait, clamped. The moment was age long, with nothing beyond it. While she was still at a distance, her face became distinct. And Wade sustained a terrible shock. Then, as one in a dream as in a blur of strained peering into a maze, he saw the face of his sweetheart, his wife, the Lucy of his early manhood. It moved him out of the past. Closer, pang on pang quivered in his heart. Was this only a nightmare, or had he at last gone mad? This girl raised her head. She was looking. She saw him terror mounted upon wade's consciousness that's lucy's face he gasped so help me god it's for this i wandered here she's my flesh and blood my lucy's child my own fear and presentiment and blank amaze and stricken consciousness left him in the lightning flash of divination that was recognition as well a shuddering cataclysm enveloped him, a passion so stupendous that it almost brought oblivion. The three hounds leaped up with barks and wagging tails. They welcomed this visitor. Cain lost still more of his canine aloofness. Wade's breast heaved. The blue sky, the grey hills, the green willows all blurred in his sight that seemed to hold clear only the face floating closer. I'm Columbine Bellounds, said a voice. It stilled the storm in Wade. It was real. It was a voice of twenty years ago. The burden on his breast lifted. Then flashed the spirit, the old self-control 
of a man whose life had held many terrible moments. "'Morning, miss. I'm glad to meet you,' he replied, and there was no break, no tone unnatural in his greeting. So they gazed at each other, she with that instinctive look peculiar to women in its intuitive powers, but common to all persons who had lived far from crowds, and to whom a newcomer was an event. Wade's gaze, intense and all-embracing, found that face now closer in resemblance to the imagined Lucy's, a pretty face rather than beautiful, but strong and sweet, its striking qualities being a colourless fairness of skin that yet held a rose and golden tint, and the eyes of a rare and exquisite shade of blue. "'Oh, are you feeling ill?' she asked. "'You look so... so pale.' "'No, I'm only tuckered out,' replied Wade easily, as he wiped the clammy drops from his brow. "'It was a long ride to get here.' "'I'm the lady of the house,' she said with a smile. "'I'm glad to welcome you to White Slides, and hope you'll like it.' "'Well, Miss Columbine, I reckon I will,' he replied, returning the smile. "'Now, if I was younger, I'd like it powerful much.' She laughed at that. Men are all alike, young or old. Don't ever think so, said Wade earnestly. No? I guess you're right about that. I've fetched you up some things for your cabin. May I peep in? Come in, replied Wade, rising. You must excuse my manners. It's long indeed since I had a lady caller. She went in, and Wade, standing on the threshold, saw her survey the room with a woman's sweeping glance. "'I told Dad to put some... Miss, your Dad told me to go get them, and I've not done it yet, but I will presently.' "'Very well. I'll leave these things and come back later,' she replied, depositing a bundle upon the floor. "'You won't mind if I try to... to make you a little comfortable.' It's dreadful the way outdoor men live when they do get indoors. I reckon I'll be slow in letting you see what a good housekeeper I am, he replied, because then maybe I'll see more of you. Weren't you a sad flatterer in your day? she queried archly. Her intonation, the tilt of her head, gave Wade such a pang that he could not answer, and to hide his momentary restraint he turned back to the hounds. Then she came out upon the porch. "'I love hounds,' she said, patting Denver, which caress immediately made Jim and Samson jealous. "'I've gotten on pretty well with these, but that cane won't make up. Isn't he splendid? But he's afraid. No, not afraid of me, but he doesn't like me. "'It's mistrust. He's been hurt. I reckon he'll get over that after a while. "'You don't beat dogs?' she asked eagerly. No, miss, that's not the way to get on with hounds or horses. Her glance was a blue flash of pleasure. How glad that makes me. Why, I quit coming here to see and feed the dogs, because somebody was always kicking them around. Wade handed the rope to her. You hold them, so when I come out with some meat they won't pile over me. He went inside took all that was left of the deer haunch out of his pack, and picking up his knife, returned to the porch. The hounds saw the meat and yelped. They pulled on the rope. "'You hounds behave,' ordered Wade, as he sat down on the step and began to cut the meat. "'Jim, you're the oldest and hungriest. Here. Now, you, Samson, here.' The big hound snapped at the meat, whereupon Wade slapped him. Are you a pup or a wolf that you grab for it? Here. Samson was slower to act, but he snapped again. Whereupon Wade hit him again, with open hand, not with violence or rancour, but a blow that meant Samson must obey. Next time the hound did not snap. Denver had to be cuffed several times before he showed deference to this new master, but the bloodhound Cain refused to take any meat out of Wade's hand. He growled and showed his teeth and sniffed hungrily. Cain will have to be handled carefully, observed Wade. He'd bite pretty quick. 
but he's so splendid said the girl i don't like to think he's mean you'll be good to him try to win him i'll do my best with him dad's full of glee that he has a real hunter at white slides at last now i'm glad and sorry too i hate to think of little calves being torn and killed by lions and wolves and it's dreadful to know bears eat grown-up cattle but i love the mourn of a wolf and the yelp of a coyote i can't help hoping you don't kill them all quite it's not likely miss he replied i'll be pretty sure to clean out the lions and drive off the bears but the wolf family can't be exterminated no animal so cunning as a wolf i'll tell you some years ago i went to cook on a ranch north of denver on the edge of the plains and right off i began to hear stories about a big lobo a wolf that was an old residenter he'd been known for long and he got meaner and wiser as he was hunted his speciality got to be yearlings and the ranchers all over rose up in arms against him they hired all the old hunters and trappers in the country to kill him no good old lobo went right on pulling down yearlings every night he'd get one or more and he was so cute and so swift that he'd work on different ranches on different nights finally he killed eleven yearlings for my boss on one night eleven think of that and then i said to my boss i reckon you'd better let me go kill that gray butcher and my boss laughed at me but he let me go he'd have tried anything i took a hunk of meat a blanket my gun and a pair of snowshoes and i set out on old lobo's tracks and miss columbine i walked old lobo to death in the snow why how wonderful exclaimed the girl breathless and glowing with interest oh it seems a pity such a splendid brute should be killed wild animals are cruel i wish it were different life is cruel miss and i echo your wish replied wade sadly you have had great experiences dad said to me collie here at last is a man who can tell you enough stories but i don't believe you ever could you like stories asked wade curiously love them all kinds but i like adventure best i should have been a boy isn't it strange i can't hurt anything myself or bear to see even a steer slaughtered but you can't tell two bloody and terrible stories for me except i hate indian stories the very thought of indians makes me shudder some day i'll tell you a story wade could not find his tongue readily i must go now she continued and moved off the porch then she hesitated and turned with a smile that was wistful and impulsive i i believe we'll be good friends miss columbine we sure will if i can live up to my part replied wade her smile deepened even while her gaze grew unconsciously penetrating wade felt how subtly they were drawn to each other but she had no inkling of that it takes two to make a bargain she replied seriously i've my part good-bye wade watched her lithe stride and as she drew away the restraint he had put upon himself loosened when she disappeared his feeling burst all bounds dragging the dogs inside he closed the door then like one broken and spent he fell face against the wall with the hoarsely whispered words i'm thanking god End of chapter 5「6 of The Mysterious Rider」by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September's glory of gold and red and purple began to fade with the autumnal equinox. It rained enough to soak the frost-bitten leaves, and then the mountain winds sent them flying and fluttering and scurrying to carpet the dells and spot the pools in the brooks and colour the trails. When the weather cleared and the sun rose bright again, 
Many of the aspen thickets were leafless and bare, and the willows showed stark against the grey sage hills, and the vines had lost their fire. Hills and valleys had sobered with subtle change that left them none the less beautiful. A mile or more down the road from White Slides, in a protected nook, nestled two cabins belonging to a cattleman named Andrews, who had formerly worked for Bellounds, and had recently gone into the stock business for himself. He had a rather young wife and several children, and a brother who rode for him. These people were the only neighbours of Bellounds for some ten miles on the road toward Kremling. Columbine liked Mrs. Andrews, and often rode or walked down there for a little visit, and a chat with her friend, and a romp with the children. Toward the end of September, Columbine found herself combating a strong desire to go down to the Andrews ranch and try to learn some news about Wilson Moore. If anything had been heard at White Slides, it certainly had not been told her. Jack Bellounds had ridden to Kremling and back in one day, but Columbine would have endured much before asking him for information. She did, however, inquire of the freighter who hauled Bellounds' supplies, and the answer she got was awkwardly evasive. That nettled Columbine. Also, it raised a suspicion which she strove to subdue. Finally, it seemed apparent that Wilson Moore's name was not to be mentioned to her. First, in her growing resentment, she had an impulse to go to her new friend, the hunter Wade, and confide in him not only her longing to learn about Wilson, but also other matters that were growing daily more burdensome. How strange for her to feel that in some way Jack Bellounds had come between her and the old man she loved and called father. Columbine had not divined that until lately. She felt it now in the fact that she no longer sought the rancher as she used to, and he had apparently avoided her. But then, Columbine reflected, she might be entirely wrong, for when Bellounds did meet her at mealtimes or anywhere, he seemed just as affectionate as of old. Still, he was not the same man. A chill, an atmosphere of shadow, had pervaded the once wholesome ranch. And so, feeling not yet well enough acquainted with Wade to confide so intimately in him, she stifled her impulses and resolved to make some effort herself to find out what she wanted to know. As luck would have it, when she started out to walk down to the Andrews ranch, she encountered Jack Bellounds. "'Where are you going?' he inquired inquisitively. "'I'm going to see Mrs. Andrews,' she replied. "'No, you're not,' he declared quickly with a flash. Columbine felt a queer sensation deep within her, a hot little gathering that seemed foreign to her physical being and ready to burst out. Of late it had stirred in her at words or acts of Jack Bellounds. She gazed steadily at him, and he returned her look with interest. What he was thinking she had no idea of, but for herself it was a recurrence and an emphasis of the fact that she seemed growing farther away from this young man she had to marry. The weeks since his arrival had been the most worrisome she could remember. "'I am going,' she replied slowly. "'No,' he replied violently. "'I won't have you running off down there to, to gossip with that Andrews woman.' "'Oh, you won't?' inquired Columbine, very quietly. How little he understood her. That's what I said. You're not my boss yet, Mr. Jack Bellounds, she flashed, her spirit rising. He could irritate her as no one else. I soon will be. And what's a matter of a week or a month, he went on, calming down a little. I've promised, yes, she said, feeling her face blanch. And I keep my promises, but I didn't say when. If you talk like that to me, it might be a good many weeks, or, or months, before I name the day. Columbine, he cried as she turned away. There was genuine distress in his voice. 
Columbine felt again an assurance that had troubled her. No matter how she was reacting to this new relation, it seemed a fearful truth that Jack was really falling in love with her. This time she did not soften. "'I'll call Dad to make you stay home!' he burst out again, his temper rising. Columbine wheeled as on a pivot. "'If you do, you've got less sense than I thought.' Passion claimed him then. "'I know why you're going. "'It's to see that club-footed cowboy Moore. "'Don't let me catch you with him.' "'Columbine turned her back upon Bellounds and swung away, "'every pulse in her throbbing and smarting. "'She hurried on into the road. "'She wanted to run, not to get out of sight or hearing, "'but to fly from something she knew not what.' "'Oh, it's more than his temper!' she cried, hot tears in her eyes. "'He's mean, mean, mean! "'What's the use of me denying that any more, just because I love Dad? "'My life will be wretched. It is wretched!' Her anger did not last long, nor did her resentment. She reproached herself for the tart replies that had inflamed Jack. Never again would she forget herself. But he, he makes me furious, she cried, in sudden excuse for herself. What did he say? That club-footed cowboy Moore? Oh, that was vile. He's heard, then, that poor Wilson has a bad foot, perhaps permanently crippled, if it's true. But why should he yell that he knew I wanted to see Wilson? I did not. I do not. Oh, but I do. I do. And then Columbine was to learn straightway that she would forget herself again, that she had forgotten, and that a sadder, stranger truth was dawning upon her. She was discovering another Columbine within herself, a willful, passionate, different creature who would no longer be denied. Almost before Columbine realised that she had started upon the visit, she was within sight of the Andrews ranch. So swiftly had she walked. It behooved her to hide such excitement as had dominated her. And to that end she slowed her pace, trying to put her mind on other matters. The children saw her first and rushed upon her, so that when she reached the cabin door she could not well have been otherwise than rosy and smiling. Mrs. Andrews, ruddy and strong, looked the pioneer rancher's hard-working wife. Her face brightened at the advent of Columbine, and showed a little surprise and curiosity as well. "'Laws, but it's good to see you, Columbine,' was her greeting. "'You ain't been here for a long spell.' "'I've been coming, but just put it off,' replied Columbine. And so, after the manner of women neighbours, they began to talk of the fall round-up, and the near approach of winter with its loneliness, and the children, all of which naturally led to more personal and interesting topics. "'And is it so, Columbine, that you're to marry Jack Bellounds?' asked Mrs. Andrews presently. "'Yes, I guess it is,' replied Columbine, smiling. Hm. "'I'm no relative of yours.' or even a particular close friend. But I'd like to say... Please don't, interposed Columbine. All right, my girl. I guess it's better I don't say anything. It's a pity, though, unless you love this Buster Jack. And you never used to do that, I'll swan. No, I don't love Jack, yet, as I ought to love a husband. But I'll try, and if... if I... I never do. Still, it's my duty to marry him. Some woman ought to talk to Bill Bellounds, declared Mrs. Andrews, with a grimness that boded ill for the old rancher. Did you know we had a new man up at the ranch? asked Columbine, changing the subject. You mean the hunter, Hellbent Wade? Yes, but I hate that ridiculous name, said Columbine. It's queer, like lots of names men get in these parts and it'll stick. Wade's been here twice, once as he was passing with the hounds, and the other night. I like him, Columbine, 
He's true blue for all his strange name. My men folks took to him like ducks to water. I'm glad I took to him almost like that, rejoined Columbine. He has the saddest face I ever saw. Sad? Well, yes, that man has seen a good deal of what they tacked on to his name. I laughed when I seen him first. Little lame feller, crooked-legged and ragged, with that awful homely face. But I forgot how he looked next time he came. That's just it. He's not much to look at, but you forget his homeliness right off, replied Columbine warmly. You feel something behind all his... his looks. Well, you and me are women, and we feel different, replied Mrs. Andrews. Now, my men folks take much store on what Wade can do. He fixed up Tom's gun that's been out of whack for a year. He made our clock run again, and run better than ever. Then he saved our cow from that poison weed, and Tom gave her up to die. The boys up home were telling me Mr. Wade had saved some of our cattle. Dad was delighted. You know he's lost a good many head of stock from this poison weed. I saw so many dead steers on my last ride up the mountain. It's too bad our new man didn't get here sooner to save them. I asked him how he did it, and he said he was a doctor. A cow doctor, laughed Mrs. Andrews. Well, that's a new one on me. According to Tom, this here Wade, when he seen our sick cow, said she'd eat poison weed, larkspur, I think he called it, and then when she drank water, it formed a gas in her stomach and she swelled up terrible. Wade just stuck his knife in her side a little and let the gas out, and she got well. Ugh, what cruel doctoring! But if it saves the cattle, then it's good. It'll save them if they can be got to right off, replied Mrs. Andrews. Speaking of doctors, went on Columbine, striving to make her query casual, do you know whether or not Wilson Moore had his foot treated by a doctor at Kremling? He did not, answered Mrs. Andrews. Wasn't no doctor there. They'd had to send to Denver, and as Wills couldn't take that trip or wait so long, why, Mrs. Plummer fixed up his foot. She made a good job of it, too, as I can testify. Oh, I'm very thankful, murmured Columbine. He'll not be crippled or, or club-footed, then. I reckon not. You can see for yourself, for Wills is here. He was drove up night before last and is staying with my brother-in-law in the other cabin there. Mrs. Andrews launched all this swiftly with evident pleasure, but with more of woman's subtle motive. Her eyes were bent with shrewd kindness upon the younger woman. Here, exclaimed Columbine, with a start, and for an instant she was at the mercy of conflicting surprise and joy and alarm. Alternately she flushed and paled. Sure he's here, replied Mrs. Andrews, now looking out of the door. He ought to be in sight somewheres. He's walking with a crutch. Crutch, cried Columbine in dismay. Yes, crutch, and he made it himself. I don't see him nowheres. Maybe he went in when he see you coming for he's powerful sensitive about that crutch. Then, if he's so, so sensitive, perhaps I'd better go, said Columbine, struggling with embarrassment and discomfiture. What if she happened to meet him? Would he imagine her purpose in coming there? Her heart began to beat unwontedly. Suit yourself, lass, replied Mrs. Andrews kindly. I know you and Wills quarrelled, for he told me. And it's a pity... Well, if you must go, I hope you'll come again before the snow flies. Good-bye. Columbine bade her a hurried good-bye and ventured forth with misgivings. And almost around the corner of the second cabin, which she had to pass, and before she had time to recover her composure, she saw Wilson Moore hobbling along on a crutch, holding a bandaged foot off the ground. He had seen her. He was hurrying to avoid a meeting, or to get behind the corrals there before she observed him. Wilson! she called involuntarily. The instant the name left her lips, she regretted it. But too late. The cowboy halted, slowly turned. Then Columbine walked swiftly up to him, 
suddenly as brave as she had been fearful. Sight of him had changed her. "'Wilson Moore, you meant to avoid me,' she said with reproach. "'Howdy, Columbine,' he drawled, ignoring her words. "'Oh, I was so sorry you were hurt,' she burst out. "'And now I'm so glad you're... you're... "'Wilson, you're thin and pale. You've suffered.' "'It pulled me down a bit,' he replied. "'Columbine had never before seen his face anything except bronzed and lean and healthy. "'But now it bore testimony to pain and strain and patient endurance. "'He looked older. Something in the fine, dark, hazel eyes hurt her deeply. "'You never sent me word.' she went on reproachfully. No one would tell me anything. The boys said they didn't know. Dad was angry when I asked him. I'd never have asked Jack. And the freighter who drove up, he lied to me. So I came down here today purposely to ask news of you, but I never dreamed you were here. Now I'm glad I came. What a singular, darkly kind, yet strange glance he gave her. That was like you, Columbine, he said. I knew you'd feel badly about my accident. But how could I send word to you? You saved Pronto, she returned, with a strong tremor in her voice. I can't thank you enough. That was a funny thing. Pronto went out of his head. I hope he's all right. He's almost well. It took some time to pick all the splinters out of him, He'll be all right soon, none the worse for that, that cowboy trick of Mr. Jack Bellown's, Columbine finished bitterly. Moore turned his thoughtful gaze away from her. I hope old Bill is well, he remarked lamely. Have you told your folks of your accident? asked Columbine, ignoring his remark. No. Oh, Wilson, you ought to have sent for them, or have written at least. Me? to go crying for them when I got in trouble. I couldn't see it that way. Wilson, you'll be going home soon to Denver, won't you? She faltered. No, he replied shortly. But what will you do? Surely you can't work, not so soon. Columbine, I'll never be able to ride again like I used to, he said tragically. I'll ride, yes, but never the old way. Oh, Columbine's tone and the exquisite softness and tenderness with which she placed a hand on the rude crutch would have been enlightening to anyone but these two absorbed in themselves. I can't bear to believe that. I am afraid it's true. Bad smash, Columbine. I just missed being club-footed. You should have care. You should have... Wilson, do you intend to stay here with the Andrews? Not much. They have troubles of their own. Columbine, I'm going to homestead a hundred and sixty acres. Homestead? she exclaimed in amaze. Where? Up there under old white slides. I've long intended to. You know that pretty little valley under the red bluff? There's a fine spring. You've been there with me. There by the old cabin built by prospectors. Yes, I know, it's a pretty place, fine valley, but Wills, you can't live there, she expostulated. Why not, I'd like to know. That little cubby hole, it's only a tiny one-room cabin, roof all gone, chinks open, chimney crumbling. Wilson, you don't mean to tell me you want to live there alone. Sure, what do you think, he replied with sarcasm. Expect me to marry some girl? Well, I wouldn't, even if anyone would have a cripple. Who, who will take care of you? She asked, blushing furiously. I'll take care of myself, he declared. Good Lord, Columbine, I'm not an invalid yet. I've got a few friends who'll help me fix up the cabin. And that reminds me, there's a lot of my stuff up in the bunkhouse at White Slides. I'm going to drive up soon to haul it away. Wilson Moore, do you mean it? she asked with grave wonder. Are you going to homestead near White Slides Ranch and live there when... She could not finish. An overwhelming disaster, for which she had no name, 
seemed to be impending. Yes, I am, he replied. Funny how things turn out, isn't it? It's very, very funny, she said dazedly, and she turned slowly away without another word. Goodbye, Columbine, he called out after her, with farewell, indeed, in his voice. All the way home, Columbine was occupied with feelings that swayed her to the exclusion of rational consideration of the increasing perplexity of her situation. And to make matters worse, when she arrived at the ranch, it was to meet Jack Bellounds with a face as black as a thundercloud. "'The old man wants to see you,' he announced, with an accent that recalled his threat of a few hours back. "'Does he?' queried Columbine loftily. "'From the courteous way you speak, I imagine it's important.' Bellounds did not deign to reply to this. He sat on the porch, where evidently he had awaited her return, and he looked anything but happy. "'Where is Dad?' continued Columbine. Jack motioned toward the second door, beyond which he sat, the one that opened into the room the rancher used as a kind of office and storeroom. As Columbine walked by Jack, he grasped her skirt. "'Columbine, you're angry,' he said appealingly. "'I reckon I am,' replied Columbine. "'Don't go into Dad when you're that way,' implored Jack. "'He's angry too, and... and it'll only make matters worse.' From long experience, Columbine could divine when Jack had done something in the interest of self and then had awakened to possible consequences. She pulled away from him without replying, and knocked on the office door. "'Come in,' called the rancher. Columbine went in. "'Hello, Dad. Do you want me?' Bellounds sat at an old table, bending over a soiled ledger with a stubby pencil in his huge hand. When he looked up, Columbine gave a little start. "'Where have you been?' he asked gruffly. "'I've been calling on Mrs. Andrews.' replied Columbine. Did you go there to see her? Why, certainly, answered Columbine, with a slow break in her speech. You didn't go to meet Wilson Moore? No, and I reckon you'll say you hadn't heard he was there. I had not, flashed Columbine. Well, did you see him? Yes, sir, I did, but quite by accident. Uh huh. Columbine, are you lying to me? The hot blood flooded to Columbine's cheeks, as if she had been struck a blow. Dad! she cried, in hurt amaze. Bellounds seemed thick, imponderable, as if something had forced a crisis in him, and his brain was deeply involved. The habitual, cool, easy, bold, and frank attitude in the meeting of all situations seemed to have been encroached upon by a break a bewilderment, a lessening of confidence. "'Well, are you lying?' he repeated, either blind to or unaware of her distress. "'I could not lie to you,' she faltered, "'even if I wanted to.' The heavy, shadowed gaze of his big eyes was bent upon her, as if she had become a new and perplexing problem. "'But you seen more.' "'Yes, sir,' Columbine's spirit rose. "'And talked with him? "'Of course. "'Lass, I ain't liking that, "'and I ain't liking the way you look and speak. "'I am sorry. "'I can't help either. "'What did this cowboy say to you? "'We talked mostly about his injured foot. "'And what else?' went on Bellounds, his voice rising. "'About what he meant to do now?' Uh huh, and that's homestead in the Sage Creek Valley. Yes, sir. Did you want him to do that? I, indeed, I didn't. Columbine, not so long ago you told me this fellow wasn't sweet on you, and do you still say that to me? Are you still insisting he ain't in love with you? He never said so. I never believed it, and now I'm sure he isn't. Uh huh. Well, that same day, you was just as sure you didn't care anything particular for him. Are you that sure now? 
No, whispered Columbine, very low. She trembled with a suggestion of unknown forces. Not to save a new and growing pride would she evade any question from this man upon whom she had no claim, to whom she owed her life and her bringing up. But something cold formed in her. Bellounds, self-centred and serious as he strangely was, seemed to check his probing, either from fear of hearing more from her, or from an awakening of former kindness. But her reply was a shock to him, and, throwing down his pencil, with the gesture of a man upon whom decision was forced, he rose to tower over her. "'You've been like a daughter to me. I've done all I knowed how for you. I've lived up to the best of my lights, and I've loved you,' he said, sonorously and pathetically. "'You know what my hopes are, for the boy and for you. We needn't waste any more talk. From this minute you're free to do as you like.' Whatever you do won't make any change in my caring for you. But you've got to decide. Will you marry Jack or not? I promised you I would. I'll keep my word, replied Columbine steadily. So far, so good, went on the rancher. I'm respecting you for what you say. And now, when will you marry him? The little room drifted around in Columbine's vague, blank sight. All seemed to be drifting. She had no solid anchor. Any day you say, the sooner the better, she whispered. Well, lass, I'm thanking you, he replied, with voice that sounded afar to her. And I swear, if I didn't believe it's best for Jack and you... Why, I'd never let you marry. So we'll set the day. October 1st. That's the day you was fetched to me a baby. More than 17 years ago. October 1st, then, Dad, she said brokenly. And she kissed him as if in token of what she knew she owed him. Then she went out, closing the door behind her. Jack, upon seeing her, hastily got up with more than concern in his pale face. Columbine, he cried hoarsely, how you look. Tell me what happened. Girl, don't tell me you've, you've... Jack Bellounds, interrupted Columbine, in tragic amaze at this truth about to issue from her lips. I've promised to marry you on October 1st. He let out a shout of boyish exultation, and suddenly clasped her in his arms. But there was nothing boyish in the way he handled her, in the almost savage evidence of possession. Collie, I'm mad about you, he began ardently. You never let me tell you, and I've grown worse and worse. Today, I... When I saw you going down there, where that Wilson Moore is, I got terribly jealous. I was sick. I'd been glad to kill him. It made me see how I loved you. Oh, I didn't know. But now, oh, I'm mad for you. He crushed her to him, unmindful of her struggles. His face and neck were red, his eyes on fire. And he began trying to kiss her mouth, but failed as she struggled desperately. His kisses fell upon cheek and ear and hair. Let me go, panted Columbine. You've no, no, oh, you might have waited. Breaking from him, she fled and got inside her room with the door almost closed when his foot intercepted it. Bellounds was half laughing his exultation, half furious at her escape and altogether beside himself. No, she replied so violently that it appeared to awake him to the fact that there was someone besides himself to consider. Oh, he heaved a deep sigh. All right, I won't try to get in. Only listen, Collie, don't mind my, my way of showing you how I felt. Fact is, I went plumb off my head. Is that any wonder, you, you darling, when I've been so scared you'd never have me? 
Collie, I felt that you were the one thing in the world I wanted most and would never get. But now, October 1st. Listen, I promise you, I'll not drink any more, nor gamble, nor nag Dad for money. I don't like his way of running the ranch, but I'll do it as long as he lives. I'll even try to tolerate that club-footed cowboy's brass in homesteading a ranch right under my nose. I'll... I'll do anything you ask of me. Then please go away, cried Columbine with a sob. When he was gone, Columbine barred the door and threw herself upon her bed to shut out the light and to give vent to her surcharged emotions. She wept like a girl whose youth was ending. And after the paroxysm had passed, leaving her weak and strangely changed, she tried to reason out what had happened to her. Over and over again she named the appeal of the rancher, the sense of her duty, the decision she had reached, and the disgust and terror inspired in her by Jack Bellown's reception of her promise. These were facts of the day, and they had made of her a palpitating, unhappy creature, who nevertheless had been brave to face the rancher and confess that which she had scarce confessed to herself. But now she trembled and cringed on the verge of a catastrophe that withheld its whole truth. I begin to see now, she whispered, after the thought had come and gone and returned to change again. If Wilson had cared for me, I, I might have cared too. But I do care something. I couldn't lie to Dad, only I'm not sure how much. I never dreamed of, of loving him or anyone. It's so strange. All at once I feel old, and I can't understand these, these feelings that shake me. So Columbine brooded over the trouble that had come to her, never regretting her promise to the old rancher, but growing keener in the realisation of a complexity in her nature that sooner or later would separate the life of her duty from the life of her desire. She seemed all alone, and when this feeling possessed her, a strange reminder of the hunter Wade flashed up. She stifled another impulse to confide in him. Wade had the softness of a woman, and his face was a record of the trials and travails through which he had come unhardened, unembittered. Yet how could she tell her troubles to him, a stranger, a rough man of the wilds, whose name had preceded him, notorious and deadly, with that vital tang of the West in its meaning? Nevertheless, Wade drew her, and she thought of him, until the recurring memory of Jack Bellown's rude clasp again crept over her with an augmenting disgust and fear. Must she submit to that? Had she promised that? And then Columbine felt the dawning of realities. End of chapter 6《ハロー》《ミリーリーダー》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》《ザイン・グレイ》She needed only to keep her mind off what might have been, and to attend to her duty. At breakfast she found the rancher in better spirits than he had been for weeks. He informed her that Jack had ridden off early for Kremling, there to make arrangements for the wedding on October 1st. Jack's out of his head, said Bellowns. Well, that comes only once in a man's life. I remember. Jack's going to drive you to Kremlin. And there take stage for Denver. 
I allow you'd better put in your best licks on fixing up and packing the clothes you'll need. Women folk naturally want to look smart on wedding trips. Dad, exclaimed Columbine in dismay, I never thought of clothes, and I don't want to leave white slides. But lass, you're going to be married, expostulated Bellounds. Didn't it occur to Jack to take me to Kremling? I can't make new dresses out of old ones. Well, I reckon neither of us thought of that. But you can buy what you like in Denver. Columbine resigned herself. After all, what did it matter to her? The vague, haunting dreams of girlhood would never come true. So she went to her wardrobe and laid out all her wearing apparel. Taking stock of it this way caused her further dismay, for she had nothing fit to wear in which either to be married or to take a trip to Denver. There appeared to be nothing to do but take the rancher's advice, and Columbine set about refurbishing her meagre wardrobe. She sewed all day. What with self-control and work and the passing of hours, Columbine began to make some approach to tranquillity. In her simplicity, she even began to hope that being good and steadfast and dutiful would earn her a little meed of happiness. Some haunting doubt of this flashed over her mind like a swift shadow of a black wing, but she dispelled that as she had dispelled the fear and disgust which often rose up in her mind. To Columbine's surprise, and to the rancher's concern, the prospective bridegroom did not return from Kremling on the second day. When night came, Bellounds reluctantly gave up looking for him. Jack's non-appearance suited Columbine, and she would have been glad to be let alone until October 1st, which date now seemed appallingly close. On the afternoon of Jack's third day of absence from the ranch, Columbine rode out for some needed exercise. Pronto not being available, she rode another Mustang, and one that kept her busy. On the way back to the ranch, she avoided the customary trail, which led by the cabins of Wade and the cowboys. Columbine had not seen one of her friends since the unfortunate visit to the Andrews ranch. She particularly shrank from meeting Wade, which feeling was in strange contrast to her former impulses. As she rode around the house, she encountered Wilson Moore seated in a light wagon. Her mustang reared, almost unseating her, but she handled him roughly, being suddenly surprised and angry at this unexpected meeting with the cowboy. "'Howdy, Columbine,' greeted Wilson, as she brought the mustang to his feet. "'You're sure learning to handle a horse since I left this here ranch. Wonder who's teaching you. I never could get you to rake even a bronc.' The cowboy had drawled out his admiring speech, half amused and half satiric. "'I'm mad!' declared Columbine. That's why. What are you mad at? queried Wilson. She did not reply, but kept on gazing steadily at him. Moore still looked pale and drawn, but he had improved since last she saw him. Aren't you going to speak to a fellow? he went on. How are you, Wills? she asked. Pretty good for a club-footed has-been cow-puncher. I wish you wouldn't call yourself such names, rejoined Columbine peevishly. You're not a club foot. I hate that word. Me too. Well, joking aside, I'm better. My foot is fine. Now, if I don't hurt it again, I'll sure never be a club foot. You must be careful, she said earnestly. Sure, but it's hard for me to be idle. Think of me lying still all day with nothing to do but read. That's what knocked me out. I wouldn't have minded the pain if I could have gotten about. Columbine, I've moved in. What? Moved in? She queried blankly. Sure, I'm in my cabin on the hill. It's plumb great. Tom Andrews and Bert and your hunter, Wade, fixed up the cabin for me. That Wade is sure a good fellow. And say what he can do with his hands. He's been kind to me, took an interest in me. And between you and me, he sort of cheered me up. Cheered you up? Wills, were you unhappy? She asked directly. 
Well, rather. What'd you expect of a cowboy who'd crippled himself and lost his girl? Columbine felt the smart of tingling blood in her face, and she looked from Wilson to the wagon. It contained saddles, blankets, and other cowboy accoutrements for which he had evidently come. That's a double misfortune, she replied evenly. It's too bad both came at once. It seems to me if I were a cowboy and... and felt so toward a girl, I'd have let her know. This girl I mean knew all right, he said, nodding his head. She didn't, she didn't, cried Columbine. How do you know? he queried with feigned surprise. He was bent upon torturing her. You meant me. I'm the girl you lost. Yes, you are, God help me, replied Moore with genuine emotion. But you, you never told me. You never told me, faltered Columbine in distress. Never told you what? That you were my girl? No, no, but that you, you cared. "'Columbine Bellounds, I told you, let you see in every way under the sun,' he flashed at her. "'Let me see what?' faltered Columbine, feeling as if the world were about to end. "'That I loved you.' "'Oh, Wilson,' whispered Columbine wildly. "'Yes, loved you. Could you have been so innocent, so blind you never knew?' I can't believe it. But I never dreamed you... you... She broke off dazedly, overwhelmed by a tragic, glorious truth. Collie, would it have made any difference? Oh, all the difference in the world, she wailed. What difference? he asked passionately. Columbine gazed wide-eyed and helpless at the young man, she did not know how to tell him what all the difference in the world really was. Suddenly Wilson turned away from her to listen. Then she heard rapid beating of hoofs on the road. That's Buster Jack, said the cowboy. Just my luck. There wasn't anyone here when I arrived. Reckon I oughtn't have stayed. Columbine, you look pretty much upset. What do I care how I look? she exclaimed with a sharp resentment attending this abrupt and painful break in her agitation. Next moment Jack Bellounds galloped a foam-lashed horse into the courtyard and hauled up short with a recklessness he was noted for. He swung down hard and violently cast the reins from him. Uh-huh, I gambled on just this, he declared harshly. Columbine's heart sank. His gaze was fixed on her face, with its tell-tale evidences of agitation. "'What have you been crying about?' he demanded. "'I haven't been,' she retorted. His bold and glaring eyes, hot with sudden temper, passed slowly from her to the cowboy. Columbine became aware then that Jack was under the influence of liquor. His heated red face grew darker with a sneering contempt. "'Where's Dad?' he asked, wheeling toward her. "'I don't know. He's not here,' replied Columbine, dismounting. The leap of thought and blood to Jack's face gave her a further sinking of the heart. The situation unnerved her. Wilson Moore had grown a shade paler. He gathered up his reins, ready to drive off. "'Bellounds, I came up after my things I'd left in the bunk,' he said coolly. Happened to meet Columbine and stopped to chat a minute. That's what you say, sneered Bellounds. You were making love to Columbine. I saw that in her face. You know it, and she knows it, and I know it. You're a liar. Bellounds, I reckon I am, replied Moore, turning white. I did tell Columbine what I thought she knew, what I ought to have told long ago. Uh-huh. Well, I don't want to hear it, but I'm going to search that wagon. What? ejaculated the cowboy, dropping his reins as if they stung him. "'You just hold on till I see what you've got in there,' went on Bellounds, and he reached over into the wagon and pulled at a saddle. "'Say, do you mean anything? This stuff's mine, every strap of it. Take your hands off.' Bellounds leaned on the wagon and looked up with insolent dark intent. "'More, I wouldn't trust you. 
I think you'd steal anything you got your hands on. Columbine uttered a passionate little cry of shame and protest. Jack, how dare you? You shut up. Go in the house, he ordered. You insult me, she replied in bitter humiliation. Will you go in, he shouted. No, I won't. All right, look on then. I'd just as lief have you. Then he turned to the cowboy. More, show up that wagon load of stuff, unless you want me to throw it out in the road. Bellounds, you know I can't do that, replied Moore coldly, and I'll give you a hunch. You'd better shut up yourself and let me drive on, if not for her sake, then for your own. Bellounds grasped the reins and with a sudden jerk pulled them out of the cowboy's hands. You damn clubfoot! Your gift of gab doesn't go with me, yelled Bellounds as he swung up on the hub of the wheel. But it was manifest that his desire to search the wagon was only a pretense, for while he pulled at this and that, his evil gaze was on the cowboy, keen to meet any move that might give excuse for violence. Moore evidently read this, for gazing at Columbine, he shook his head, as if to acquaint her with a situation impossible to help. "'Columbine, please hand me up the reins,' he said. "'I'm lame, you know. Then I'll be going.' Columbine stepped forward to comply, when Bellounds, leaping down from the wheel, pushed her back with masterful hand. Opposition to him was like waving a red flag in the face of a bull. Columbine recoiled from his look as well as touch. "'You keep out of this, or I'll teach you who's boss here,' he said stridently. "'You're going too far,' burst out Columbine. Meanwhile, Wilson had laboriously climbed down out of the wagon, and, utilising his crutch, he hobbled to where Bellounds had thrown the reins and stooped to pick them up. Bellounds shoved Columbine farther back, and then he leaped to confront the cowboy. "'I've got you now, Moore,' he said, hoarse and low. Stripped of all pretense, he showed the ungovernable nature of his temper. His face grew corded and black. The hand he thrust out shook like a leaf. "'You smooth-tongued liar! I'm on to your game. I know you'd put her against me. I know you'd try to win her less than a week before her wedding day. But it's not for that I'm going to beat hell out of you.' It's because I hate you. Ever since I can remember, my father held you up to me, and he sent me to... to... he sent me away because of you. By God, that's why I hate you. All that was primitive and violent and base came out with strange frankness in Bellown's tirade. Only when calm could his mind be capable of hidden calculation. The devil that was in him now seemed rampant. Bellounds, you're mighty brave to stack up this way against a one-legged man, declared the cowboy with biting sarcasm. If you had two club feet, I'd only be the gladder, yelled Bellounds, and swinging his arm, he slapped Moore so that it nearly toppled him over. Only the injured foot, coming down hard, saved him. When Columbine saw that, and then how Wilson winced and grew deathly pale, she uttered a low cry and she seemed suddenly rooted to the spot, weak, terrified at what was now inevitable, and growing sick and cold and faint. "'It's a damn lucky thing for you I'm not packing a gun,' said Moore grimly. "'But you knew, or you'd never hit me, you coward.' "'I'll make you swallow that,' snarled Bellounds, and this time he swung his fist, aiming a heavy blow at Moore. Then the cowboy whirled aloft the heavy crutch. If you hit at me again, I'll let out what little brains you've got. God knows that's little enough. Bellounds, I'm going to call you to your face before this girl your bat-eyed old man means to give you. You're not drunk. You're only ugly, mean. You've got a chance now to lick me because I'm crippled, and you're going to make the most of it. Why, you cur! I could come near licking you with only one leg. But if you touch me again, I'll brain you. You never were any good. You're no good now. You never will be anything but Buster Jack. Half dotty, selfish as hell, bull-headed and mean. And that's the last word I'll ever waste on you. I'll kill you, 
bawled Bellounds, black with fury. Moore wielded the crutch menacingly, but as he was not steady on his feet, he was at the disadvantage his adversary had calculated upon. Bellounds ran around the cowboy and suddenly plunged in to grapple with him. The crutch descended, but to little purpose. Bellounds' heavy onslaught threw Moore to the ground. Before he could rise, Bellounds pounced upon him. Columbine saw all this dazedly. As Wilson fell, she closed her eyes, fighting a faintness that almost overcame her. She heard wrestling, threshing sounds, and sodden thumps, and a scattering of gravel. These noises seemed at first distant, then grew closer. As she gazed again with keener perception, Moore's horse plunged away from the fiercely struggling forms that had rolled almost under his feet. During the ensuing moments it was an equal battle so far as Columbine could tell. Repelled yet fascinated, she watched. They beat each other, grappled and rolled over, first one on top, then the other. But the advantage of being uppermost presently was Bellounds. Moore was weakening. That became noticeable more and more after each time he had wrestled and rolled about. Then Bellounds, getting this position, lay with his weight upon Moore, holding him down, and at the same time kicking with all his might. He was aiming to disable the cowboy by kicking the injured foot, and he was succeeding. Moore let out a strangled cry and struggled desperately, but he was held and weighted down. Bellounds raised up now, and looking backward, he deliberately and furiously kicked Moore's bandaged foot. Once, twice, again and again, until the straining form under him grew limp. Columbine, slowly freezing with horror, saw all this. She could not move. She could not scream. She wanted to rush in and drag Jack off of Wilson, to hurt him, to kill him, but her muscles were paralysed. In her agony, she could not even look away. Bellounds got up astride his prostrate adversary and began to beat him brutally, swinging heavy, sodden blows. His face then was terrible to see. He meant murder. Columbine heard approaching voices and the thumping of hasty feet. That unclamped her cloven tongue. Wildly, she screamed. Old Bill Bellounds appeared striding off the porch and the hunter wade came running down the path dad he's killing wilson cried columbine here you devil roared the rancher jack bellands got up panting dishevelled with hair ruffled and face distorted he was not a pleasant sight for even the father moore lay unconscious with ghastly bloody features and his bandaged foot showed great splotches of red my god son gasped old bill you didn't pick on this here crippled boy the evidence was plain in moore's quiet pathetic form in the panting purple-faced son jack bellounds did not answer he was in the grip of a passion that had at last been wholly unleashed and was still unsatisfied yet a malignant and exultant gratification showed in his face that evens us up more, he panted and stalked away. By this time, Wade reached the cowboy and knelt beside him. Columbine came running to fall on her knees. The old rancher seemed stricken. Oh, oh, it was terrible, cried Columbine. Oh, he's so white and the blood. Now, lass, that's no way for a woman, said Wade, and there was something in his kind tone in his look, in his presence, that calmed Columbine. I'll look after more. You go get some water and a towel. Columbine rose to totter into the house. She saw a red stain on the hand she had laid upon the cowboy's face, and with a strange, hot, bursting sensation, strong and thrilling, she put that red place to her lips. Running out with the things required by Wade, she was in time to hear the rancher say, Looks hurt bad to me. Yes, I reckon, replied Wade. While Columbine held Moore's head upon her lap, the hunter bathed the bloody face. It was battered and bruised and cut, 
and in some places as fast as wade washed away the red it welled out again columbine watched that quiet face while her heart throbbed and swelled with emotions wholly beyond her control and understanding when at last wilson opened his eyes fluttering at first and then wide she felt a surge that shook her whole body he smiled wanly at her and at wade and then his gaze lifted to Bellounds. I guess he licked me, he said in weak voice. He kept kicking my sore foot till I fainted. But he licked me, all right. Wills, maybe he did lick you, replied the old rancher brokenly. But I reckon he's damn little to be proud of, licking a crippled man that way. Boss, Jack had been drinking, said Moore weakly. "'And he sure had some excuse for going off his head. "'He caught me talking sweet to Columbine, "'and then I called him all the names I could lay my tongue to. "'Ah, the old man seemed at a loss for words, "'and presently he turned away, sagging in the shoulders, "'and plodded into the house. "'The cowboy, supported by Wade on one side, "'with Columbine on the other, "'was helped to an upright position.' and with considerable difficulty was gotten into the wagon. He tried to sit up, but made a sorry showing of it. "'I'll drive him home and look after him,' said Wade. "'Now, Miss Collie, you're upset, which ain't no wonder. But now you brace. It might have been worse. Just you go to your room till you're sure of yourself again.' Moore smiled another wan smile at her. "'I'm sorry,' he said. "'What for? Me?' she asked. I mean, I'm sorry I was so infernal unlucky, running into you, and bringing all this distress to you. It was my fault, if I'd only kept my mouth shut. You need not be sorry you met me, she said, with her eyes straight upon his. I'm glad. But, oh, if your foot is badly hurt, I'll never, never... Don't say it, interrupted Wilson. "'Lass, you're bent on doing something,' said Wade in his gentle voice. "'Bent?' she echoed with something deep and rich in her voice. "'Yes, I'm bent, bent like your name, to speak my mind.' Then she ran toward the house and up on the porch to enter the living room with heaving breast and flashing eyes. Manifestly the rancher was berating his son. The former gaped at sight of her, and the latter shrank. "'Jack Bellounds!' she cried. "'You're not half a man. "'You're a coward and a brute!' One tense moment she stood there, lightning scorn and passion in her gaze, and then she rushed out impetuously as she had come. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Mysterious Rider by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Columbine did not leave her room any more that day. What she suffered there she did not want any one to know. What it cost her to conquer herself again she had only a faint conception of. She did conquer, however, and that night made up the sleep she had lost the night before. Strangely enough, she did not feel afraid to face the rancher and his son. Recent happenings had not only changed her, but had seemed to give her strength. When she presented herself at the breakfast table, Jack was absent. The old rancher greeted her with more than usual solicitude. "'Jack's sick,' he remarked presently. "'Indeed,' replied Columbine. Yes, he said it was the drinking he's not accustomed to. Well, I reckon it was what you called him. He didn't take much store on what I called him, which was... I tell you, lass, Jack set his heart so hard on you that it's terrible. Queer way he has of showing the... the affections of his heart, replied Columbine shortly. That was the drink, remonstrated the old man pathetic and earnest in his motive to smooth over the quarrel. But he promised me he would not drink any more. 
Bellans shook his grey old head sadly. Ah, uh -huh. Jack fires up and promises anything. He means it at the time, but the next hankering that comes over him wipes out the promise. I know, but he's had good excuse for this break. The boys in town began celebrating for October 1st. Great wonder Jack didn't come home clean drunk. Dad, you're as good as gold, said Columbine, softening. How could she feel hard toward him? Collie, then you're not a-going back on the old man? No. I was afeard you'd change your mind about marrying Jack. When I promised, I meant it. I didn't make it on conditions. But, lass, promises can be broke, he said, with the sonorous roll in his voice. I never yet broke one of mine. Well, I have. Not often, mebbe, but I have. And, lass, it's reasonable. There's times when a man just can't live up to what he swore by. And for a girl, why, I can see how easy she'd change and grow overnight. It's only fair for me to say that no matter what you think you owe me, you couldn't be blamed now for disliking Jack. Dad, if by marrying Jack I can help him to be a better son to you, and more of a man, I'll be glad, she replied. Lass, I'm beginning to see how big and fine you are, replied Bellounds with strong feeling, and it's worrying me. My neighbours have always accused me of seeing only my son, only Buster Jack. I was blind and deaf as to him. Well, I'm not so damn blind as I used to be. The scales are dropping off my old eyes. But I've got one hope left as far as Jack's concerned. That's marrying him to you. And I'm sticking to it. So will I stick to it, Dad, she replied. I'll go through with October 1st. Columbine broke off, vouchsafing no more, and soon left the breakfast table to take up the work she had laid out to do. And she accomplished it, though many times her hands dropped idle and her eyes peered out of her window at the drab slides of the old mountain. Later, when she went out to ride, she saw the cowboy Lem working in the blacksmith shop. Well, Miss Collie... Are you all still hanging round this here ranch? he asked, with welcoming smile. Lem, I'm almost ashamed now to face my good friends. I've neglected them so long, she replied. Ah, now, what are friends for but to go to? You're looking pale, I reckon. More like that there flower I see so much on the hills. Lem, I want to ride pronto. Do you think he's all right now? I reckon some moving round will do pronto good. He's eating his head off. The cowboy went with her to the pasture gate and whistled Pronto up. The mustang came trotting, evidently none the worse for his injuries, and eager to resume the old climbs with his mistress. Lem saddled him, paying particular attention to the cinch. Reckon we'd better not cinch him tight, said Lem. You just be careful and remember your saddle's loose. All right, Lem, replied Columbine as she mounted. Where are the boys this morning? Blood and Jim are repairing fence up the creek. And where's Ben? Ben? Oh, you mean Wade. Well, I ain't seen him since yesterday. He was skinning a lion then over here on the ridge. That was in the morning. I reckon he's around, for I seen some of the hounds. Then, Lem, you haven't heard about the fight yesterday between Jack and Wilson Moore? Lem straightened up quickly. Nope. I ain't heard a word. Well, they fought all right, said Columbine hurriedly. I saw it. I was the only one there. Wilson was badly used up before Dad and Ben got there. Ben drove off with him. But, Miss Collie, how'd it come off? I seen Wills the other day, was up to his homestead, and the boy just manages to rustle round on a crutch. He couldn't fight. That was just it. Jack saw his opportunity, and he forced Wilson to fight, accused him of stealing. Wills tried to avoid trouble, then Jack jumped him. Wilson fought and held his own until Jack began to kick his injured foot. Then Wilson fainted, and... and Jack beat him. Lem dropped his head, evidently to hide his expression. Well, 
dog on me he ejaculated that's too bad columbine left the cowboy and rode up the lane toward wade's cabin she did not analyze her deliberate desire to tell the truth about that fight but she would have liked to proclaim it to the whole range and to the world once clear of the house she felt free unburdened and to talk seemed to relieve some congestion of her thoughts the hounds heralded columbine's approach with a deep and booming chorus samson and jim lay upon the porch unleashed the other hounds were chained separately in the aspen grove a few rods distant. Samson thumped the boards with his big tail, but he did not get up, which laziness attested to the fact that there had been a lion chase the day before, and he was weary and stiff. If Wade had been at home, he would have come out to see what had occasioned the clamour. As Columbine rode by, she saw another fresh lion pelt pegged upon the wall of the cabin. She followed the brook. It had cleared since the rains and was shining and sparkling in the rough, swift places and limpid and green in the eddies. She passed the dam made by the solitary beaver that inhabited the valley. Freshly cut willows showed how the beaver was preparing for the long winter ahead. Columbine remembered then how greatly pleased Wade had been to learn about this old beaver and more than once Wade had talked about trapping some younger beavers and bringing them there to make company for the old fellow. The trail led across the brook at a wide, shallow place, where the splashing made by Pronto sent the trout scurrying for deeper water. Columbine kept to that trail, knowing that it led up into Sage Valley, where Wilson Moore had taken up the homestead property. Fresh horse tracks told her that Wade had ridden along there some time earlier. Pronto shied at the whirring of sage hens. Presently Columbine ascertained they were flushed by the hound Kane that had broken loose and followed her. He had done so before, and the fact had not displeased her. Kane, Kane, come here, she called. He came readily, but halted a rod or so away, and made an attempt at wagging his tail, a function evidently somewhat difficult for him. When she resumed trotting, he followed her. Old white slides had lost all but the drabs and dull yellows and greens, and, of course, those pale light slopes that had given the mountain its name. Sage Valley was only one of the valleys at its base. It opened out half a mile wide, dominated by the looming peak, and bordered on the far side by an aspen-thicketed slope. The brook babbled along under the edge of this thicket, Cattle and horses grazed here and there on the rich grassy levels. Columbine was surprised to see so many cattle, and wondered to whom they belonged. All of Bellan's stock had been driven lower down for the winter. There, among the several horses that whistled at her approach, she espied the white mustang Bellan's had given to Moor. It thrilled her to see him, and next she suffered a pang to think that perhaps his owner might never ride him again. But Columbine held her emotions in abeyance. The cabin stood high upon a level terrace, with clusters of aspens behind it, and was sheltered from winter blasts by a grey cliff, picturesque and crumbling, with its face overgrown by creeping vines and colourful shrubs. Wilson Moore could not have chosen a more secluded and beautiful valley for his homesteading adventure. The little grey cabin, with smoke curling from the stone chimney, had lost its look of dilapidation and disuse, yet there was nothing new that Columbine could see. The last quarter of the ascent of the slope, and the few rods across the level terrace, seemed extraordinarily long to Columbine. As she dismounted and tied Pronto, her heart was beating and her breath was coming fast. The door of the cabin was open. Kane trotted past the hesitating Columbine and went in. "'You son of a hound dog!' came to Columbine's listening ears in Wade's well-known voice. "'I'll have to beat you, sure as you're born!' "'I heard a horse,' came in a lower voice. That was Wilson's. "'Darn me if I'm not getting deafer every day,' was the reply. Then Wade appeared in the doorway. "'It's nobody but Miss Collie,' he announced, as he made way for her to enter. 
"'Good morning,' said Columbine, in a voice that had more than cheerfulness in it. "'Collie, did you come to see me?' She heard this incredulous query just an instant before she saw Wilson at the far end of the room, lying under the light of a window. The inside of the cabin seemed vague and unfamiliar. "'I surely did,' she replied, advancing. "'How are you?' "'Oh, I'm all right. Tickled to death right now. Only I hate to have you see this battered mug of mine.' "'You needn't care,' said Columbine unsteadily. And indeed, in that first glance, she did not see him clearly. A mist blurred her sight, and there was a lump in her throat. Then, to recover herself, she looked around the cabin. "'Well, Will's more, if this isn't fine!' she ejaculated, in amaze and delight. Columbine sustained an absolute surprise. A magic hand had transformed the interior of that rude old prospector's abode. A carpenter and a mason and a decorator had been wonderfully at work. From one end to the other Columbine gazed, from the big window under which Wilson lay on a blanketed couch, to the open fireplace where Wade grinned, she looked and looked, and then up to the clean aspen-poled roof, and down to the floor, carpeted with deer hides. The chinks between the logs of the walls were plastered with red clay. The dust and dirt were gone. The place smelled like sage and wood smoke and fragrant frying meat. Indeed, there were a glowing bed of embers and a steaming kettle and a smoking pot, and the way the smoke and steam curled up into the grey old chimney attested to its splendid draught. In each corner hung a deer head, from the antlers of which depended accoutrements of a cowboy, spurs, ropes, belts, scarfs, guns. One corner contained cupboard, ceiling high, with new clean doors of wood, neatly made, and next to it stood a table, just as new. On the blank wall beyond that were pegs holding saddles, bridles, blankets, clothes. "'He did it! All this inside!' burst out Moore, delighted with her delight. "'Quicker than a flash! Collie, isn't this great? I don't mind being down on my back. And he says they call him Hell-Bent Wade. I call him Heaven-Sent Wade.' When Columbine turned to the hunter, bursting with her pleasure and gratitude, he suddenly dropped the forked stick he used as a lift, and she saw his hand shake when he stooped to recover it. How strangely that struck her. "'Ben, it's perfectly possible that you've been sent by heaven,' she remarked, with a humour which still held gravity in it. "'Me? A good angel. That'd be a new job for Bent Wade,' he replied, with a queer laugh but I reckon I'd try to live up to it. There were small sprigs of golden aspen leaves and crimson oak leaves on the wall above the foot of Wilson's bed. Beneath them, on pegs, hung a rifle, and on the window sill stood a glass jar containing columbines. They were fresh, they had just been picked. They waved gently in the breeze, sweetly white and blue, strangely significant to the girl. Moore laughed defiantly. "'Wade thought to fetch these flowers in,' he explained. "'They're his favourites as well as mine. "'It won't be long now till the frost kills them, "'and I want to be happy while I may.' Again Columbine felt that deep surge within her, beyond her control, beyond her understanding, but now gathering and swelling, soon to be reckoned with. She did not look at Wilson's face then, her downcast gaze saw that his right hand was bandaged, and she touched it with an unconscious tenderness. "'Your hand! Why is it all wrapped up?' The cowboy laughed with grim humour. "'Have you seen Jack this morning?' "'No,' she replied shortly. "'Well, if you had, you'd know what happened to my fist.' "'Did you hurt it on him?' she asked, with a queer little shudder that was not unpleasant. Collie, I busted that fist on his handsome face. Oh, it was dreadful, she murmured. Wilson, he meant to kill you. Sure, and I'd cheerfully have killed him. You two must never meet again, she went on. 
"'I hope to heaven we never do,' replied Moore, with a dark earnestness that meant more than his actual words. "'Wilson, will you avoid him, for my sake?' implored Columbine, unconsciously clasping the bandaged hand. "'I will. I'll take the back trails. I'll sneak like a coyote. I'll hide and I'll watch. But Columbine Bellounds, if he ever corners me again—' "'Why, you'll leave him to hell-bent Wade,' interrupted the hunter, and he looked up from where he knelt, fixing those great inscrutable eyes upon the cowboy. Columbine saw something beyond his face, deeper than the gloom, a passion and a spirit that drew her like a magnet. "'And now, Miss Collie,' he went on, "'I reckon you'll want to wait on our invalid. He's got to be fed.' "'I surely will,' replied Columbine gladly, and she sat down on the edge of the bed. "'Ben, you fetch that box and put his dinner on it.' While Wade complied, Columbine, shyly aware of her nearness to the cowboy, sought to keep up conversation. "'Couldn't you help yourself with your left hand?' she inquired. "'That one's worse,' he answered, taking it from under the blanket where it had been concealed. "'Oh!' cried Columbine in dismay. "'Broke two bones in this one,' said Wilson with animation. "'Say, Collie, our friend Wade is a doctor, too. Never saw his beat.' "'And a cook, too, for here's your dinner. "'You must sit up,' ordered Columbine. "'Fold that blanket and help me up on it,' replied Moore. "'How strange and disturbing for Columbine to bend over him, "'to slip her arms under him and lift him. "'It recalled a long-forgotten motherliness of her doll-playing days, "'and her face flushed hot. "'Can't you move?' she asked, suddenly becoming aware of how dead a weight the cowboy appeared. "'Not very much,' he replied. Drops of sweat appeared on his bruised brow. It must have hurt him to move. "'You said your foot was all right.' "'It is,' he returned. "'It's still on my leg, as I know darned well.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Columbine dubiously. Without further comment, she began to feed him. "'It's worth getting licked to have this treat,' he said. "'Nonsense,' she rejoined. "'I'd stand it again to have you come here and feed me, but not from him. "'Wilson, I never knew you to be facetious before. Here, take this.' Apparently he did not see her outstretched hand. "'Collie, you've changed. You're older. You're a woman now, and the prettiest... "'Are you going to eat?' demanded Columbine. "'Huh?' exclaimed the cowboy, blankly. "'Eat? Oh, yes, sure. I'm powerful hungry. And maybe heaven-sent Wade can't cook.' But Columbine had trouble in feeding him. What with his helplessness, and his propensity to watch her face instead of her hands, and her own mounting sensations of a sweet, natural joy and fitness in her proximity to him, she was hard put to it, to show some dexterity as a nurse, and all the time she was aware of Wade, with his quiet, forceful presence hovering near. Could he not see her hands trembling, and would he not think that weakness strange? Then driftingly came the thought that she would not shrink from Wade's reading her mind. Perhaps even now he understood her better than she understood herself. "'I can't eat any more,' declared Moore at last. "'You've done very well for an invalid,' observed Columbine. Then, changing the subject, she asked, "'Wilson, you're going to stay here, winter here,' Dad would call it. "'Yes. Are those your cattle down in the valley?' "'Sure. I've got near a hundred head. I saved my money and bought cattle.' "'That's a good start for you, I'm glad.' "'But who's going to take care of you and your stock until you can work again?' "'Why, my friend there, heaven-sent Wade,' replied Moore, "'indicating the little man busy with the utensils on the table, "'and apparently hearing nothing. "'Can I fetch you anything to eat or read?' she inquired. "'Fetch yourself,' he replied softly. "'But, boy, how could I fetch you anything without fetching myself?' "'Sure, that's right.' 
"'Then fetch me some jam and a book tomorrow, will you?' "'I surely will. "'That's a promise. I know your promises of old. "'Then good-bye till tomorrow. I must go. I hope you'll be better. "'I'll stay sick in bed till you stop coming.' Columbine left rather precipitously, and when she got outdoors, it seemed that the hills had never been so softly, dreamily grey, nor their loneliness so sweet, nor the sky so richly and deeply blue. As she untied Pronto, the hunter came out with Cain at his heels. "'Miss Collie, if you'll go easy, I'll catch my horse and ride down with you,' he said. She mounted and walked Pronto out to the trail and slowly faced the gradual descent. It was really higher up there than she had surmised, and the view was beautiful. The grey rolling foothills, so exquisitely coloured at that hour, and the black fringed ranges, one above the other, and the distant peaks, sunset flushed across the purple, all rose open and clear to her sight, so wildly and splendidly expressive of the Colorado she loved. At the foot of the slope, Wade joined her. "'Lass, I'm asking you not to tell Bellounds that I'm caring for Wills,' he said in his gentle, persuasive way. "'I won't. But why not tell Dad? He wouldn't mind. He'd do that sort of thing himself.' "'Reckon he would. But this deal's out of the ordinary. And Wills is not in as good shape as he thinks. I'm not taking any chances. I don't want to lose my job.' and I don't want to be hindered from attending to this boy. They had ridden as far as the first aspen grove when Wade concluded this remark. Columbine halted her horse, causing her companion to do likewise. Her former misgivings were augmented by the intelligence of Wade's sad, lined face. Ben, tell me, she whispered, with a hand going to his arm. Miss Collie, I'm a sort of doctor in my way. I studied some medicine and surgery. And I know, I wouldn't tell you this if it wasn't that I've got to rely on you to help me. I will, but go on, tell me, interposed Columbine, trying to fortify herself. Will's foot is all messed up. Buster Jack kicked it all out of shape. And it's a hundred times worse than ever. I am afraid of blood poisoning and gangrene. You know gangrene is a dying and rotting of the flesh. I told the boy straight out that he'd better let me cut his foot off, and he swore he'd keep his foot or die. Well, if gangrene does set in, we can't save his leg, and maybe not his life. Oh, it can't be as bad as all that, cried Columbine. Oh, I knew, I knew there was something. Ben... You mean even at best now he'll be a... She broke off, unable to finish. Miss Collie, in any case, Wills will never ride again, not like a cowboy. That for Columbine seemed the worst and the last straw. Hot tears blinded her. Hot blood gushed over her. Hot heartbeats throbbed in her throat. Poor boy! That'll ruin him, she cried. He loved a horse. He loved to ride. He was the best rider of them all. And now he's ruined. He'll be lame, a cripple, club-footed. All because of that Jack Bellounds, the brute, the coward. I hate him. Oh, I hate him. And I've got to marry him on October 1st. Oh, God pity me. Blindly, Columbine reeled out of her saddle and slowly dropped to the grass, where she burst into a violent storm of sobs and tears. It shook her every fibre. It was hopeless, terrible grief. The dry grass received her flood of tears and her incoherent words. Wade dismounted, and kneeling beside her, placed a gentle hand upon her heaving shoulder, but he spoke no word. By and by, when the storm had begun to subside, he raised her head. "'Lass, nothing is ever so bad as it seems,' he said softly. "'Come, sit up. Let me talk to you.' "'Oh, Ben, something terrible has happened,' she cried. "'It's in me. I don't know what it is, but it'll kill me.' "'I know,' he replied, as her head fell upon his shoulder. "'Miss Collie, 
I'm an old fellow that's had everything happen to him, and I'm living yet, trying to help people along. No one dies so easy. Why, you're a fine, strong girl, and something tells me you was made for happiness. I know how things turn out. Listen. But, Ben, you don't know about me, she sobbed. I've told you I hate Jack Bellounds, but I've got to marry him. His father raised me from a baby. He brought me up. I owe him my life. I've no relation, no mother, no father. No one loves me for myself. Nobody loves you, echoed Wade, with an exquisite tone of repudiation. Strange how people fool themselves. Lass, you're hugging your troubles too hard. And you're wrong. Why, everybody loves you. Lem and Jim, why, you just brighten the hard world they live in. And that poor, hot-headed Jack, he loves you as well as he can love anything. And the old man, no daughter could be loved more. And I, I love you, lass, just like as if you might have been my own. I'm going to be the friend, the brother you need, and I reckon I can come somewheres near being a mother if you'll let me. Something, some subtle power or charm, stole over Columbine, assuaging her terrible sense of loss, of grief. There was tenderness in this man's hands, in his voice, and through them throbbed strong and passionate life and spirit. Do you really love me? Love me, she whispered, somehow comforted, somehow feeling that what he offered was what she had missed as a child. And you want to be all that for me? Yes, lass, and I reckon you'd better try me. Oh, how good you are. I felt that the very first time I was with you, I've wanted to come to you to tell you my troubles. I love Dad, and he loves me, but he doesn't understand. Dad is wrapped up in his son. I've had no one. I never had anyone. You have someone now, returned Wade, with a rich, deep mellowness in his voice that soothed Columbine and made her wonder. And because I've been through so much, I can tell you what'll help you. Lass, if a woman isn't big and brave, how will a man ever be? There's more in women than in men. Life has given you a hard knock placing you here, no real parents, and making you responsible to a man whose only fault is blinded love for his son. Well, you've got to meet it, face it, with what a woman has more of than any man. Courage! Suppose you do hate this Buster Jack. Suppose you do love this poor, crippled Wilson Moore. Lass, don't look like that. Don't deny. You do love that boy. Well, it's hell. But you can never tell what'll happen when you're honest and square. If you feel it your duty to pay your debt to the old man you call Dad, to pay it by marrying his son, why, do it and be a woman. There's nothing as great as a woman can be. There's happiness that comes in strange, unheard-of ways. There's more in this life than what you want most. You didn't place yourself in this fix. So, if you meet it with courage and faithfulness to yourself, why, it'll not turn out as you dread. Some day, if you ever think you're broken-hearted, I'll tell you my story. And then you'll not think your lot so hard. For I've had a broken heart and ruined life. And yet I've lived on and on, finding happiness I never dreamed would come, fighting or working. And how I found the world beautiful. And how I love the flowers and hills and wild things so well, that just that would be enough to live for. And think, lass, of what a wonderful happiness will come to me in showing all this to you. That'll be the crown in glory. And if it's that much to me then you be sure there's nothing on earth I won't do for you. Columbine lifted her tear-stained face with a light of inspiration. Oh, Wilson was right, she murmured. You are heaven-sent, and I'm going to love you. 
End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A new spirit, or a liberation of her own, had fired Columbine, and was now burning within her, unquenchable and unutterable. Some divine spark had penetrated into that mysterious depth of her, to inflame and to illumine, so that when she arose from this hour of calamity, she felt that to the tenderness and sorrow and fidelity in her soul had been added the lightning flash of passion. "'Oh, Ben, shall I be able to hold on to this?' she cried, flinging wide her arms, as if to embrace the winds of heaven. "'This what, lass?' he asked. "'This, this woman,' she answered passionately, with her hands sweeping back to press her breast." "'No woman who wakes ever goes back to a girl again,' he said sadly. "'I wanted to die, and now I want to live, to fight. "'Ben, you've uplifted me. "'I was little, weak, miserable. "'But in my dreams, or in some state I can't remember or understand, "'I've waited for your very words. "'I was ready. "'It's as if I knew you in some other world before I was born on this earth.' And when you spoke to me here so wonderfully, as my mother might have spoken, my heart leaped up in recognition of you and your call to my womanhood. Oh, how strange and beautiful. Miss Collie, he replied slowly as he bent to his saddle straps, you're young and you've no understanding of what's strange and terrible in life, and beautiful too, as you say. Who knows? Maybe in some former state I was something to you. I believe in that. Reckon I can't say how or what. Maybe we were flowers or birds. I've a weakness for that idea. Birds. I like the thought too, replied Columbine. I love most birds. But there are hawks, crows, buzzards. I reckon. Lass, there's got to be balance in nature. If it weren't for the ugly and the evil... We wouldn't know the beautiful and good. And now let's ride home. It's getting late. Ben, ought I not go back to Wilson right now? She asked slowly. What for? To tell him something and why I can't come tomorrow or ever afterward, she replied low and tremulously. Wade pondered over her words. It seemed to Columbine that her sharpened faculties sensed something of hostility, of opposition in him. "'Reckon tomorrow would be better,' he said presently. "'Wilson's had enough excitement for one day.' "'Then I'll go tomorrow,' she returned. In the gathering cold twilight they rode down the trail in silence. "'Good night, lass,' said Wade as he reached his cabin. "'And remember you're not alone any more.' "'Good night, my friend,' she replied, and rode on. Columbine encountered Jim Montana at the corrals, and it was not too dark for her to see his foam-lashed horse. Jim appeared non-committal, almost surly, but Columbine guessed that he had ridden to Kremling and back in one day, on some order of Jack's. "'Miss Collie, I'll tend to Pronto,' he offered, "'and your supper'll be waiting.' A bright fire blazed on the living-room hearth. The rancher was reading by its light. "'Hello, rosy cheeks,' greeted the rancher with unusual amiability. "'Been riding again the wind, eh? "'Well, if you ain't pretty, then my eyes are poor.' "'It's cold, Dad,' she replied, "'and the wind stings. "'But I didn't ride fast, nor far. "'I've been up to see Wilson Moore.' "'Aha. Uh -huh. Well, how's the boy?' asked Bellounds gruffly. He said he was all right, but but I guess that's not so, responded Columbine. Any friends looking after him? Oh, yes, he must have friends, the Andrewses and others. I'm glad to say his cabin is comfortable. He'll be looked after. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'll send Lem or Wade up there and see if we can do anything for the boy. 
to have that's just like you replied columbine with her hand seeking his broad shoulder uh -huh. say collie here's letters from most everybody in kremlin wantin to be invited up for october first how about askin em the more the merrier replied columbine well i reckon i'll not ask anybody why not dad no one can gamble on that son of mine even on his wedding day replied bellounds gloomily dad what did jack do today i'm not saying he did anything answered the rancher dad you can gamble on me well i should smile he said putting his big arm around her i wish you was jack and jack was you at that moment the young man spoken of slouched into the room with his head bandaged and took a seat at the supper table well collie let's go and get it said the rancher cheerily i can always eat anyhow i'm hungry as a bear rejoined columbine as she took her seat which was opposite jack where have you been he asked curiously why good evening jack did you finally notice me i've been riding pronto the first time since he was hurt had a lovely ride up through sage valley jack glowered at her with the one unbandaged eye and growled something under his breath and then began to stab meat and potatoes with his fork what's the matter jack aren't you well asked columbine with a solicitude just a little too sweet to be genuine yes i'm well snapped jack but you look sick that is what i can see of your face looks sick your mouth droops at the corners you're very pale and red in spots and your one eye glows with unearthly woe as if you were not long for this world the amazing nature of this speech coming from the girl who had always been so sweet and quiet and backward was attested to by the consternation of jack and the mirth of his father are you making fun of me demanded jack why jack do you think i would make fun of you i only wanted to say how queer you look are you going to be married with one eye jack collapsed at that and the old man after a long stare of open-mouthed wonder broke out ah ha ha by golly lass i'd never believed that was in you jack be game and take your medicine and both of you forgive and forget there'll be quarrels enough mebby without raking over the past when alone again columbine reverted to a mood vastly removed from her apparent levity with the rancher and his son a grave and inward-searching thought possessed her and it had to do with the uplift the spiritual advance the rise above mere personal welfare that had strangely come to her through bent wade from their first meeting he had possessed a singular attraction for her that now in the light of the meaning of his life seemed to columbine to be the man's nobility and wisdom arising out of his travail out of the terrible years that had left their record upon his face and so columbine strove to bind for ever in her soul the spirit which had arisen in her interpreting from wade's rude words of philosophy that which she needed for her own light and strength she appreciated her duty toward the man who had been a father to her whatever he asked that would she do and as for the son she must live with the rest of her life her duty there was to be a good wife to bear with his faults to strive always to help him by kindness patience loyalty and such affection as was possible to her hate had to be reckoned with and hate she knew had no place in a good woman's heart it must be expelled if that were humanly possible all this was hard would grow harder but she accepted it and knew her mind her soul was her own unchangeable through any adversity she could be with that alone always aloof from the petty cares and troubles common to people wade's words had thrilled her with their secret with their limitless hope of an unknown world of thought and feeling happiness in the ordinary sense might never be hers alas for her dreams but there had been given her a glimpse of something higher than pleasure and contentment dreams were but dreams but she could still dream of what had been of what might have been 
of the beauty and mystery of life, of something in nature that called sweetly and irresistibly to her. Who could rob her of the rolling grey velvety hills and the purple peaks and the black ranges among which she had been found a waif, a little lost creature, born like a columbine under the spruces? Love, sudden dawning, inexplicable love, was her secret, still tremulously new and perilous in its sweetness. That only did she fear to realise and to face, because it was an unknown factor, a threatening flame. Her sudden knowledge of it seemed inextricably merged with the mounting, strong and steadfast stream of her spirit. I'll go to him, I'll tell him, she murmured. He shall have that. Then I must bid him good-bye forever. To tell Wilson would be sweet. To leave him would be bitter. Vague possibilities haunted her. What might come of the telling? How dark loomed the bitterness? She could not know what hid in either of these acts until they were fulfilled, and the hours became long, and sleep far off, and the quietness of the house a torment and the melancholy wail of coyotes a reminder of happy girlhood never to return when next day the long deferred hour came columbine selected a horse that she could run and she rode up the winding valley swift as the wind but at the aspen grove where wade's keen gentle voice had given her secret life she suffered a reaction that made her halt and ascend the slope very slowly and with many stops Sight of Wade's horse, halted near the cabin, relieved Columbine somewhat of a gathering might of emotion. The hunter would be inside, and so she would not be compelled at once to confess her secret. This expectancy gave impetus to her lagging steps. Before she reached the open door, she called out. "'Collie, you're late,' answered Wilson, with both joy and reproach, as she entered." The cowboy lay upon his bed, and he was alone in the room. "'Oh, where is Ben?' exclaimed Columbine. "'He was here. He cooked my dinner. We waited, but you never came. The dinner got cold. I made sure you'd backed out, weren't coming at all, and I couldn't eat. Wade said he knew you'd come. He went off with the hounds somewhere. And, oh, Collie, it's all right now.' Columbine walked to his bedside and looked down upon him with a feeling as if some giant hand was tugging at her heart. He looked better. The swelling and redness of his face were less marked, and at that moment no pain shadowed his eyes. They were soft, dark, eloquent. If Columbine had not come with her avowed resolution and desire to unburden her heart, she would have found that look in his eyes a desperately hard one to resist. Had it ever shone there before? Blind she had been. You're better, she said happily. Sure, now. But I had a bad night. Didn't sleep till near daylight. Wade found me asleep. Collie, it's good of you to come. You look so, so wonderful. I never saw your face glow like that. And your eyes, oh... "'You think I'm pretty, then?' she asked, dreamily, not occupied at all with that thought. He uttered a contemptuous laugh. "'Come closer,' he said, reaching for her with a clumsy bandaged hand. Down upon her knees, Columbine fell. Both hands flew to cover her face. And as she swayed forward, she shook violently, and there escaped her lips a little muffled sound. "'Why, Collie!' cried Moore, astounded. Good heavens, don't cry. I, I didn't mean anything. I only wanted to feel you, touch your hand. Here, she answered, blindly holding out her hand, groping for his till she found it. Her other was still pressed to her eyes. One moment longer would Columbine keep her secret, hide her eyes, revel in the unutterable joy and sadness of this crisis that could come to a woman only once. "'What in the world?' ejaculated the cowboy, now bewildered. But he possessed himself of the trembling hand offered. "'Collie, you act so strange. You're not crying. Am I only locoed or flighty or what? 
Dear, look at me. Columbine swept her hand from her eyes with a gesture of utter surrender. Wilson, I'm ashamed and sad and gloriously happy, she said with swift breathlessness. Why? he asked. Because of, of something I have to tell you, she whispered. What is that? She bent over him. Can't you guess? He turned pale and his eyes burned with intense fire. I won't guess. I daren't guess. It's something that's been true for years, forever it seems. Something I never dreamed of till last night, she went on softly. Collie, he cried, don't torture me. Do you remember long ago when we quarrelled so dreadfully because you kissed me? she asked. Do you think I could kiss you and live to forget? I love you, she whispered shyly, feeling the hot blood burn her. That whisper transformed Wilson Moore. His arm flashed round her neck and pulled her face down to his, and holding her in a close embrace, he kissed her lips and cheeks and wet eyes, and then again her lips, passionately and tenderly. Then he pressed her head down upon his breast. "'My God, I can't believe! Say it again!' he cried hoarsely. Columbine buried her flaming face in the blanket covering him, and her hands clutched it tightly. The wildness of his joy, the strange strength and power of his kisses, utterly changed her. Upon his breast she lay, without desire to lift her face. All seemed different, wilder, as she responded to his appeal. Yes, I love you. Oh, I love, love, love you. Dearest, lift your face. It's true now, I know, it's proved. But let me look at you. Columbine lifted herself as best she could, but she was blinded by tears and choked with utterance that would not come, and in the grip of a shuddering emotion that was realisation of loss in a moment when she learned the supreme and imperious sweetness of love. "'Kiss me, Columbine,' he demanded. Through blurred eyes she saw his face, white and rapt, and she bent to it, meeting his lips with her first kiss which was her last. Again, Collie, again, he begged. No, no more, she whispered very low, and encircling his neck with her arms, she hid her face and held him convulsively and stifled the sobs that shook her. Then Moore was silent, holding her with his free hand, breathing hard and slowly quieting down. Columbine felt then that he knew that there was something terribly wrong and that perhaps he dared not voice his fear. At any rate, he silently held her, waiting. That silent wait grew unendurable for Columbine. She wanted to prolong this moment that was to be all she could ever surrender. But she dared not do so, for she knew if he ever kissed her again, her duty to Bellounds would vanish like mist in the sun. To release her hold upon him, seemed like a tearing of her heartstrings. She sat up, she wiped the tears from her eyes, she rose to her feet, all the time striving for strength to face him again. A loud voice ringing from the cliffs outside startled Columbine. It came from Wade calling the hounds. He had returned and the fact stirred her. I am to marry Jack Bellounds on October 1st. The cowboy raised himself up as far as he was able. It was agonizing for Columbine to watch the changing and whitening of his face. No, no, he gasped. Yes, it's true, she replied hopelessly. No, he exclaimed hoarsely. But Wilson, I tell you, yes, I came to tell you. It's true, oh, it's true. But, girl, you said you love me he declared, transfixing her with dark, accusing eyes. That's just as terribly true. He softened a little, and something of terror and horror took the place of anger. Just then Wade entered the cabin with his soft tread, hesitated, and then came to Columbine's side. She could not unrivet her gaze from Moore to look at her friend, 
but she reached out with trembling hand to him. Wade clasped it in a horny palm. Wilson fought for self-control in vain. Collie, if you love me, how can you marry Jack Bellounds? he demanded. I must. Why must you? I owe my life and my bringing up to his father. He wants me to do it. His heart is set upon my helping Jack to become a man. Dad loves me and I love him. I must stand by him. I must repay him. It is my duty. You've a duty to yourself, as a woman, he rejoined passionately. Pellans is wrapped up in his son. He's blind to the shame of such a marriage. But you're not. Shame? faltered Columbine. Yes. The shame of marrying one man when you love another. You can't love two men. You'll give yourself. You'll be his wife. Do you understand what that means? I, I think I do, replied Columbine, faintly. Where had vanished all her wonderful spirit? This fire-eyed boy was breaking her heart with his reproach. But you'll bear his children, cried Wilson mother of them when you love me didn't you think of that oh no i never did i never did wailed columbine then you'll think before it's too late he implored wildly dearest collie think you won't ruin yourself you won't say you won't but oh wilson what can i say i've got to marry him Collie, I'll kill him before he gets you. You mustn't talk so. If you fought again, if anything terrible happened, it'd kill me. You'd be better off, he flashed, white as a sheet. Columbine leaned against Wade for support. She was fast weakening in strength, although her spirit held. She knew what was inevitable, but Wilson's agony was rending her. Listen, began the cowboy again. It's your life, your happiness, your soul. Bellounds is crazy over that spoiled boy. He thinks the sun rises and sets in him. But Jack Bellounds is no good on this earth. Collie, dearest, don't think that's my jealousy. I am horribly jealous, but I know him. He's not worth you. No man is, and he the least. He'll break your heart, drag you down, ruin your health, kill you as sure as you stand there. I want you to know I could prove to you what he is. But don't make me. Trust me, Collie. Believe me. Wilson, I do believe you, cried Columbine. But it doesn't make any difference. It only makes my duty harder. He'll treat you like he treats a horse or a dog. He'll beat you. He never will, if he ever lays a hand on me. If not that, he'll tire of you. Jack Bellans never stuck to anything in his life and never will. It's not in him. He wants what he can't have. If he gets it, then right off he doesn't want it. Oh, I've known him since he was a kid. Columbine, you've a mistaken sense of duty. No girl need sacrifice her all because some man found her a lost baby and gave her a home. A woman owes more to herself than to anyone. Oh, that's true, Wilson. I've thought it all. But you're unjust, hard. You make no allowance for, for some possible good in everyone. Dad swears I can reform Jack. Maybe I can. I'll pray for it. Reform Jack Bellhounds? How can you save a bad egg? That damned coward. Didn't he prove to you what he was when he jumped on me and kicked my broken foot till I fainted? What do you want? Don't say any more, please, cried Columbine. Oh, I'm so sorry. I oughtn't have come. Ben, take me home. But Collie, I love you, frantically urged Wilson. And he... He may love you, but he's... Collie, he's been... Here Moore seemed to bite his tongue, to hold back speech, to fight something terrible and desperate and cowardly in himself. Columbine heard only his impassioned declaration of love, and to that she vibrated. You speak as if this was one-sided, she burst out, 
as once more the gush of hot blood surged over her. "'You don't love me any more than I love you. Not as much, for I'm a woman. I love with all my heart and soul.' Moore fell back upon the bed, spent and overcome. "'Wade, my friend, for God's sake do something,' he whispered, appealing to the hunter as if in a last hope. "'Tell Collie what it'll mean for her to marry Bellounds. "'If that doesn't change her, then tell her what it'll mean to me. "'I'll never go home. I'll never leave here. "'If she hadn't told me she loved me, then I might have stood anything. "'But now I can't. It'll kill me, Wade.' "'Boy, you're talking flighty again,' replied Wade. "'This morning when I come you were dreaming and talking, clean out of your head. "'Well, now, you and Collie listen.' You're right, and she's right. I reckon I never run across a deal with two people fixed just like you. But that doesn't hinder me from feeling the same about it as I'd feel about something I was used to. He paused, and gently releasing Columbine, he went to Moore and retied his loosened bandage and spread out the disarranged blankets. Then he sat down on the edge of the bed and bent over a little, running a roughened hand through the scant hair that had begun to silver upon his head. Presently he looked up, and from that sallow face with its lines and furrows, and from the deep inscrutable eyes, there fell a light which, however sad and wise in its infinite understanding of pain and strife, was still ruthless and unquenchable in its hope. "'Wade, for God's sake, save Columbine!' "'Importuned Wilson. "'Oh, if you only could!' cried Columbine, "'impelled beyond her power to resist by that prayer. "'Lass, you stand by your convictions,' he said impressively. "'And more, you be a man and don't make it so hard for her. "'Neither of you can do anything. "'Now there's old Bellounds. He'll never change. "'He might rear up for this or that.' but he'll never change his cherished hopes for his son. But Jack might change. Looking back over all the years, I remember many boys like this Buster Jack, and I remember how, in the nature of their doings, they just hanged themselves. I've a queer foresight about people whose trouble I've made my own. It's something that never fails. When their trouble's going to turn out bad... Then I feel a terrible yearning to tell the story of Hellbent Wade. That foresight of trouble gave me my name, but it's not operating here. And so, my young friends, you can believe me when I say something will happen. As far as October 1st is concerned, or any time near, Collie isn't going to marry Jack Bellounds. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One day Wade remarked to Bellounds, You can never tell what a dog is until you know him. Dogs are like men. Some of them look good, but they're really bad, and that works the other way round. If a dog's born to run wild and be a sheep killer, that's what he'll be. I've known dogs that loved men as no humans could have loved them. It doesn't make any difference to a dog if his master is a worthless scamp. Well, I reckon most of them hounds I bought had no good masters, judging from the way they act, replied the rancher. I'm developing a first-rate pack, said Wade. Jim hasn't any faults except he doesn't bay enough. Samson's not as true-nosed as Jim, but he'll follow Jim. And he has a deep, heavy bay you can hear for miles, so that makes up for Jim's one fault. These two hounds hang together, and with them I'm developing others. Denver will split off of bear or lion tracks when he jumps a deer. I reckon he's not young enough to be cured of that. Some of the younger hounds are coming on fine, but there's two dogs in the bunch that beat me all hollow. Which ones? asked Bellounds. "'There's that bloodhound, Cain,' replied the hunter. "'He's sure a queer dog. I can't win him. "'He minds me now because I licked him, and once good and hard when he bit me. "'But he doesn't cotton to me worth a damn. 
He's getting fond of Miss Columbine, and I believe might make a good watchdog for her. Where'd he come from, Bellans? Well, if I don't disremember, he was born in a prairie schooner, coming across the plains. His mother was a full blood, and come from Louisiana. That accounts for an instinct I see cropping out in Cain, rejoined Wade. He likes to trail a man. I've caught him doing it. And he doesn't take to hunting lions or bear. Why, the other day, when the hounds treed a lion and went howling wild, Cain came up, and he looked disgusted and went off by himself. He hunts by himself anyhow. First off, I thought he might be a sheep killer, but I reckon not. He can trail men, and that's about all the good he is. His mother must have been a slave hunter, and Cain inherits that trailing instinct. Uh huh. Well, train him on trailing men, then. I've seen times when a dog like that had come handy. And if he takes to Collie and you approve of him, let her have him. She's been coaxing me for a dog. That isn't a bad idea. Miss Collie walks and rides alone a good deal, and she never packs a gun. Funny about that, said Bellounds. Collie is game in most ways, but she'd never kill anything. Wade, you ain't thinking she ought to stop them lonesome walks and rides? No, sure not, so long as she doesn't go too far away. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, supposing she rode up out of the valley, west on the Black Range. That won't do, Bellounds, replied Wade seriously. But Miss Collie's not going to, for I've cautioned her. Fact is, I've run across some hard-looking men between here and Buffalo Park. They're not hunters or prospectors or cattlemen or travellers. Well, you don't say, rejoined Bellounds. Now, Wade, are you connecting up them strangers with the stock I missed on this last round-up? Reckon I can't go as far as that, returned Wade, but I didn't like their looks. That, coming from you, Wade, is like the findings of a jury. It's getting along toward October. Snow'll be flying soon. You don't reckon them strangers will winter in the woods? No, I don't. Neither does Lewis. You recollect him? Yes, that prospector who hangs out around Buffalo Park looking for gold. He's been here, good fella but crazy on gold. I've met Lewis several times, one place and another. I lost the hounds day before yesterday. They treed a lion, and Lewis heard the racket, and he stayed with them till I come up. Then he told me some interesting news. You see, he's been worrying about this gang that's ranging around Buffalo Park, and he's tried to get a line on them. Somebody took a shot at him in the woods. He couldn't swear it was one of that outfit, but he could swear he wasn't near shot by accident. Now Lewis says these men pack to and fro from Algeria, and he has a hunch they're in cahoots with Smith, who runs a place there. You know Smith? No, I don't, and haven't any wish to, declared Bellans shortly. He always looks shady to me, and he's not been square with friends of mine in Algeria but no one ever proved him crooked, whatever was thought. For my part, I never missed a guess in my life. Men don't have scars on their face like his for nothing. Boss, I'm confiding what I want kept under your hat, said Wade quietly. I knew Smith. He's as bad as the West makes them. I gave him that scar. And when he sees me, he's going for his gun. Well, I'll be darned. Doesn't surprise me. It's a small world. Wade, I'll keep my mouth shut, sure, but what's your game? Lewis and I will find out if there is any connection between Smith and this gang of strangers, and the occasional loss of a few head of stock. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, you have my good will, you bet. Sure, there's been some rustling of cattle. Not enough to make any rancher holler, and I reckon there never will be any more of that in Colorado. Still, if we get the drop on some outfit, we sure ought to corral them. Boss, I'm telling you. Wade, you ain't a-going to start that telling hell-bent happenings to come here at White Slides, interrupted Bellounds plaintively. No, I reckon I've no hunch like that now, responded Wade seriously. But I was about to say that if Smith is in on any rustling of cattle, he'll be hard to catch and if he's caught, they'll be shooting to pay. He's cunning and has had long experience. It's not likely he'd work openly, as he did years ago. If he's stealing stock or buying and selling stock that someone steals for him, 
It's only on a small scale, and it'll be hard to trace. Well, he might be deep, said Belllounds reflectively, but men like that, no matter how deep or cunning they are, always come to a bad end, just works out natural. Had you any grudge against Smith? What I give him was for somebody else, and was sure little enough. He's got the grudge against me. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, then don't you go hunting for trouble. Try and make white slides one place that'll disprove your name. All the same, don't shy at sight of anything suspicious round the ranch. The old man plodded thoughtfully away, leaving the hunter likewise in a brown study. He's getting a hunch that I'll tell him of some shadow hovering black over white slides, soliloquized Wade. Maybe... Maybe so, but I don't see any yet. Strange how a man will say what he didn't start out to say. Now I started to tell him about that amazing dog Fox. Fox was the great dog of the whole pack, and he had been absolutely overlooked, which fact Wade regarded with contempt for himself. Discovery of this particular dog came about by accident. Somewhere in the big corral there was a hole where the smaller dogs could escape, but Wade had been unable to find it. For that matter, the corral was full of holes, not any of which, however, it appeared to Wade, would permit anything except a squirrel to pass in and out. One day, when the hunter, very much exasperated, was prowling around and around inside the corral, searching for this mysterious vent, a rather small dog, with short grey and brown woolly hair and shaggy brows, half hiding big bright eyes, came up wagging his stump of a tail. "'Well, what do you know about it?' demanded Wade. Of course he had noticed this particular dog, but to no purpose. On this occasion, the dog repeated so unmistakably former overtures of friendship that Wade gave him close scrutiny. He was neither young, nor comely, nor thoroughbred, but there was something in his intelligent eyes that struck the hunter significantly. "'Say, maybe I overlooked something. "'But there's been a heap of dogs round here, "'and you're no great shucks for looks. "'Now, if you're talking to me, come and find that hole.' "'Whereupon Wade began another search around the corral. "'It covered nearly an acre of ground, "'and in some places the fence poles had been sunk near rocks. "'More than once Wade got down upon his hands and knees "'to see if he could find the hole.' The dog went with him, watching with knowing eyes that the hunter imagined actually laughed at him. But they were glad eyes, which began to make an appeal. Presently, when Wade came to a rough place, the dog slipped under a shelving rock and thence through a half-concealed hole in the fence and immediately came back through to wag his stump of a tail and look as if the finding of that hole was easy enough. "'You old fox,' declared Wade, very much pleased, as he patted the dog. "'You found it for me, didn't you? Good dog. "'Now I'll fix that hole, and then you can come to the cabin with me. "'And your name's Fox.' "'That was how Fox introduced himself to Wade, and found his opportunity. "'The fact that he was not a hound had operated against his being taken out hunting, "'and therefore little or no attention had been paid him.' Very shortly, Fox showed himself to be a dog of superior intelligence. The hunter had lived much with dogs, and had come to learn that the longer he lived with them, the more there was to marvel at and love. Fox insisted so strongly on being taken out to hunt with the hounds, that Wade, vowing not to be surprised at anything, let him go. It happened to be a particularly hard day on hounds, because of old tracks and cross tracks and difficult ground. Fox worked out a labyrinthine trail that Samson gave up and Jim failed on. This delighted Wade, and that night he tried to find out from Andrews, who sold the dog to Bellounds, something about Fox. All the information obtainable was that Andrews suspected the fellow from whom he had gotten Fox had stolen him. Bellounds had never noticed him at all. Wade kept the possibilities of Fox to himself, and reserved his judgment, and every day gave the dog another chance to show what he knew. Long before the end of that week, Wade loved Fox, and decided that he was a wonderful animal. Fox liked to hunt, but it did not matter what he hunted. That depended upon the pleasure of his master. 
he would find hobbled horses that were hiding out and standing still to escape detection he would trail cattle he would tree squirrels and point grouse invariably he suited his mood to the kind of game he hunted if put on an elk track or that of deer he would follow it keeping well within sight of the hunter and never uttering a single bark or yelp and without any particular eagerness he would stick until he had found the game or until he was called off bear and cat tracks however roused the savage instinct in him and transformed him he yelped at every jump on a trail and whenever his yelp became piercing and continuous wade well knew the quarry was in sight he fought bear like a wise old dog that knew when to rush in with a snap and when to keep away when lions or wild cats were treed fox lost much of his ferocity and interest then the matter of that particular quarry was ended his most valuable characteristic however was his ability to stick on the track upon which he was put wade believed if he put fox on the trail of a rabbit and if a bear or lion were to cross that trail ahead of him fox would stick to the rabbit even more remarkable was it that fox would not steal a piece of meat and that he would fight the other dogs for being thieves fox and cane it seemed to the hunter in his reflective foreshadowing of events at white slides were destined to play most important parts upon a certain morning several days before october first which date rankled in the mind of wade he left moore's cabin leading a pack-horse the hounds he had left behind at the ranch but fox accompanied him wade i want some elk steak old bellounds had said the day before nothing like a good rump steak i was raised on elk meat now here more than a week ago i told you i wanted some there's elk all around i heard a bull whistle at sun-up to-day made me wish i was young again you go pack in an elk i haven't run across any bulls lately wade had replied but he did not mention that he had avoided such a circumstance the fact was wade admired and loved the elk above all horned wild animals so strange was his attitude toward elk that he had gone meat hungry many a time with these great stags bugling near his camp as he climbed the yellow grassy mountainside working round above the valley his mind was not centred on the task at hand but on wilson moore who had come to rely on him with the unconscious tenacity of a son whose faith in his father was unshakable the crippled cowboy kept his hope kept his cheerful grateful spirit obeyed and suffered with a patience that was fine there had been no improvement in his injured foot wade worried about that much more than more the thing that mostly occupied the cowboy was the near approach of october first with its terrible possibility for him he did not talk about it except when fever made him irrational but it was plain to wade how he prayed and hoped and waited in silence strange how he trusted wade to avert catastrophe of columbine's marriage yet such trust seemed familiar to wade as he reflected over past years had he not wanted such trust had he not invited it for twenty years no happiness had come to wade in any sense comparable to that now secretly his as he lived near columbine bellounds divining more and more each day how truly she was his own flesh and the image of the girl he had loved and married and wronged columbine was his daughter he saw himself in her and columbine from being strongly attracted to him and trusting in him and relying upon him had come to love him that was the most beautiful and terrible fact of his life beautiful because it brought back the past her babyhood and his barren years and gave him this sudden change where he lived transported with the sense and the joy of his possession it was terrible because she was unhappy because she was chained to duty and honour because ruin faced her and lastly because wade began to have the vague gloomy intimations of distant tragedy far off like a cloud on the horizon but there 
Long ago he had learned the uselessness of fighting his morbid visitations. But he clung to hope, to faith in life, to the victory of the virtuous, to the defeat of evil. A thousand proofs had strengthened him in that clinging. There were personal dread and poignant pain for Wade in Columbine Bellown's situation. After all, he had only his subtle and intuitive assurance that matters would turn out well for her in the end. To trust that now, when the shadow began to creep over his own daughter, seemed unwise, a juggling with chance. I'm beginning to feel that I couldn't let her marry that buster Jack, soliloquized Wade as he rode along the grassy trail. First off, seeing how strong was her sense of duty and loyalty, I wasn't so set against it. But something's growing in me. Her love for that crippled boy now and his for her. Lord, they're so young and life must be so hot and love so sweet. I reckon that's why I couldn't let her marry Jack. But on the other hand, there's the old man's faith in his son. And there's Collie's faith in herself and in life. Now I believe in that. And the years have proved to me there's hope for the worst of men. I haven't even had a talk with this Buster Jack. I don't know him, except by hearsay. And I'm sure prejudiced, which is no wonder, considering where I saw him in Denver. I reckon before I go any farther... I'd better meet this Bellhounds boy and see what's in him. It was characteristic of Wade that this soliloquy abruptly ended his thoughtful considerations for the time being. This was owing to the fact that he rested upon a decision, and also because it was time he began to attend to the object of his climb. Bench after bench he had ascended, and the higher he got, the denser and more numerous became the aspen thickets, and the more luxuriant the grass. Presently the long black slope of spruce confronted him, with its edge like a dark wall. He entered the fragrant forest where not a twig stirred, nor a sound pervaded the silence. Upon the soft matted earth the hoofs of the horses made no impression, and scarcely a perceptible thud. Wade headed to the left, avoiding rough, rocky defiles of weathered cliff and wind-fallen trees, and aimed to find easy going up to the summit of the mountain bluff far above. This was new forest to him, consisting of moderate-sized spruce trees growing so closely together that he had to go carefully to keep from snapping dead twigs. Fox trotted on in the lead, now and then pausing to look up at his master, as if for instructions. A brightening of the dark green gloom ahead showed the hunter that he was approaching a large glade or open patch where the sunlight fell strongly. It turned out to be a swale or swampy place, some few acres in extent, and directly at the foot of a last steep wooded slope. Here Fox put his nose into the air and halted. "'What are you scenting, Fox, old boy?' asked Wade with low voice as he peered ahead. The wind was in the wrong direction for him to approach close to game without being detected. Fox wagged his stumpy tail and looked up with knowing eyes. Wade proceeded cautiously. The swamp was a rank growth of long, weedy grasses and ferns, with here and there a green mossed bog, half hidden, and a number of dwarf oak trees. Wade's horse sank up to his knees in the mire, on the other side showed fresh tracks along the wet margin of the swale. "'It's elk, all right,' said Wade, as he dismounted. "'Heard us coming. Now, Fox, stick your nose in that track, and go slow.' With rifle ready, Wade began the ascent of the slope on foot, leading his horse. An old elk trail showed a fresh track. Fox accommodated his pace to that of the toiling hunter. The ascent was steep and led up through dense forest. At intervals, when Wade halted to catch his breath and listen, he heard faint snapping of dead branches far above. At length he reached the top of the mountain to find a wide open space with heavy forest in front and a bare, ghastly, burned-over district to his right. Fox growled and appeared about to dash forward. 
then in an opening through the forest wade espied a large bull elk standing at gaze evidently watching him he was a grey old bull with broken antlers wade made no move to shoot and presently the elk walked out of sight too old and tough fox explained the hunter to the anxious dog but perhaps that was not all wade's motive in sparing him once more mounted wade turned his attention to the burn district it was a dreary hideous splotch a blackened slash in the green cover of the mountain it sloped down into a wide hollow and up another bare slope the ground was littered with bleached logs trees that had been killed first by fire and then felled by wind here and there a lofty spectral trunk still withstood the blasts across the hollow sloped a considerable area where all trees were dead and still standing a melancholy sight beyond and far round and down to the left opened up a slope of spruce and bare ridge where a few cedars showed dark and then came black spear-tipped forest again leading the eye to the magnificent panorama of endless range on range purple in the distance wade found patches of grass where beds had been recently occupied mountain sheep by cracky exclaimed the hunter and fresh tracks too now i wonder if it wouldn't do to kill a sheep and tell bellounds i couldn't find any elk the hunter had no qualms about killing mountain sheep but he loved the lordly stags and would have lied to spare them he rode on with keen gaze shifting everywhere to catch a movement of something in this wilderness before him if there was any living animal in sight it did not move wade crossed the hollow wended a circuitous route through the upstanding forest of dead timber and entered a thick woods that skirted the rim of the mountain presently he came out upon the open rim from which the depths of green and grey yawned mightily far across old white slides loomed up higher now with a dignity and majesty unheralded from below wade found fresh sheep tracks in the yellow clay of the rim small as little deer tracks showing that they had just been made by ewes and lambs not a ram track in the group well that lets me out said wade as he peered under the bluff for sight of the sheep they had gone over the steep rim as if they had wings beats hell how sheep can go down without falling and how they can hide he knew they were near at hand and he wasted time peering to spy them out nevertheless he could not locate them fox waited impatiently for the word to let him prove how easily he could rout them out but this permission was not forthcoming we're hunting elk you jack of all dogs reprovingly spoke the hunter to fox so they went on around the rim and after a couple of miles of travel came to the forest and then open heads of hollows that widened and deepened down here was excellent pasture and cover for elk wade left the rim to ride down these slow descending half open ridges where cedars grew and jack pines stood in clumps and little grassy bordered brooks babbled between he saw tracks where a big buck deer had crossed ahead of him and then he flushed a covey of grouse that scared the horses and then he saw where a bear had pulled a rotten log to pieces fox did not show any interest in these things by and by wade descended to the junction of these hollows where three tiny brooklets united to form a stream of pure swift clear water perhaps a foot deep and several yards wide i reckon this is the head of the troublesome said wade whoever named this brook had no sense yet here at its source it's gathering trouble for itself that's the way of youth the grass grew thickly and luxuriantly and showed signs of recent grazing elk had been along the brook that morning there were many tracks like cow tracks only smaller deeper and more oval and there were beds where elk had lain and torn up places where bulls had ploughed and stamped with heavy hoofs fox trailed the herd to higher ground where evidently they had entered the woods 
Here Wade tied his horses, and whispering to Fox, he proceeded stealthily through this strip of spruce. He came out to an open point, taking care, however, to keep well screened, from which he had a glimpse of a park-like hollow, grassy and watered. Working round to better vantage, he soon espied what had made Fox stand so stiff and bristling. A herd of elk were trooping up the opposite slope, scarcely a hundred yards distant. They had heard or scented him, but did not appear alarmed. They halted to look back. The hunter's quick estimate credited nearly two dozen to the herd, mostly cows. A magnificent bull with wide-spreading antlers and black head and shoulders and grey hindquarters stalked out from the herd and stood an instant, head aloft, splendidly significant of the wild. Then he trotted into the woods, his antlers noiselessly spreading the green. Others trotted off likewise. Wade raised his rifle and looked through the sight at the bull and let him pass. Then he saw another over his rifle and another. Reluctant and forced, he at last aimed and pulled trigger. The heavy Henry boomed out in the stillness. Fox dashed down with eager barks. When the smoke cleared away, Wade saw the opposite slope bare except for one fallen elk. Then he returned to his horses and brought them back to where Fox perched beside the dead quarry. "'Well, Fox, that stag'll never bugle any more of a sunrise,' said Wade. "'Strange how we're made so we have to eat meat. I'd have liked it otherwise.' He cut up the elk and packed all the meat the horse could carry, and hung the best of what was left out of the reach of coyotes. Mounting once more, he ascended to the rim and found a slope leading down to the west. Over the basin country below he had hunted several days. This way back to the ranch was longer, he calculated, but less arduous for man and beast. His pack-horse would have hard enough going in any event. From time to time Wade halted to rest the burdened pack-animal. At length he came to a trail he had himself made, which he now proceeded to follow. It led out of the basin, through burned and boggy ground, and down upon the forest slope, thence to the grassy and aspened uplands. One aspen grove, where he had rested before, faced the west, and, for reasons hard to guess, had suffered little from frost. All the leaves were intact, some still green, but most of them a glorious gold against the blue. It was a large grove, sloping gently, carpeted with yellow grass and such a profusion of purple asters as Wade had never seen in his flower-loving life. Here he dismounted, and sat against an aspen tree. His horses ruthlessly cropped the purple blossoms. Nature, in her strong prodigality, had outdone herself here. Pale white the aspen trees shone, and above was the fluttering, quivering canopy of gold tinged with green, and below clustered the asters, thick as stars in the sky, waving, nodding, swaying gracefully to each little autumn breeze, lilac-hued and lavender and pale violet, and all the shades of exquisite purple. Wade lingered, his senses predominating. This was one of those moments that coloured his lonely wanderings. Only to see was enough. He would have shut out the encroaching thoughts of self, of others, of life, had that been wholly possible. But here, after the first few moments of exquisite riot of his senses, where fragrance of grass and blossom filled the air, and blaze of gold canopied the purple, he began to think how beautiful the earth was, how nature hid her rarest gifts for those who loved her most, how good it was to live if only for these blessings. And sadness crept into his meditations, because all this beauty was ephemeral, all the gold would soon be gone, and the asters, so pale and pure and purple, would soon be like the glory of a dream that had passed. Yet still followed the saving thought that frost and winter must again yield to sun, and spring, summer, autumn, would return with the flowers of their season, 
in that perennial birth so gracious and promising. The aspen leaves would quiver and slowly gild, the grass would wave in the wind, the asters would bloom, lifting star-pale faces to the sky. Next autumn and every year and for ever, as long as the sun warmed the earth, it was only man who would not always return to the haunts he loved. End of chapter 10「When Bent Wade desired opportunities, they seemed to gravitate to him. Upon riding into the yard of White Slides Ranch, he espied Jack Bellounds sitting in idle, moping posture on the porch. Something in his dejected appearance roused Wade's pity. No one else was in sight so the hunter took advantage of the moment. "'Hey, Bellounds, will you give me a lift with this meat?' called Wade. "'Sure,' replied Jack readily enough, and he got up. Wade led the pack-horse to the door of the store cabin, which stood back of the kitchen and was joined to it by a roof. There, with Jack's assistance, he unloaded the meat and hung it up on pegs. This done, Wade set to work with knife in hand. "'I reckon a little trimming will improve the looks of this carcass,' observed Wade. "'Wade, we never had any one round except Dad who could cut up a steer or elk,' said Jack. "'But you've got him beat. "'I'm pretty handy at most things.' "'Handy? I wish I could do just one thing as well as you. "'I can ride, but that's all. No one ever taught me anything. "'You're a young fellow yet, and you've time, if you only take kindly to learning.' I was past your age when I learned most I know. The hunter's voice and his look, and that fascination which subtly hid in his presence, for the first time seemed to find the response of interest in young Bellounds. I can't stick, Dad says, and he swears at me, replied Bellounds, but I'll bet I could learn from you. Reckon you could. Why can't you stick to anything? I don't know. I've been as enthusiastic over work as over riding mustangs. To ride came natural, but in work, when I do it wrong, then I hate it. Aha, uh -huh, that's too bad. You oughtn't to hate work. Hard work makes for what I reckon you like in a man, but don't understand. As I look back over my life, and let me say, young fella, it's been a tough one, what I remember most and feel best over are the hardest jobs I ever did and those that cost the most sweat and blood. As Wade warmed to his subject, hoping to sow a good seed in Bellown's mind, he saw that he was wasting his earnestness. Bellown's did not keep to the train of thought. His mind wandered, and now he was examining Wade's rifle. Old Henry forty four, he said. Dad has one. Also an old needle gun. Say, can I go hunting with you? Glad to have you. How do you handle a rifle? I used to shoot pretty well before I went to Denver, he replied. Haven't tried since I've been home. Suppose you let me take a shot at that post. And from where he stood in the door, he pointed to a big hitching post near the corral gate. The corral contained horses, and in the pasture beyond were cattle, any of which might be endangered by such a shot. Wade saw that the young man was in earnest, that he wanted to respond to the suggestion in his mind. Consequences of any kind did not awaken after the suggestion. Sure, go ahead. Shoot low now, a little below where you want to hit, said Wade. Bellounds took aim and fired. A thundering report shook the cabin. Dust and splinters flew from the post. I hit it, he exclaimed in delight. I was sure I wouldn't, because I aimed way under. Reckon you did. It was a good shot. Then a door slammed, and old Bill Bellounds appeared, his hair upstanding, his look and gait proclaiming him on the rampage. "'Jack, what in hell are you doing?' he roared, and he stamped up to the door to see his son standing there with the rifle in his hands. "'By heaven, if it ain't one thing, it's another!' "'Boss, don't jump over the traces,' said Wade. "'I'll allow if I'd known the gun would let out a bellow like that, I'd not have told Jack to shoot.' Reckon it's because we're under the open roof that it made the racket. 
I'm wanting to clean the gun while it's hot. Aha, uh -huh. well, I was scared first, harking back to Indian days, and then I was mad because I figured Jack was up to mischief. Did you fetch in the meat? You bet, and I'd like a piece for myself, replied Wade. Help yourself, man, and say, come down and eat with us for supper. Much obliged, boss, I sure will. Then the old rancher trudged back to the house. Wade, it was bully of you, exclaimed Jack gratefully. You see how quick Dad's ready to jump me. I'll bet he thought I'd picked a shooting scrape with one of the cowboys. Well, he's getting old and testy, replied Wade. You ought to humour him. He'll not be here always. Bellounds answered to that suggestion with a shadowing of eyes and look of realisation, affection, remorse. Feelings seemed to have a quick rise and play in him, but were not lasting. Wade casually studied him, weighing his impressions, holding them in abeyance for a sum of judgment. Bellans, has anybody told you about Wills Moore being bad hurt? abruptly asked the hunter. He is, is he? replied Jack, and to his voice and face came sudden change. How bad? I reckon he'll be a cripple for life answered wade seriously and now he stopped in his work to peer at bellounds the next moment might be critical for that young man club-footed he won't lord it over the cowboys any more or ride that white mustang the softer weaker expression of his face that which gave him some title to good looks changed to an ugliness hard for wade to define since it was neither glee nor joy nor gratification over his rival's misfortune. It was rush of blood to eyes and skin, a heated change that somehow to Wade suggested an anxious, selfish hunger. Bellounds lacked something, that seemed certain, but it remained to be proved how deserving he was of Wade's pity. Bellounds, it was a dirty trick, your jumping more, declared Wade with deliberation. The hell you say! Bellans flared up, with scarlet in his face, with sneer of amaze, with promise of bursting rage. He slammed down the gun. "'Yes, the hell I say,' returned the hunter. "'They call me Hellbent Wade.' "'Are you friends with Moore?' asked Bellans, beginning to shake. "'Yes, I'm that with everyone. I'd like to be friends with you.' "'I don't want you, and I'm giving you notice. You won't last long at White Slides.' Neither will you. Bellans turned dead white, not apparently from fury or fear, but from a shock that had its birth within the deep, mysterious, emotional reachings of his mind. He was utterly astounded, as if confronting a vague, terrible premonition of the future. Wade's swift words, like the ring of bells, had not been menacing, but prophetic. Young fella, you need to be talked to. So if you've got any sense at all, it'll get a wedge in your brain, went on Wade. I'm a stranger here, but I happen to be a man who sees through things, and I see how your dad handles you wrong. You don't know who I am and you don't care, but if you'll listen, you'll learn what might help you. No boy can answer to all his wild impulses without ruining himself. It's not natural. There are other people people who have wills and desires, same as you have. You've got to live with people. Here's your dad and Miss Columbine and the cowboys and me and all the ranchers, so down to Kremlin and other places. These are the people you've got to live with. You can't go on as you've begun without ruining yourself and your dad and the, the girl. It's never too late to begin to be better. I know that. But it gets too late sometimes to save the happiness of others. Now I see where you're heading, as clear as if I had pictures of the future. I've got a gift that way. And Bellounds, you'll not last. Unless you begin to control your temper, to forget yourself, to kill your wild impulses, to be kind, to learn what love is, you'll never last. In the very nature of things, one coming after another like your fights with Moore and your scaring of Pronto and your drinking at Kremlin and just now your roaring at me. It's in the very nature of life that going on so you'll sooner or later meet with hell. You've got to change, Bellounds. 
no halfway spoiled boy changing but the straight right about face of a man it means you must see you're no good and have a change of heart men have revolutions like that i was no good i did worse than you'll ever do because you're not big enough to be really bad and yet i've turned out worth living there i'm through and i'm offering to be your friend and to help you Bellown stood with arms spread outside the door, still astounded, still pale, but as the long admonition and appeal ended, he exploded stridently. Who the hell are you? If I hadn't been so surprised, if I'd had a chance to get a word in, I'd shut your trap. Are you a preacher masquerading here as hunter? Let me tell you, I won't be talked to like that, not by any man keep your advice and friendship to yourself you don't want me then no bellowns snapped reckon you don't need either advice or friend hey no you owl-eyed soft-voiced fool yelled bellowns it was then wade felt a singular and familiar sensation a cold creeping thing physical and elemental that had not visited him since he had been at white slides i reckoned so he said with low and gloomy voice and he knew if bellounds did not know that he was not acquiescing with the other's harsh epithet but only greeting the advent of something in himself bellounds shrugged his burly shoulders and slouched away wade finished his dressing of the meat then he rode up to spend an hour with moore when he returned to his cabin he proceeded to change his hunter garb for the best he owned it was a proof of his unusual preoccupation that he did this before he fed the hounds. It was sunset when he left his cabin. Montana Jim and Lem hailed as he went by. Wade paused to listen to their good-natured raillery. "'See here, Bent, this ain't Sunday,' said Lem. "'You're spruced up powerful fine. What's it for?' added Montana. "'Boss asked me down to supper.' "'Well, you lucky son of a gun!' "'And here we've no invite,' returned Lem. "'Say, Wade, I heard Buster Jack roaring at you. "'I was riding in by the storehouse. "'Who the hell are you?' was what collared my attention, "'and I had to laugh, and I listened to all he said. "'So you was offering him advice and friendship?' "'I reckon. "'Well, all I say is that you was wasting your breath,' declared Lem. "'You're a queer fellow, Wade.' "'Queer? Ah, oh, Lem, he ain't queer,' said Montana.' he's just white wade i feel the same as you i'd like to do something for that locoed buster jack montana you're the locoed one rejoined lem buster jack knows what he's doing he can play a slicker hand of poker than you well maybe wade do you play poker i'd hate to take your money replied wade you needn't be so all fired kind about that come over tonight and take some of it Buster Jack invited himself up to our bunk. He's itching for cards. So we says, sure. Blood's going to sit in. Now you come and make it five-handed. Wouldn't young Bellounds object to me? What, Buster Jack, shy at gambling with you? Not much. He's a born gambler. He'd bet with his grandmother, and he'd cheat the coppers off a dead nigger's eyes. Slick with cards, eh? inquired Wade. No, Jack's not slick, but he tries to be, and we just go him one slicker. Wouldn't old Bill object to this card playing? He'd be awry eyed but by golly, we're not leading Jack astray, and we ain't hankering to play with him. All the same, a little game is welcome enough. I'll come over, replied Wade, and thoughtfully turned away. When he presented himself at the ranch house, it was Columbine who let him in, she was prettily dressed in a way he had never seen her before, and his heart throbbed. Her smile, her voice, added to her nameless charm that seemed to come from the past. Her look was eager and longing, as if his presence might bring something welcome to her. Then the rancher stalked in. Hello, Wade. Supper's most ready. What's this trouble you had with Jack? He says he won't eat with you. I was offering him advice, replied Wade what on reckon on general principles <laughs> well he told me you harangued him till you was black in the face and 
Jack had it wrong. He got black in the face, interrupted Wade. Did you say he was a spoiled boy and that he was no good and was heading plumb for hell? That was a little of what I said, returned Wade gently. Uh-huh. How'd that come about? queried Bellounds gruffly. A slight stiffening and darkening overcast his face. Wade then recalled and recounted the remarks that had passed between him and Jack, and he did not think he missed them very far. He had a great curiosity to see how Bellounds would take them, and especially the young man's scornful rejection of a sincerely offered friendship. All the time Wade was talking, he was aware of Columbine watching him, and when he finished it was sweet to look at her. "'Wade, wasn't you taking a lot on yourself?' queried the rancher, plainly displeased. "'Reckon I was, but my conscience is beholden to no man. If Jack had met me halfway, that would have been better for him, and for me, because I get good out of helping anyone.' His reply silenced Bellounds. No more was said before supper was announced, and then the rancher seemed taciturn. Columbine did the serving, and most all of the talking. Wade felt strangely at ease. Some subtle difference was at work in him, transforming him, but the moment had not yet come for him to question himself. He enjoyed the supper, and when he ventured to look up at Columbine, to see her strong, capable hands and her warm blue glance, glad for his presence, sweetly expressive of their common secret and darker with a shadow of meaning beyond her power to guess then wade felt havoc within him the strife and pain and joy of the truth he never could reveal for he could never reveal his identity to her without betraying his baseness to her mother otherwise to hear her call him father would have been earning that happiness with a lie Besides, she loved Bellounds as her father, and were this trouble of the present removed, she would grow still closer to the old man in his declining days. Wade accepted the inevitable. She must never know. If she might love him, it must be as the stranger who came to her gates. It must be through the mysterious affinity between them, and through the service he meant to render. Wade did not linger after the meal was ended, despite the fact that Bellounds recovered his cordiality. It was dark when he went out. Columbine followed him, talking cheerfully. Once outside, she squeezed his hand and whispered, "'How's Wilson?' The hunter nodded his reply, and, pausing at the porch step, he pressed her hand to make his assurance stronger. His reward was instant. In the bright starlight, she stood white and eloquent, staring down at him with dark, wide eyes. Presently she whispered, "'Oh, my friend, it wants only three days till October first. "'Lass, it might be a thousand years for all you need worry,' he replied, his voice low and full. Then it seemed, as she flung up her arms, that she was about to embrace him, but her gesture was an appeal to the stars, to heaven above, for something she did not speak. Wade bade her good night and went his way. The cowboys and the rancher's son were about to engage in a game of poker when Wade entered the dimly lighted, smoke-hazed room. Montana Jim was sticking tallow candles in the middle of a rude table. Lem was searching his clothes, manifestly for money. Bloodsoe shuffled a greasy deck of cards and Jack Bellounds was filling his pipe before a fire of blazing logs on the hearth. Doggone it! I had more money than that, complained Lem. Jim, you rode to Kremlin last. Did you take my money? Well, come to think of it, I reckon I did, replied Jim, in surprise at the recollection. And where's it now? Pard, I ain't no idea. I reckon it's still in Kremlin. But I'll pay you back. I should smile you, Will. Pony up now. Bent Wade, did you come over calculated to get skinned? queried Bloodsoe. Boys, I was playing poker tolerable well in Missouri when you all was nursing, replied Wade imperturbably. I heard he was a card sharp, said Jim. Well, grab a box or a chair to set on and let's start. Come along, Jack. You don't look as keen to play as usual. 
Lalande stood with his back to the fire, and his manner did not compare favourably with that of the genial cowboys. "'I prefer to play four-handed,' he said. This declaration caused a little check in the conversation, and put an end to the amiability. The cowboys looked at one another, not embarrassed, but just a little taken aback, as if they had forgotten something that they should have remembered. "'You object to my playing?' asked Wade quietly. "'I certainly do,' replied Bellounds. "'Why, may I ask?' "'For all I know, what Montana said about you may be true,' returned Bellounds insolently. Such a remark, flung in the face of a Westerner, was an insult. The cowboys suddenly grew stiff, with steady eyes on Wade. He, however, did not change in the slightest. "'I might be a card sharp at that,' he replied coolly. "'You fellows play without me. I'm not caring about poker any more. I'll look on.' Thus he carried over the moment that might have been dangerous. Lem gaped at him. Montana kicked a box forward to sit upon, and his action was expressive. Bloodsoe slammed the cards down on the table, and favoured Wade with a comprehending look. Bellans pulled a chair up to the table. "'What'll we make the limit?' asked Jim. Two bits,' replied Lem quickly. Then began an argument. Bellans was for a dollar limit. The cowboys objected. "'Why, Jack, if the old man got on to us playing a dollar limit, he'd fire the outfit,' protested Bloodsoe. This reasonable objection in no wise influenced the old man's son. He overruled the good arguments and then hinted at the cowboy's lack of nerve. The fun faded out of their faces. Lem, in fact, grew red. "'Well, if we're a-going to gamble, that's different,' he said, with a cold ring in his voice, as he straddled a box and sat down. "'Wade, lend me some money.' Wade slipped his hand into his pocket, and drew forth a goodly handful of gold, which he handed to the cowboy. Not improbably, if this large amount had been shown earlier, before the change in the sentiment, Lem would have looked aghast and begged for mercy. As it was, he accepted it as if he were accustomed to borrowing that much every day. Bellounds had rendered futile the easy-going, friendly advances of the cowboys, as he had made it impossible to play a jolly little game for fun. The game began, with Wade standing up, looking on. These boys did not know what a vast store of poker knowledge lay back of Wade's inscrutable eyes. As a boy, he had learned the intricacies of poker in the country where it originated, and as a man, he had played it with piles of yellow coins and guns on the table. His eagerness to look on here, as far as the cowboys were concerned, was mere pretense. In Bellown's case, however, he had a profound interest. Rumours had drifted to him from time to time, since his advent at White Slides, regarding Bellown's weakness for gambling. It might have been cowboy gossip. Wade held that there was nothing in the West as well calculated to test a boy to prove his real character as a game of poker. Bellounds was a feverish better, an exultant winner, a poor loser. His understanding of the game was rudimentary. With him, the strong feeling beginning to be manifested to Wade was not the fun of matching wits and luck with his antagonists, nor a desire to accumulate money, for his recklessness disproved that, but the liberation of the gambling passion. Wade recognised that when he met it, and Jack Bellounds was not in any sense big. He was selfish and grasping in the numberless little ways common to the game, and positive about his own rights, while doubtful of the claims of others. His cheating was clumsy and crude, he held out cards, hiding them in his palm. He shuffled the deck so he left aces at the bottom, and these he would slip off to himself, and he was so blind that he could not detect his fellow player in tricks as transparent as his own. Wade was amazed and disgusted. The pity he had felt for Bellounds shifted to the old father, who believed in his son with stubborn and unquenchable faith. "'Haven't you got something to drink?' Jack asked of his companions. "'Nope. Where'd we get it?' replied Jim. Bellounds evidently forgot, for presently he repeated the query. The cowboys shook their heads. Wade knew they were lying, for they did have liquor in the cabin. 
It occurred to him then to offer to go to his own cabin for some, just to see what this young man would say. But he refrained. The luck went against Bellounds, and so did the gambling. He was not a lamb among wolves by any means, but the fleecing he got suggested that. According to Wade, he was getting what he deserved. No cowboys, even such good-natured and fine fellows as these, could be expected to be subjects for Bellown's cupidity, and they won all he had. "'I'll borrow,' he said, with feverish impatience. His face was pale, clammy, yet heated, especially round the swollen bruises. His eyes stood out, bold, dark, rolling and glaring, full of sullen fire. But more than anything else, his mouth betrayed the weakling, the born gambler, the self-centred, spoiled, intolerant youth. It was here his bad blood showed. "'Well, I ain't lending money,' replied Lem, as he assorted his winnings. "'Wade, here's what you staked me, and much obliged.' "'I'm out, and I can't lend you any,' said Jim. Bloodsoe had a good share of the profits of that quick game, but he made no move to lend any of it. Bellounds glared impatiently at them. "'Hell, you took my money. I'll have satisfaction,' he broke out, almost shouting. "'We won it, didn't we?' rejoined Lem, cool and easy. "'And you can have all the satisfaction you want, right now or any time.' Wade held out a handful of money to Bellounds. "'Here,' he said, with his deep eyes gleaming in the dim room. Wade had made a gamble with himself and it was that Bellounds would not even hesitate to take money. "'Come on, you stingy cowpunchers!' he called out, snatching the money from Wade. His action then, violent and vivid as it was, did not reveal any more than his face. But the cowboys showed amaze and something more. They fell straightway to gambling, sharper and fiercer than before, actuated now by the flaming spirit of this son of Bellounds. Luck misleading and alluring, favoured Jack for a while, transforming him until he was radiant, boastful, exultant. Then it changed, as did his expression. His face grew dark. "'I tell you, I want drink,' he suddenly demanded. "'I know damn well you cowpunchers have some here, for I smelled it when I came in.' "'Jack, we drank the last drop,' replied Jim, who seemed less stiff than his two bunkmates. "'I've some very old rye,' interposed Wade, looking at Jim, but apparently addressing all. "'Fine stuff, but awful strong and hot. Makes a fellow's blood dance. "'Go get it!' Bellown's utterance was thick and full, as if he had something in his mouth. Wade looked down into the heated face, into the burning eyes, and through the darkness of passion that brooked no interference with its fruition, he saw this youth's dark and naked soul. Wade had seen into the depths of many such abysses. "'See here, Wade,' broke in Jim with his quiet force. "'Never mind fetching that red-hot rye tonight. "'Some other time, maybe, when Jack wants more satisfaction. "'Reckon we've got a drop or so left.' "'All right, boys,' replied Wade. "'I'll be saying good night.' He left them playing and strode out to return to his cabin. The night was still cold, starlit, and black in the shadows. A lonesome coyote barked, to be answered by a wakeful hound. Wade halted at his porch and lingered there a moment, peering up at the grey old peak, bare and star-crowned. "'I'm sorry for the old man,' muttered the hunter, "'but I'd see Jack Bellounds in hell before I'd let Columbine marry him.' October 1st was a holiday at White Slides Ranch, it happened to be a glorious autumn day, with the sunlight streaming gold and amber over the grassy slopes. Far off the purple ranges loomed hauntingly. Wade had come down from Wilson Moore's cabin, his ears ringing with the crippled boy's words of poignant fear. Fox favoured his master with unusually knowing gaze. There was not going to be any lion chasing or elk hunting this day. Something was in the wind and Fox, as a privileged dog, manifested his interest and wonder. Before noon, a buckboard with team of sweating horses halted in the yard of the ranch house. Besides the driver, it contained two women, whom Bellounds greeted as relatives, and a stranger, a pale man, 
whose dark garb proclaimed him a minister. "'Come right in, folks,' welcomed Bellounds with hearty excitement. It was Wade who showed the driver where to put the horses. Strangely, not a cowboy was in sight, an omission of duty the rancher had noted. Wade might have informed him where they were. The door of the big living room stood open, and from it came the sound of laughter and voices. Wade, who had returned to his seat on the end of the porch, listened to them, while his keen gaze seemed fixed down the lane toward the cabins. How intent must he have been not to hear Columbine's step behind him. "'Good morning, Ben,' she said. Wade wheeled as if internal violence had ordered his movement. "'Lass, good morning,' he replied. "'You sure look sweet this October first, like the flower for which you're named.' "'My friend, it is October 1st, my marriage day,' murmured Columbine. Wade felt her intensity, and he thrilled to the brave, sweet resignation of her face. Hope and faith were unquenchable in her, yet she had fortified herself to the wreck of dreams and love. "'I'd seen you before now, but I had some job with Wills, persuading him that we'd not have to offer you congratulations yet a while,' replied wade in his slow gentle voice oh breathed columbine wade saw her full breast swell and the leaping blood wave over her pale face she bent to him to see his eyes and for wade when she peered with straining heart and soul all at once to become transfigured that instant was a sweet and all-fulfilling reward for his years of pain you drive me mad she whispered the heavy tread of the rancher like the last of successive steps of fate in wade's tragic expectancy sounded on the porch well lass here you are he said with a gladness deep in his voice now where's the boy dad i've not seen jack since breakfast replied columbine tremulously "'Sort of a laggard in love on his wedding day,' rejoined the rancher. "'His gladness and forgetfulness were as big as his heart. "'Wade, have you seen Jack?' "'No, I haven't,' replied the hunter, with slow, long-drawn utterance. "'But I see him now.' "'Wade pointed to the figure of Jack Bellands approaching from the direction of the cabins. "'He was not walking straight.' old man bellounds shot out his grey head like a striking eagle what the hell he muttered as if bewildered at this strange uneven gait of his son wade what's the matter with jack wade did not reply that moment had its sorrow for him as well as understanding of the wonder expressed by columbine's cold little hand trembling in his the rancher suddenly recoiled so help me god he's drunk he gasped in a distress that unmanned him then the parson and the invited relatives came out upon the porch with gay voices and laughter that suddenly stilled when old bellounds cried brokenly lass go in the house but columbine did not move and wade felt her shaking as she leaned against him the bridegroom approached drunk indeed he was not hilariously, as one who celebrated his good fortune, but sullenly, tragically, hideously drunk. Old Bellounds leaped off the porch. His grey hair stood up like the mane of a lion. Like a giant's were his strides. With a lunge he met his reeling son, swinging a huge fist into the sodden red face. Limply Jack fell to the ground. "'Lay there, you damned prodigal he roared terrible in his rage you disgrace me and you disgrace the girl who's been a daughter to me if you ever have another wedding day it'll not be me who sets it end of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. November was well advanced before there came indications that winter was near at hand. 
One morning, when Wade rode up to Moore's cabin, the whole world seemed obscured in a dense grey fog, through which he could not see a rod ahead of him. Later, as he left, the fog had lifted shoulder-high to the mountains, and was breaking to let the blue sky show. Another morning it was worse, and apparently thicker and greyer. As Wade climbed the trail up toward the mountain basin, where he hunted most these days, he expected the fog to lift, but it did not. The trail under the hoofs of the horse was scarcely perceptible to him, and he seemed lost in a dense, grey, soundless obscurity. Suddenly Wade emerged from out the fog into brilliant sunshine. In a maze he halted. This phenomenon was new to him. He was high up on the mountainside, the summit of which rose clear-cut and bold into the sky. Below him spread what resembled a white sea. It was an immense cloud-bank, filling all the valleys as if with creamy foam or snow, soft, thick, motionless, contrasting vividly with the blue sky above. Old white slides stood out, grey and bleak and brilliant, as if it were an island rock in a rolling sea of fleece. Far across this strange level cloud floor rose the black line of the range. Wade watched the scene with a kind of rapture. He was alone on the heights. There was not a sound. The winds were stilled. But there seemed a mighty being awake all around him, in the presence of which Wade felt how little were his sorrows and hopes. Another day brought dull grey scudding clouds, and gusts of wind, and squalls of rain, and a wailing through the bare aspens. It grew colder and bleaker and darker. Rain changed to sleet, and sleet to snow. That night brought winter. Next morning, when Wade plodded up to Moore's cabin, it was through two feet of snow. A beautiful, glistening white mantle covered valley and slope and mountain, transforming all into a world too dazzlingly brilliant for the unprotected gaze of man. When Wade pushed open the door of the cabin and entered, he awakened the cowboy. "'Morning, Wills,' drawled Wade, as he slapped the snow from boots and legs. "'Summer has gone, winter has come, and the flowers lay in their graves. How are you, boy?' Moore had grown paler and thinner during his long confinement in bed. A weary shade shone in his face, and a shadow of pain in his eyes, but the spirit of his smile was the same as always. "'Hello, Bent, old pard,' replied Moore. "'I guess I'm fine. Nearly froze last night. Didn't sleep much.' "'Well, I was worried about that,' said the hunter. "'We've got to arrange things somehow. I heard it snowing. Gee, how the wind howled. And I'm snowed in?' "'Sure are. Two feet on a level. It's good I snaked down a lot of firewood. Now I'll set to work and cut it up and stack it round the cabin. Reckon I'd better sleep up here with you, Wills. Won't old Bill make a kick? Let him kick. But I reckon he doesn't need to know anything about it. It is cold in here. Well, I'll soon warm it up. Here's some letters Lem got at Kremlin the other day. You read while I rustle some grub for you. Moore scanned the addresses on the several envelopes and sighed. From home. I hate to read them. Why? queried Wade. Oh, because when I wrote, I didn't tell them I was hurt. I feel like a liar. It's just as well, Wills, because you swear you'll not go home. Me? I should smile not. Bent, I... I hoped Collie might answer the note you took her from me. Not yet. Wills, give the last time. Time? Heavens, it's three weeks and more. Go ahead and read your letters, or I'll knock you on the head with one of these chunks, ordered Wade mildly. The hunter soon had the room warm and cheerful, with steaming breakfast on the red-hot coals. Presently, when he made ready to serve more, he was surprised to find the boy crying over one of the letters. Wills, what's the trouble? he asked. Oh, nothing. I... I just feel bad, that's all, replied Moore. Uh-huh, so it seems. Well, tell me about it. Pard, my father 
has forgiven me. The old son of a gun. Good. What for? You never told me you'd done anything. I know, but I did do a lot. I was sixteen then. We quarrelled, and I ran off up here to punch cows. But after a while I wrote home to mother and my sister. Since then they've tried to coax me to come home. This letter's from the old man himself. Gee... Well, he says he's had to knuckle, that he's ready to forgive me, but I must come home and take charge of his ranch. Isn't that great? Only I can't go. And I couldn't... I couldn't ever ride a horse again if I did go. Who says you couldn't? queried Wade. I never said so. I only said you'd never be a bronco-bustin' cowboy again. Well, suppose you're not. You'll be able to ride a little if I can save that leg. Boy, your letter is damn good news. I'm sure glad. That will make Collie happy. The cowboy had a better appetite that morning, which fact mitigated somewhat the burden of Wade's worry. There was burden enough, however, and Wade had set this day to make important decisions about Moore's injured foot. He had dreaded to remove the last dressing, because conditions at that time had been unimproved. He had done all he could to ward off the threatened gangrene. "'Wills, I'm going to look at your foot and tell you things,' declared Wade, when the dreaded time could be put off no longer. "'Go ahead. And, Pard, if you say my leg has to be cut off, why, just pass me my gun.' The cowboy's voice was gay and bantering, but his eyes were alight with a spirit that frightened the hunter. "'Aha.' Uh -huh. I know how you feel, but, boy, I'd rather live with one leg and be loved by Collie Bellounds than have nine legs for some other lass. Wilson Moore groaned his helplessness. Damn you, Bent Wade. You always say what kills me. Of course I would. Well, lie quiet now and let me look at this poor messed up foot. Wade's deft fingers did not work with the usual precision and speed natural to them. But at last Moore's injured member lay bare, discoloured, and misshapen. The first glance made the hunter quicker in his movements, closer in his scrutiny. Then he yelled his joy. Boy, it's better! No sign of gangrene. We'll save your leg. Pard, I never feared I'd lose that. All I have feared was that I'd be club-footed. Let me look, replied the cowboy and he raised himself on his elbow. Wade lifted the unsightly foot. "'My God, it's crooked!' cried Moore passionately. "'Wade! It's healed! It'll stay that way, always! I can't move it! Oh, but Buster Jack's ruined me!' The hunter pushed him back with gentle hands. "'Wills, it might have been worse.' "'But I never gave up hope,' replied Moore in poignant grief. "'I couldn't!' But now, how can you look at that, that club foot and not swear? Well, well, boy, cussing won't do any good. Now lay still and let me work. You've had lots of good news this morning, so I think you can stand to hear a little bad news. What? Bad news? queried Moore with a start. I reckon. Now listen. The reason Collie hasn't answered your note is because she's been sick in bed for three weeks. Oh, no! exclaimed the cowboy in amaze and distress. Yes, and I'm her doctor, replied Wade with pride. First off, they had Mrs. Andrews, and Collie kept asking for me. She was out of her head, you know. As soon as I took charge, she got better. Heavens! Collie ill, and you never told me, cried Moore. I can't believe it. She's so healthy and strong. What ailed her, Bent? Well, Mrs. Andrews said it was nervous breakdown, and old Bill was afraid of consumption, and Jack Bellowns swore she was only shamming. The cowboy cursed violently. Here, I won't tell you any more if you're going to cuss that way and jerk around, protested Wade. I, I'll shut up, appealed Moore. Well, that puddin'-head Jack is more than you called him, if you care to hear my opinion. Now, Wills, the fact is that none of them know what ails Collie, but I know. She'd been under a high strain leading up to October 1st, and the way that wedding day turned out 
with old Bill layin' Jack cold, and with no marriage at all, why, Collie had a shock. And after that she seemed pale and tired all the time, and she didn't eat right. Well, when Buster Jack got over that awful punch he'd got from the old man, he made up to Collie harder than ever. She didn't tell me then, but I saw it. And she couldn't avoid him, except by staying in her room, which she did a good deal. Then Jack showed a streak of being decent. He surprised everybody, even Collie. He delighted old Bill, but he didn't pull the wool over my eyes. He was like a boy spoiling for a new toy, and he got crazy over Collie. He's sure terribly in love with her, and for days he behaved himself in a way calculated to make up for his drinking too much. It shows he can behave himself when he wants to. I mean, he can control his temper and impulse. Anyway, he made himself so good that old Bill changed his mind, after what he swore that day, and set another day for the wedding. Right off, then, Collie goes down on her back. They didn't send for me very soon, but when I did get to see her, and felt the way she grabbed me, as if she was drowning, then I knew what ailed her. It was love. Love? gasped Moore, breathlessly. Sure, just love for a doggone lucky cowboy named Wills Moore. Her heart was breaking, and she'd have died but for me. Don't imagine, Wills, that people can't die of broken hearts. They do, I know. Well, all Collie needed was me, and I cured her raving and made her eat, and now she's coming along fine. Wade, I've believed in heaven since you came down to White Slides, burst out Moore with shining eyes. But tell me, what did you tell her? Well, my particular medicine first off was to whisper in her ear that she'd never have to marry Jack Bellounds, and after that I gave her daily doses of talk about you. Pard, she loves me still, he whispered. Wills, hers is the kind that grows stronger with time. I know. Moore strained in his intensity of emotion, and he clenched his fists and gritted his teeth. Oh, God, this is hard on me, he cried. I'm a man. I love that girl more than life. And to know she's suffering for love of me, for fear of that marriage being forced upon her, to know that while I lie here a helpless cripple, it's almost unbearable. Boy, you've got to mend now. We've the best of hope now. For you, for her, for everything. Wade, I think I love you too, said the cowboy. You're saving me from madness. Somehow I have faith in you to do whatever you want. But how could you tell Collie she'd never have to marry Buster Jack? because I know she never will, replied Wade, with his slow, gentle smile. You know that? Sure. How on earth can you prevent it? Bellounds will never give up planning that marriage for his son. Jack will nag Collie till she can't call her soul her own. Between them, they will wear her down. My friend, how can you prevent it? Wills, fact is, I haven't reckoned out how I'm going to save Collie, but that's no matter. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I will do it. You can gamble on me, Wills. You must use that hope and faith to help you get well, for we mustn't forget that you're in more danger than Collie. I will gamble on you, my life, my very soul, replied Moore fervently. By heaven, I'll be the man I might have been. I'll rise out of despair. I'll even reconcile myself to being a cripple. And, Wills, will you rise above hate? asked Wade softly. Hate? Hate of whom? Jack Bellounds. The cowboy stared, and his lean, pale face contracted. Pa, you wouldn't, you couldn't expect me to, to forgive him. No, I reckon not. But you needn't hate him. I don't, and I reckon I've some reason, more than you could guess. Will's hate is a poison in the blood. It's worse for him who feels it than for him against whom it rages. I know. Well, if you put thought of Jack out of your mind, quit brooding over what he did to you, and realise that he's not to blame, you'll overcome your hate. For the son of old Bill is to be pitied. 
"'Yes, Jack Bellounds needs pity. "'He was ruined before he was born. "'He never should have been born. "'And I want you to understand that and stop hating him. "'Will you try?' "'Wade, you're afraid I'll kill him,' whispered Moore. "'Sure, that's it. "'I'm afraid you might. "'And consider how hard that would be for Columbine. "'She and Jack were raised sister and brother almost. "'It would be hard on her.' You see, Collie has a strange and powerful sense of duty to old Bill. If you killed Jack, it would likely kill the old man, and Collie would suffer all her life. You couldn't cure her of that. You want her to be happy. I do, I do. Wade, I swear I'll never kill Buster Jack. And for Collie's sake, I'll try not to hate him. Well, that's fine. I'm sure glad to hear you promise that. Now I'll go out and chop some wood. We mustn't let the fire go out any more. Pard, I'll write another note, a letter to Collie. Hand me the blank book there, and my pencil, and don't hurry with the wood. Wade went outdoors with his two-bladed axe and shovel. The wood pile was a great mound of snow. He cleaned a wide space and a path to the side of the cabin. Working in snow was not unpleasant for him. He liked the cleanness, the whiteness, the absolute purity of new-fallen snow. The air was crisp and nipping. The frost crackled under his feet. The smoke from his pipe seemed no thicker than the steam from his breath. The axe rang on the hard aspens. Wade swung this implement like a born woodsman. The chips flew and the dead wood smelled sweet. Some logs he chopped into three-foot pieces. Others he chopped and split. When he tired a little of swinging the axe, he carried the cut pieces to the cabin and stacked them near the door. Now and then he would halt a moment to gaze away across the whitened slopes and rolling hills. The sense of his physical power matched something within, and his heart warmed with more than the vigorous exercise. When he had worked thus for about two hours and had stacked a pile of wood almost as large as the cabin, he considered it sufficient for the day. So he went indoors. Moore was so busily and earnestly writing that he did not hear Wade come in. His face wore an eloquent glow. "'Say, Wills, are you writing a book?' he inquired. "'Hello. Sure I am. But I'm most done now. If Columbine doesn't answer this... "'By the way, I'll have two letters to give her then, for I never gave her the first one,' replied Wade. "'You son of a gun!' "'Well, hurry along, boy. I'll be going now. "'Here's a pole I've fetched in. "'You keep it there where you can reach it, "'and when the fire needs more wood, "'you roll one of these logs on. "'I'll be up tonight before dark, "'and if I don't fetch you a letter, "'it'll be because I can't persuade Collie to write. "'Pard, if you bring me a letter, I'll obey you. "'I'll lie still. I'll sleep. I'll stand anything.' "'Aha, uh -huh. then I'll fetch one,' replied Wade, "'as he took the little book.' and deposited it in his pocket. Goodbye now, and think of your good news that come with the snow. Goodbye, heaven-sent hell-bent Wade, called Moore. It's no joke of a name any more. It's a fact. Wade plodded down through the deep snow, stepping in his old tracks, and as he toiled on, his thoughts were deep and comforting. He was thinking that if he had his life to live over again, he would begin at once to find happiness in other people's happiness. Upon arriving at his cabin, he set to work cleaning a path to the dog corral. The snow had drifted there, and he had no easy task. It was well that he had built an enclosed house for the hounds to winter in. Such a heavy snow as this one would put an end to hunting for the time being. The ranch had ample supply of deer, bear and elk meat, all solidly frozen this morning, that would surely keep well until used. Wade reflected that his tasks round the ranch would be feeding hounds and stock, chopping wood, and doing such chores as came along in winter time. The pack of hounds, which he had thinned out to a smaller number, would be a care on his hands. Cain had become a much prized possession of Columbine's, and lived at the house, where he had things his own way, and always greeted Wade with a look of disdain and distrust, Cain would never forgive the hand that had hurt him. Samson and Jim and Fox, of course, shared Wade's cabin, 
and vociferously announced his return. Early in the afternoon, Wade went down to the ranch house. The snow was not so deep there, having blown considerably in the open places. Someone was pounding iron in the blacksmith shop. Horses were cavorting in the corrals. Cattle were bawling round the hayricks in the barnyard. The hunter knocked on Columbine's door. "'Come in,' she called. Wade entered to find her alone. She was sitting up in bed, propped up with pillows, and she wore a warm woolly jacket or dressing gown. Her paleness was now marked, and the shadows under her eyes made them appear large and mournful. "'Ben, Wade, you don't care for me any more,' she exclaimed reproachfully. "'Why not, lass?' he asked. "'You were so long in coming,' she replied, now with petulance. "'I guess now I don't want you at all.' Uh huh. that's the reward of people who worry and work for others. Well then, I reckon I'll go back and not give you what I brought. He made a pretense of leaving, and he put a hand to his pocket, as if to ensure the safety of some article. Columbine blushed. She held out her hands. She was repentant of her words, and curious as to his. Why, Ben Wade, I count the minutes before you come, she said. What did you bring me? Who's been in here? he asked, going forward. That's a poor fire. I'll have to fix it. Mrs. Andrews just left. It was good of her to drive up. She came in the sled, she said. Oh, Ben, it's winter. There was snow on my bed when I woke up. I think I am better today. Jack hasn't been in here yet. At this, Wade laughed, and Columbine followed suit. Well, you look a little sassy today, which I take is a good sign, said Wade. I've got some news that will come near to making you well. Oh, tell it quick, she cried. Wills won't lose his leg. It's getting well. And there was a letter from his father, forgiving him for something he never told me. My prayers were answered, whispered Columbine, and she closed her eyes tight. And his father wants him to come home to run the ranch, went on Wade. Oh, her eyes popped open with sudden fright. But he can't, he won't go. I reckon not. He wouldn't if he could. But some day he will, and take you home with him. Columbine covered her face with her hands, and was silent a moment. Such prophecies, they, they, she could not conclude. Uh-huh, I know. The strange fact is, lass, that they all come true. I wish I had all happy ones, instead of them black croaking ones that come like ravens. Well, you're better today. Yes, oh yes. Ben, what have you got for me? You're in an awful hurry. I want to talk to you. And if I show what I've got, then there'll be no talking. You say Jack hasn't been in today? Not yet, thank goodness. How about old Bill? Ben, you never call him my dad. I wish you would. When you don't, it always reminds me that he's really not my dad. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, well, replied Wade, with his head bowed. It is just queer I can never remember. And how was he today? For a wonder, he didn't mention poor me. He was full of talk about going to Kremling. Means to take Jack along. Do you know, Ben, Dad can't fool me. He's afraid to leave Jack here alone with me. So Dad talked a lot about selling stock and buying supplies and how he needed Jack to go and so forth. I'm mighty glad he means to take him. But my, won't Jack be sore? I reckon it's time he broke out. And now, dear Ben, what have you got for me? I know it's from Wilson, she coaxed. Lass, would you give much for a little note from Wills? asked Wade teasingly. Would I, when I've been hoping and praying for just that? Well, if you'd give so much for a note, how much would you give me for a whole bookful that took Wills two hours to write? Ben, oh, I'd, I'd give, she cried wild with delight. I'd kiss you. You mean it, he queried, waving the book aloft. Mean it? Come here. There was fun in this for Wade but also a deep and beautiful emotion that quivered through him. Bending over her, he placed the little book in her hand. He did not see clearly then, as she pulled him lower and kissed him on the cheek, generously, with sweet, frank gratitude and affection. 
moments strong and all satisfying had been multiplying for bent wade of late but this one magnified all as he sat back upon the chair he seemed a little husky of voice well well and so you kissed ugly old bent wade yes and i've wanted to do it before she retorted the dark excitation in her eyes the flush of her pale cheeks made her beautiful then lass now you read your letter and answer it you can tear out the pages i'll sit here and be making out to be reading aloud out of this book here if any one happens in sudden like oh how you think of everything the hunter sat beside her pretending to be occupied with the book he had taken from the table when really he was stealing glances at her face indeed she was more than pretty then illness and pain had enhanced the sweetness of her expression as she read on it was manifest that she had forgotten the hunter's presence she grew pink rosy scarlet radiant and wade thrilled with her as she thrilled loved her more and more as she loved moore must have written words of enchantment wade's hungry heart suffered a pang of jealousy but would not harbour it he read in her perusal of that letter what no other dreamed of not even the girl herself and it was certitude of tragic and brief life for her if she could not live for wilson moore those moments of watching her were unutterably precious to wade he saw how some divine guidance had directed his footsteps to this home how many years had it taken him to get there columbine read and read and re-read a girl with her first love letter and for wade with his keen eyes that seemed to see the senses and the soul there shone something infinite through her rapture never until that unguarded moment had he divined her innocence nor had any conception been given him of the exquisite torture of her maiden fears or the havoc of love fighting for itself he learned then much of the mystery and meaning of a woman's heart end of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of The Mysterious Rider by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dear Wilson, the note and letter from you have taken my breath away. I couldn't tell, I wouldn't dare tell, how they made me feel. Your good news fills me with joy. And when Ben told me you wouldn't lose your leg, that you would get well, then my eyes filled and my heart choked me and I thanked God who'd answered my prayers. After all the heartache and dread, it's so wonderful to find things not so terrible as they seemed. Oh, I am thankful. You have only to take care of yourself now, to lie patiently and wait, and obey Ben, and soon the time will have flown by, and you will be well again. Maybe after all your foot will not be so bad. Maybe you can ride again, if not so wonderfully as before, then well enough to ride on your father's range and look after his stock. For, Wilson, dear, you'll have to go home. It's your duty. Your father must be getting old now. He needs you. He has forgiven you, you bad boy. And you are very lucky. It almost kills me to think of your leaving white slides. But that is selfish. I'm going to learn to be like Ben Wade. He never thinks of himself. Rest assured, Wilson, that I will never marry Jack Bellounds. It seems years since that awful October 1st. I gave my word then, and I would have lived up to it. But I've changed. I'm older. I see things differently. I love Dad as well. I feel as sorry for Jack Bellounds. I still think I might help him. I still believe in my duty to his father, but I can't marry him. It would be a sin. I have no right to marry a man whom I do not love. When it comes to thought of his touching me, then I hate him. Duty toward Dad is one thing, and I hold it high, but that is not reason enough for a woman to give herself. Some duty to myself is higher than that. 
It's hard for me to tell you, for me to understand. Love of you has opened my eyes. Still, I don't think it's love of you that makes me selfish. I'm true to something in me that I never knew before. I could marry Jack, loving you, and utterly sacrifice myself, if it were right. But it would be wrong. I never realised this until you kissed me. Since then, the thought of anything that approaches personal relations, any hint of intimacy with Jack, fills me with disgust. So, I'm not engaged to Jack Bellounds, and I'm never going to be. There will be trouble here. I feel it. I see it coming. Dad keeps at me persistently. He grows older. I don't think he's failing, but then there's a loss of memory and an almost childish obsession in regard to the marriage he has set his heart on. Then his passion for Jack seems greater as he learns, little by little, that Jack is not all he might be. Wilson, I give you my word. I believe if Dad ever really sees Jack as I see him, or you see him, then something dreadful will happen. In spite of everything, Dad still believes in Jack. It's beautiful and terrible. That's one reason why I've wanted to help Jack. Well, it's not to be. Every day, every hour, Jack Bellounds grows farther from me. He and his father will try to persuade me to consent to this marriage. They may even try to force me. But in that way, I'll be as hard and as cold as old white slides. No, never. For the rest, I'll do my duty to Dad. I'll stick to him. I could not engage myself to you, no matter how much I love you. And that's more every minute. So don't mention taking me to your home. Don't ask me again. Please, Wilson, your asking shook my very soul. Oh, how sweet that would be. Your wife. But if Dad turns me away, I don't think he would. Yet he's so strange and like iron for all concerning Jack. If ever he turned me out, I'd have no home. I'm a waif, you know. Then... Then, Wilson, oh, it's horrible to be in the position I'm in. I won't say any more. You'll understand, dear. It's your love that awoke me, and it's Ben Wade who has saved me. Wilson, I love him almost as I do Dad, only strangely. Do you know, I believe he had something to do with Jack getting drunk that awful October 1st. I don't mean Ben would stoop to get Jack drunk, but he might have cunningly put that opportunity in Jack's way. Drink is Jack's weakness, as gambling is his passion. Well, I know that the liquor was some fine old stuff which Ben gave to the cowboys, and it's significant now how Jack avoids Ben. He hates him. He's afraid of him. He's jealous because Ben is so much with me. I've heard Jack rave to Dad about this, but Dad is just to others if he can't be to his son. And so I want you to know that it's Ben Wade who has saved me. Since I've been sick, I've learned more of Ben. He's like a woman. He understands. I never have to tell him anything. You, Wilson, were sometimes stupid or stubborn, forgive me, about little things that girls feel but can't explain. Ben knows. I tell you this because I want you to understand how and why I love him. I think I love him most for his goodness to you. Dear boy, if I hadn't loved you before Ben Wade came, I'd have fallen in love with you since, just listening to his talk of you. But this will make you conceited. So I'll go on about Ben. He's our friend. Why, Wilson, that sweetness, softness, gentleness about him, the heart that makes him love us, that must be only the woman in him. I don't know what a mother would feel like, but I do know that I seem strangely happier since I've confessed my troubles to this man. It was Lem who told me how Ben offered to be a friend to Jack, and Jack flouted him. 
I've a queer notion that the moment Jack did this, he turned his back on a better life. To repeat, then, Ben Wade is our friend, and to me something more that I've tried to explain. Maybe telling you this will make you think more of him and listen to his advice. I hope so. Did any boy and girl ever before so need a friend? I need that something he instills in me. If I lost it, I'd be miserable. And, Wilson, I'm such a coward. I'm so weak. I have such sinkings and burnings and tossings. Oh, I'm only a woman. But I'll die fighting. That is what Ben Wade instills into me. While there was life, this strange little man would never give up hope. He makes me feel that he knows more than he tells. Through him I shall get the strength to live up to my convictions, to be true to myself, to be faithful to you. With love, Columbine. December 3rd Dearest Collie, Your last was only a note, and I told Wade if he didn't fetch more than a note next time there would be trouble round this bunkhouse. And then he brought your letter. I'm feeling exuberant. I think it's that. Today. First time I've been up. Collie, I'm able to get up. Whoopee! I walk with a crutch and don't dare put my foot down. Not that it hurts, but that my boss would have a fit. I'm glad you've stopped heaping praise upon our friend Ben, because now I can get over my jealousy and be half decent. He's the whitest man I ever knew. Now listen, Collie, I've had ideas lately. I've begun to eat and get stronger and to feel good. The pain is gone. And to think I swore to Wade I'd forgive Jack Bellounds and never hate him or kill him. There, that's letting the cat out of the bag and it's done now. But no matter. The truth is, though, that I never could stop hating Jack while the pain lasted. Now I could shake hands with him and smile at him. Well, as I said, I've ideas. They're great. Grab hold of the pommel now so you won't get thrown. I'm going to pitch. When I get well, able to ride and go about, which Ben says will be in the spring, I'll send for my father to come to White Slides. He'll come. Then I'll tell him everything. And if Ben and I can't win him to our side, then you can. Father never could resist you. When he has fallen in love with you, which won't take long, then we'll go to old Bill Bellounds and lay the case before him. Are you still in the saddle, Collie? Well, if you are, be sure to get a better hold, for I'm going to run some next. Ben Wade approved of my plan. He says Bellounds can be brought to reason. He says he can make him see the ruin for everybody, were you forced to marry Jack? Strange, Collie, how Wade included himself with you, me, Jack, and the old man in the foreshadowed ruin. Wade is as deep as the canyon there. Sometimes when he's thoughtful, he gives me a creepy feeling. At others, when he comes out with one of his easy, cool assurances that we are all right, that we will get each other, why, then something grim takes possession of me. I believe him. I'm happy. But there crosses my mind a fleeting realisation, not of what our friend is now, but what he has been. And it disturbs me, chills me. I don't understand it. For, Collie, though I understand your feeling of what he is, I don't understand mine. You see, I'm a man... I've been a cowboy for ten years and more. I've seen some hard experiences and worked with a good many rough boys and men. Cowboys, Indians, Mexicans, miners, prospectors, ranchers, hunters, some of whom were bad medicine. So I've come to see men as you couldn't see them. And Bent Wade has been everything a man could be. He seems all men in one. And despite all his kindness and goodness and hopefulness, 
there is the sense i have of something deadly and terrible and inevitable in him it makes my heart almost stop beating to know i have this man on my side because i sense in him the man element the physical oh i can't put it in words but i mean something great in him that can't be beaten what he says must come true and so i've already begun to dream and to think of you as my wife if you ever are no when you are then i will owe it to bent wade no man ever owed another for so precious a gift but collie i can't help a little vague dread of what i don't know unless it's a sense of the possibilities of hell-bent wade dearest i don't want to worry you or frighten you and i can't follow out my own gloomy fancies don't you mind too much what i think only you must realize that wade is the greatest factor in our hopes of the future my faith in him is so unshakable that it's foolish next to you i love him best he seems even dearer to me than my own people he has made me look at life differently likewise he has inspired you but you dearest columbine are only a sensitive delicate girl a frail and tender thing like the columbine flowers of the hills and for your own sake you must not be blind to what wade is capable of if you keep on loving him and idealizing him blind to what has made him great that is blind to the tragic side of him then if he did something terrible here for you and for me the shock would be bad for you lord knows i have no suspicions of wade i have no clear ideas at all but i do know that for you he would not stop at anything he loves you as much as i do only differently such power a pale sweet-faced girl has over the lives of men good-bye for this time faithfully wilson january tenth dear wilson in every letter i tell you i'm better why pretty soon there'll be nothing left to say about my health i've been up and around now for days but only lately have i begun to gain since jack has been away i'm getting fat i eat and that's one reason i suppose then i move around more you ask me to tell you all i do goodness i couldn't and i wouldn't you are getting mighty bossy since you're able to hobble around as you call it but you can't boss me however i'll be nice and tell you a little i don't work very much i've helped dad with his accounts also hopelessly muddled since he let jack keep the books i read a good deal your letters are worn out then when it snows i sit by the window and watch i love to see the snowflakes fall so fleecy and white and soft but i don't like the snowy world after the storm has passed i shiver and hug the fire i must have indian in me on moonlit nights to look out at old white slides so cold and icy and grand and over the white hills and ranges makes me shudder i don't know why it's all beautiful but it seems to me like death well i sit idly a lot and think of you and how terribly big my love has grown and but that's all about that as you know, Jack has been gone since before New Year's Day. He said he was going to Kremling, but Dad heard he went to Algeria. Well, I didn't tell you that Dad and Jack quarrelled over money. Jack kept up his good behaviour for so long that I actually believed he'd changed for the better. He kept at me, not so much on the marriage question, but to love him. Wilson, he nearly drove me frantic with his love-making. Finally, I got mad and I pitched into him. Oh, I convinced him. Then he came back to his own self again. Like a flash, he was Buster Jack once more. You can go to hell, he yelled at me. And such a look. 
Well, he went out, and that's when he quarrelled with Dad. It was about money. I couldn't help but hear some of it. I don't know whether or not Dad gave Jack money, but I think he didn't. Anyway, Jack went. Dad was all right for a few days. Really, he seemed nicer and kinder for Jack's absence. Then, all at once, he sank into the glooms. I couldn't cheer him up. When Ben Wade came in after supper, Dad always got him to tell some of those terrible stories. You know what perfectly terrible stories Ben can tell. Well, Dad had to hear the worst ones. And poor me, I didn't want to listen, but I couldn't resist. Ben can tell stories. And oh, what he's lived through. I got the idea it wasn't Jack's absence so much that made Dad sit by the hour before the fire, staring at the coals, sighing, and looking so God-forsaken. My heart just aches for Dad. He broods and broods. He'll break out some day, and then I don't want to be here. There doesn't seem to be any idea when Jack will come home. He might never come, but Ben says he will. He says Jack hates work, and that he couldn't be gambler enough, or wicked enough, to support himself without working. Can't you hear Ben Wade say that? I'll tell you, he begins, and then comes a prophecy of trouble or evil. And, on the other hand, think how he used to say, Wait, don't give up. Nothing is ever so bad as it seems at first. Be true to what your heart says is right. It's never too late. Love is the only good in life. Love each other and wait and trust. It'll all come right in the end. And, Wilson, I'm bound to confess that both his sense of calamity and his hope of good seem infallible. Ben Wade is supernatural. Sometimes, just for a moment, I dare to let myself believe in what he says that our dream will come true, and I'll be yours. Then, oh, 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 joy and stars and bells and heaven. I, I, but what am I writing? Wilson Moore, this is quite enough for today. Take care you don't believe I'm so, so very much in love. Ever, Columbine. February. Dearest Collie, I don't know the date, but spring's coming. Today I kicked Bent Wade with my once sore foot. It didn't hurt me, but hurt Wade's feelings. He says there'll be no holding me soon. I should say not. I'll eat you up. I'm as hungry as the mountain lion that's been prowling round my cabin of nights. He's sure starved. Wade tracked him to a hole in the cliff. Collie, I can get around first rate. Don't need my crutch any more. I can make a fire and cook a meal. Wade doesn't think so, but I do. He says if I want to hold your affection, not to let you eat anything I cook. I can rustle around too. Haven't been far yet. My stock has wintered fairly well. This valley is sheltered, you know. Snow hasn't been too deep. Then I bought hay from Andrews. I'm hoping for spring now and the good old sunshine on the grey sage hills and summer with its columbines. Wade has gone back to his own cabin to sleep. I miss him, but I'm glad to have the nights alone once more. I've got a future to plan. Read that over, Collie. Today, when Wade came with your letter, he asked me, sort of queer, Say, Wills, do you know how many letters I've fetched you from Collie? I said, Lord, no, I don't, but they're a lot. Then he said there were just 47 letters. 47? I couldn't believe it and told him he was crazy. I never had such good fortune. Well, he made me count them, and doggone it, he was right. 47 wonderful love letters from the sweetest girl on earth. But think of Wade remembering every one. It beats me. He's beyond understanding. So Jack Bellowns still stays away from White Slides. Collie, I'm sure sorry for his father. 
what it would be to have a son like buster jack my god but for your sake i go around yelling and singing like a locoed indian pretty soon spring will come then you wild flower of the hills you girl with the sweet mouth and the sad eyes then i'm coming after you and all the king's horses and all the king's men can never take you away from me again your faithful wilson march nineteenth dearest wilson your last letters have been read and re-read and kept under my pillow and have been both my help and my weakness during these trying days since jack's return it has not been that i was afraid to write though heaven knows if this letter should fall into the hands of dad it would mean trouble for me and if jack read it i am afraid to think of that i just have not had the heart to write you but all the time i knew i must write and that i would only now what to say tortures me i am certain that confiding in you relieves me that's why i've told you so much but of late i find it harder to tell what i know about jack bellounds i'm in a queer state of mind wilson dear and you'll wonder and you'll be sorry to know i haven't seen much of ben lately that is not to talk to it seems i can't bear his faith in me his hope his love when lately matters have driven me into torturing doubt but lest you might misunderstand i'm going to try to tell you something of what is on my mind and i want you to read it to ben he has been hurt by my strange reluctance to be with him jack came home on the night of march second you'll remember that day so gloomy and dark and dreary it snowed and sleeted and rained i remember how the rain roared on the roof it roared so loud we didn't hear the horse but we heard heavy boots on the porch outside the living room and the swish of a slicker thrown to the floor there was a bright fire dad looked up with a wild joy all of a sudden he changed he blazed he recognized the heavy tread of his son if i ever pitied and loved him it was then i thought of the return of the prodigal son there came a knock on the door then dad recovered he threw it open wide the streaming light fell upon jack bellounds indeed but not as i knew him he entered it was the first time i ever saw jack look in the least like a man he was pale haggard much older sullen and bold he strode in with a howdy folks and threw his wet hat on the floor and walked to the fire his boots were soaked with water and mud his clothes began to steam when i looked at dad i was surprised he seemed cool and bright with the self-contained force usual for him when something critical is about to happen aha uh -huh. so you come back he said yes i'm home replied jack well it took you quite a spell to get here do you want me to stay this question from jack seemed to stump dad he stared jack had appeared suddenly and his manner was different from that with which he used to face dad he had something up his sleeve as the cowboys say he wore an air of defiance and indifference i reckon i do replied dad deliberately what do you mean by asking me that i'm of age long ago you can't make me stay home i can do as i like uh-huh i reckon you think you can but not here at white slides if you ever expect to get this property you'll not do as you like to hell with that i don't care whether i ever get it or not dad's face went as white as a sheet he seemed shocked after a moment he told me i'd better go to my room i was about to go when jack said no let her stay she'd best hear now what i've got to say it concerns her so ho then you've got a heap to say exclaimed dad queerly all right 
You have your say first. Jack then began to talk in a level and monotonous voice, so unlike him that I sat there amazed. He told how, early in the winter, before he left the ranch, he had found out that he was honestly in love with me, that it had changed him, made him see he had never been any good, and inflamed him with the resolve to be better. He had tried, he had succeeded. For six weeks he had been all that could have been asked of any young man. I am bound to confess that he was. Well, he went on to say, how he had fought it out with himself until he absolutely knew he could control himself. The courage and inspiration had come from his love for me. That was the only good thing he'd ever felt. He wanted Dad and he wanted me to understand absolutely, without any doubt, that he had found a way to hold on to his good intentions and good feelings. And that was for me. I was struck all a-tremble at the truth. It was true. Well, then he forced me to a decision. Forced me without ever hinting of this change, this possibility in him. I had told him I couldn't love him. Never. Then he said I could go to hell, and he gave up. Failing to get money from Dad, he stole it, without compunction and without regret. He had gone to Kremling, then to Algeria. I let myself go, he said, without shame, and I drank and gambled. When I was drunk, I didn't remember Collie, but when I was sober, I did, and she haunted me. That grew worse all the time. So I drank to forget her. The money lasted a great deal longer than I expected, but that was because I won as much as I lost, until lately. Then I borrowed a good deal from those men I gambled with, but mostly from ranchers who knew my father would be responsible. I had a shooting scrape with a man named Elbert in Smith's place at Algeria. We quarrelled over cards. He cheated, and when I hit him he drew on me. But he missed. Then I shot him. He lived three days and died. That sobered me, and once more there came to me truth of what I might have been. I went back to Kremling, and I tried myself out again. I worked a while for Judson, who was the rancher I had borrowed most from. At night I went into town and to the saloons, where I met my gambling cronies. I put myself in the atmosphere of drink and cards, and I resisted both. I could make myself indifferent to both. As soon as I was sure of myself, I decided to come home. And here I am. This long speech of Jack's had a terrible effect upon me. I was stunned and sick. But if it did that to me, what did it do to Dad? Heaven knows, I can't tell you. Dad gave a lurch and a great heave as if at the removal of a rope that had all but strangled him. Ah, he groaned, and now you're here. What's that mean? It means that it's not yet too late, replied Jack. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not repenting with that side of me which is bad, but I've sobered up. I've had a shock. I see my ruin. I still love you, Dad, despite the cruel thing you did to me. I'm your son, and I'd like to make up to you for all my shortcomings. And so help me heaven. I can do that, and will do it, if Collie will marry me. Not only marry me, that'd not be enough. But love me. I'm crazy for her love. It's terrible. You spoiled weakling, thundered Dad. How in hell can I believe you? Because I know it, declared Jack, standing right up to his father, white and unflinching. Then Dad broke out in such a rage that I sat there scared so stiff I could not move. My heart beat thick and heavy. Dad got livid of face, his hair stood up, his eyes rolled. He called Jack every name I ever heard anyone call him, and then a thousand more. Then he cursed him, 
such dreadful curses oh how sad and terrible to hear dad right you are cried jack bitter and hard and ringing of voice right by god but am i all to blame did i bring myself here on this earth there's something wrong in me that's not all my fault you can't shame me or scare me or hurt me i could fling in your face those damned three years of hell you sent me to but what's the use for you to roar at me or for me to reproach you i'm ruined unless you give me collie make her love me that will save me and i want it for your sake and hers not for my own even if i do love her madly i'm not wanting her for that i'm no good i'm not fit to touch her i've just come to tell you the truth i feel for collie i'd do for collie as you did for my mother can't you understand i'm your son i've some of you in me and i've found out what it is do you and collie want to take me at my word I think it took Dad longer to read something strange and convincing in Jack than it took me. Anyway, Dad got the stunning consciousness that Jack knew by some divine or intuitive power that his reformation was inevitable if I loved him. Never have I had such a distressing and terrible moment as that revelation brought to me. I felt the truth. I could save Jack Bellounds. No woman is ever fooled at such critical moments of life. Ben Wade once said that I could have reformed Jack were it possible to love him. Now the truth of that came home to me, and somehow it was overwhelming. Dad received this truth, and it was beyond me to realise what it meant to him. He must have seen all his earlier hopes fulfilled, his pride vindicated, his shame forgotten, his love rewarded. Yet he must have seen all that, as would a man leaning with one foot over a bottomless abyss. He looked transfigured, yet conscious of terrible peril. His great heart seemed to leap to meet this last opportunity, with all forgiveness with all gratitude, but his will yielded with a final and irrevocable resolve, a resolve dark and sinister. He raised his huge fists higher and higher, and all his body lifted and strained, towering and trembling, while his face was that of a righteous and angry God. My son, I take your word, he rolled out, his voice filling the room and reverberating through the house. I give you Collie. She will be yours. But by the love I bore your mother, I swear, if you ever steal again, I'll kill you. I can't say any more. Columbine End of chapter 13